Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? clerk. Mr President, I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the Are there any proposals to committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. President, committees have lodged proposals as shown at item 4 of today's order of business. I remind senators the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, I'll call the clerk. Government business order of the day number one, Treasury Laws Amendment, News Media and Digital Platforms Mandatory Bargaining Code Bill 2021, consideration in committee of the whole. Are you seeking the call, Minister? Deputy President, uh, my apologies. Can I, I just wish to table a response to a Senate order for the production of documents um, number 1011 on the matter of unanswered estimates questions on notice. Thank you. Thank you. So it's uh, now my intention to go into committee. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is, uh, Minister. That's all right. No, if you're seeking the call, that's fine. I just wanted to move government amendment. Yep. Government, can I move? Um, can I move government amendment? What? Sorry, what number is it? Forgive me. It is PG193. PG. And you're seeking leave to move them together. There we go. It's only one, isn't it? Big one part. government amendment. Um, I'll just seek some advice because I have a different number on this sheet. Okay, so I'll read what I've got on the sheet. I've got uh, government amendments one to five on sheet PG138. And so you're seeking leave to move them together. Do you want a second? <laughs> Yes, so uh, leave is granted, Minister. Thank you, uh, 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 Madam Deputy President. These amendments will make clear that a decision to designate a platform under the code must take into account whether a digital platform has made significant contribution to the sustainability of the Australian news industry through reaching commercial agreements with news media businesses. A digital platform will be notified of the government's intention to designate prior to any final decision, noting that a final decision on whether or not to designate a digital platform would be made no sooner than one month from the date of notification. Non-differentiation provisions will not be triggered because commercial agreements resulted in different remuneration amounts or commercial outcomes that arose in the course of usual business practices. And final offer arbitration is a last resort where commercial deals cannot be reached by requiring mediation in good faith to occur prior to arbitration for no longer than two months. Thank you, Minister. So the uh, Senator Pratt. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy President. Well, uh, we've had some radical changes now to this uh, legislation overnight, and of course there are a lot of questions both from Labor and really the Australian community as a whole. So I want to ask at the outset, please, does the government intend, in this case for the threat of regulation, to do most of the work in terms of levelling the imbalance in bargaining power between news, media and digital platforms? Is it the instrument uh, itself here that uh, will have this influence, or is it now the threat of regulation that is going to uh, level that imbalance in bargaining power. Uh, 
I think the minister is just going to respond, Senator Hanson Young. Minister. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President, um, or Chair here. It's a matter for the minister as to whether uh, digital platforms get designated under the code. Thank you. Uh, Senator Pratt? Yes, we do understand that, but uh, clearly uh, there seems to have been a flurry of activity in terms of deals being done now because of the so-called threat of uh, platforms being designated. How do you relate what's currently going on uh, in, term, in terms of those deals being made uh, in terms of it addressing the imbalance in bargaining power? Minister. Thank you, Chair. So the government has always said that it's preferable if deals can be done outside of the code, and we've seen a number of media organisations that have already entered into letters of intention with Google. And yesterday, of course, uh, the announcement of Seven West Media announced that it, uh, it entered into a letter of understanding with Facebook. This is all good news. We expect that the digital platforms to continue their efforts to enter into agreements with more news media businesses, and they can do this. They can do this outside of the code by putting in a standard offer on the table which publishers can, of course, choose to accept or as a catalyst to reach a commercial agreement. It's important, though, to remember that in deciding whether to designate a digital platform that the Treasurer will have regard to whether the digital platform has made a significant contribution to the sustainability of the Australian news industry through agreements relating to news content. Thank you. Senator Pratt. Thank you. Um, so we've seen big sticks from the government in relation to energy uh, in the past and an argument that the threat of a big stick would bring people to, the, uh, to negotiate and address issues. So why was this done in a rush in the last few days as opposed to uh, uh, these kinds of principles being embedded in the legislation earlier? Couldn't the outcome have been reached much earlier than today? Minister. Thank you, Chair. So these amendments, the aim of these amendments obviously is to provide more clarity to the digital platforms and to the news media, the news media businesses about the way that the code is intended to operate and to strengthen the flame framework for ensuring that news media businesses are fairly remunerated. So it's all about clarification. This was done, uh, these amendments were done on the advice of Treasury and they were done um, after hearing submissions that were made to the committee that, um, that was uh, scrutinising this bill. Uh, Senator Pratt. How will it provide clarification if these deals are done outside the code uh, and outside its reporting regime? Minister. There will be a review of the code after a year. Senator Pratt. Can I ask, is the review enlivened if nothing is designated? Minister. Yes. Senator Pratt. Can I ask, um, in terms of uh, the code and uh, the amendments make it clear that a de decision to designate a platform must be taken into account in terms of whether a platform has made a significant contribution uh, through commercial uh, agreements with news media businesses. What thresholds will apply to the concept of a significant contribution, please? Minister. So the uh, platforms will be asked to provide a report on the contribution that they have made, and then the decision to designate uh, will be made by the Treasurer. Um, that prior to any final decision, the final decision of not, of obviously not to designate or not designate a digital platform will be made no sooner than one month from that date of notification. So it doesn't really tell me what the threshold of a significant contribution is. So does that mean that the minister, in assessing uh, a significant contribution, has full access to the contracts that have been signed, or are they commercial in confidence? Minister. 
So the Minister. Thank you, Chair. So the platforms will have an opportunity to make that information available before that decision is made. That's up to the platforms. Senator Pratt. Uh, what if the uh, platforms don't want to supply that information? Minister. So the government is giving the platforms an opportunity for procedural fairness here, and the decision will then be the treasurer's, depending on the on, on that interaction between the platform and the treasurer. Senator Pratt, I'm wait, assuming wait for the call. Thank you, Madam uh, Deputy President. I'm assuming, therefore, that the only way of getting the platforms, or even, frankly, the media businesses that uh, have had other deals done, to uh, demonstrate. Uh, to the minister what significant contribution they have made would be the uh, threat of designation? Minister. So there have been public statements on deals that will be made already, and then it will be up to the platforms then to determine to um, demonstrate to the minister that that wouldn't be necessary. Senator Patrick. Yes, thank you. I think um, Senator Pratt is uh, narrowing in on what is quite a concerning uh, new development de development in this uh, uh, in this media bargaining code story. Um, it appears as though. Uh, we've gone through a, uh, a situation where the gauntlet was laid down. The government came with strong legislation that would assist in public interest journalism. Uh, then what's happened is the Google and Facebook have pushed back. We saw Facebook do so in a very terrible manner in the last week or so. And I was moved by some of the Prime Minister's statements, for example, where he, where he said, we will not be intimidated by this act of bullying by big tech seeking to pressure parliament as it votes on important news uh, media bargaining, bargaining code. And also where he says, I'd just like to say to Facebook, this is Australia. If you want to do business here, you work according to our rules. That's what the Prime Minister said. In the meantime, the Treasurer has gone uh, around and started a discussion with these tech companies. Uh, and what they've effectively uh, managed to do now is get to a point where we're having bargaining taking place. We're getting some, some, some uh, good results for the big players, for the Murdochs, for the, the bigger news organisations. And what this amendment signals to everyone is that as long as those guys are OK, the minister will not designate them uh, as per the Act. And so what's going to happen, we can see it here, is uh, this legislation will pass. The minister won't designate because the deals will have been done with the big guys, and the little guys are going to miss out, and the regional guys are going to miss out. That's what this this amendment says. And you know what? In a year's time, when Mr. Murdoch says um, I need a bit more money, the prime minister is going to, uh, going to remind everyone of this legislation, threaten designation. Then there'll be another deal. Murdoch will be happy, but the little guys will miss out again. That's exactly what is happening here. That is exactly what is going on here, and no one should make, have any misconception about exactly uh, what's going on. I can, I can bet you, um, if I were a betting man, I'm not, but uh, certainly folding money, that if Lewis Mayfield of the Wyler News, a good journalist, calls up to the Prime Minister and says, Google isn't negotiating with me. Please designate them. He'll get a very different story to when Mr. Murdoch does. This signals a complete backdown by the government in the face of the pressure, inconsistent with what the Prime Minister has uh, indicated publicly. Hollow rhetoric from the Prime Minister. This is a most concerning amendment. It lowers the threshold. So my question is to the, to, to the minister: Is it the intention, based on current facts, for the uh, minister, once this uh, uh, receives royal assent, to designate Facebook and Google 
in accordance with the Act. I think the minister is going to respond. I'll just wait. Minister. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Senator Patrick, the decision will be made based on the information that is available at the time and in accordance with advice from the ACCC. I should remind you that um, this amendment has not taken out final arbitration from the code. In fact, final arbitration is still a last resort there where commercial deals can't be reached by requiring mediation and in good faith to occupy prior arbitration um, to, sorry, to occur prior to arbitration for no longer than two months. And importantly, the amendments will strengthen the hand of regional and small publishers in obtaining appropriate remuneration for the use of their content by the digital platforms. Senator Patrick. Of course, Minister, that only happens if the company is designated. If you designate Facebook and you designate Google. But what this amendment does is raise the threshold, uh, and, and we have no understanding of what it means. Minister. If there's a number of uh, smaller players that are, are dissatisfied, is that cause for the uh, minister to make de a designation, or is it only when it's Channel 9 and uh, Channel 7 and, and uh, uh, the Australian and all the big players? Is, is it only when they have a complaint that, that uh, suddenly the, the minister is moved? How does the little guy? in these circumstances make representation to the minister that they are being ignored by the behemoth that Google and Facebook is? Minister. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Senator Patrick, this is all about outcomes, and we've made our expectations very clear, and the news of the recent deals that have been done are proof that Google understands our expectations, and indeed now so does Facebook. The government has not indicated that it will hold off on the designation process. We're focused very much on getting the code through Parliament first and foremost. What we have indicated is that Google and Facebook can reach commercial agreements outside of the code. It strengthens the hands of the digital platforms to make a case to the Treasurer that designation might not be needed. We have been very clear that nothing currently prevents Google or Facebook from reaching a commercial agreement outside of the code. And indeed, if the bill provides a pathway for such that, the, that this bill provides a pathway for such deals, the bill is obviously still in Parliament. We want it to become law, so it's premature to say that a decision has been made about a designation. Senator Patrick. So, Minister, what what representation do the small guys get in in relation to this? What is the process where? All of the regional players who are not getting, uh, making headway with Google or feel dissatisfied, because remember the point of this legislation, uh, originating from the ACCC, was a concern about an imbalance, and that imbalance will still exist if the companies are not designated. So the regional players will sit down with Google, they'll sit down with Facebook, and they'll get nowhere. The ACCC says that's exactly what will happen. That's exactly what will happen. What about the small guys, some of the smaller players who are, who, who are confronting you know, the, this, uh, this monopoly, as described by Mr Sims of the ACCC? If you do not designate these larger companies, there is no mechanism for arbitration for them. My question goes to how do the smaller players now get access to the, to the minister to be able to make representations to say this threshold um, has been met because the small guys have been, have been uh, effectively uh, m mistreated or been subject to the very large size that Google and Facebook is? Minister. Uh, Senator Patrick, the government's amendment to the bill requires the Treasurer to consider whether there is significant market power imbalance between Australian news media and the digital platform, whether the digital platforms have made a significant contribution to the sustainability of Australian news industry through agreements relating to news content. So this means that the Treasurer will have regard to the deals that Facebook and Google have done with news bus media businesses that will include agreements that they have entered into with regional publishers who fall within the parameters of the code. In addition to that, uh, to being able to reach direct deals with the digital platforms, the code provides an option for default offers to be made to publishers and an opportunity for smaller publishers to come together and to collectively bargain. 
So Facebook restoring news pages also helps uh, small community news that operates solely within the Facebook environment or relies heavily on Facebook to disseminate news to local communities. I want to remind you that this code has not yet been uh, passed into law, uh, so I think that some of your questions are premature uh, and there is a review that is taking place in 12 months' time. Oh, Senator Patrick. Th thank you, and thank you, thank you to uh, Senator Hanson Young. Um, again, it goes to what processes are you putting in place to make sure the smaller players, the regional players, are able to make proper representation to the treasurer, treasurer in relation to uh, this amendment, to make sure that this is not just. Um, uh, the, the, the big boys that get looked after. I'm sure that Rupert Murdoch does have the Prime Minister's phone number. Lewis Mayfield of the Wireland News probably doesn't. So um, I, I really just trying to understand what mechanisms the government will put in place to make sure the smaller players can get access to the Treasurer to make their concerns uh, known and to uh, pressure the uh, the minister to make the designation informed by the smaller players, not just the big players. Minister. So, Senator Patrick, uh, as I mentioned to Senator Pratt earlier, the digital platforms will be compelled to report to the Treasurer on the deals that have been done or that are underway, and that will become apparent from those reports whether a designation is necessary. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you. Um, I too have some concerns that the government amendments as circulated, particularly in Schedule 1B uh, 1 um, or 13B, I am worried that this does not uh, significantly give uh, enough uh, assurance to small, medium and regional media organisations that their um, uh, welfare <laughs> Uh, for lack of a better word, that their uh, ability to negotiate with uh, Google and Facebook um, have been considered before uh, the government makes any uh, decision either to or to not uh, designate um, under, this, uh, under these new provisions. I, I am extremely worried um, whether the government's uh, intention is to keep small and medium and regional companies um, out or not. Um, it looks like they will fall between the cracks. I wonder whether um, the government would be opposed to simply adding the words small, medium and regional to make it absolutely crystal clear. Minister. So, thank you, Senator Hanson Young. Uh, the legislation talks about the Australian news industry, which of course already includes small, medium, and regional uh, publishers. So, they are already encompassed in that legislation. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Minister. I, I understand that, but there is a concern uh, that the power imbalances between not just these big tech giants and Australian media, but these uh, the power imbalances between the big media organisations and the small and regional media organisations. Um, I don't think it would uh, be particularly difficult for this government to send a clear message that uh, small and regional media are being looked after, if indeed that is what your inten intention here is. Minister. The, thank you, Chair. Uh, Senator Hanson Young, I, I, I don't want to repeat myself the same answer that I've given Senator Pratt and Senator Patrick, but I think that the government's made it very clear that the amendments that we've put forward here uh, aim to improve the opportunities for regional and smaller publishers because a decision to designate a platform under the code will now take account of whether a digital platform has made a significant contribution to the sustainability of the Australian news industry as a whole. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you. Perhaps we could. Um, just uh, step back a little bit and, and be able to consider um, in the real world um, how this is going to work in terms of how small and regional uh, companies will now engage uh, uh, with negotiation with either Google or Facebook. Um, 
uh, in the absence of any designation by the minister. Could the minister just outline uh, for me um, how a, uh, a small publisher uh, such as Women's Agenda, for example, or uh, Junkie, um, or indeed uh, Her Canberra, um, would be able to uh, use the provisions in this piece of legislation to ensure that uh, Facebook uh, come to the negotiating table and actually are prepared to uh, speak about ensuring that they too uh, get paid for their content. Uh, Senator Hanson Young, so those publishers will have to register under the code, uh, and then uh, they will fall under the uh, criteria for um, the, re the reporting that's coming back from the digital platforms when the decision for designation is made. Senator Hanson. Clear, uh, Minister. When you say register, you mean register with uh, the ACMA, um, and uh, is there a cap as to who is uh, in and who is out? Minister. Uh, Senator Hanson Young, with the ACMA, there is an eligibility criteria. Whether it is a cap or not, I am uncertain. It's not a cap, but there is a criteria. Uh, just before I go to Senator Pratt, I'll just advise the Senate that uh, Senator Alliance have advised they're not moving their amendments. And Senator Pratt, you have the call. Thank you. I ha was asking about thresholds in relation to the concept of a significant contribution, uh, and I think that. Um, integrates well with questions that others have asked. Has the government given any undertakings or signals to Facebook and Google or the news media around uh, those you know, the thresholds that might be attached to significant contribution? We've been talking, for example, about regional media. Can a, a threshold be met? If it doesn't, if, for example, if it only included news outlets with a national footprint as opposed to those uh, who have a, a regional footprint. Minister. Thank you, Chair. So there is this, uh, a benefit in flexibility in the definition of significant contribution and the range, you know, the breadth of um, the deals that are done, as well as the type of outlets and publishers that the deals have been done with, will be taken into account. Senator Pratt. So the breadth of the deals that are done will be taken into account. What about the breadth of the deals that are not done? So, for example, um, a digital platform does deals with uh, national media outlets, but uh, has no, um, you know, doesn't cover news outlets that have a regional focus and only a you know, a regional footprint. Minister. Yes, thank you, Chair. Yes, that would be something that the that the Treasurer would take into account in those decisions. Senator Pratt. Where does it say in the legislation that they would take account of that? It's in how do we know that these will be addressed within the thresholds of a significant contribution? Have undertakings been given to f to organisations such as Facebook and Google that they must look to making these kinds of deals in order to meet that threshold. Minister. Again, I go back to that issue of, inflex of flexibility and ensuring that the information that's made available at the time is, is taken into account. The ACCC reports into the Treasurer and, uh, and it will be made on the information available at the time. It's very hard to talk about hypotheticals in this situation, though, and we don't want to be limited by specifics in these circumstances. Senator Pratt. I understand that. Nevertheless, um, that we've had a radical amendment uh, overnight, and things seem to purportedly have settled down in terms of Facebook. And in that context, you would expect that there have been some signals or undertakings given to Facebook, Google and news media around what those thresholds look like. I think the Senate, in considering this legislation, has a right to know what those undertakings or signals are. 
Minister. Uh, look, there have been no undertakings that have been provided around thresholds, and moreover, we would disagree with you quite vehemently that this is a radical amendment. Uh, that we haven't taken out final offer arbitration from the code. That still remains, and it's there as a last resort when commercial deals can't be reached by requiring mediation in good faith and to occur prior to arbitration for no longer than two months. Uh, the most important thing about these amendments, Senator, is that it will strengthen the hands of regional and small publishers in obtaining appropriate remuneration for the use of their content by the digital platforms. Thank you, sir. Um, Senator Pratt. Thank you. Um, so can I ask in that context, we know we've got um, competing local news media. Uh, it's great to have a diversity of newspapers in, uh, across our suburbs and our towns. It's terrific, but it's sometimes it's difficult for two news outlets to be sustainable. We've seen some fall by the wayside. Is it good enough, for example, for um, a digital platform to make a uh, deal with just one syndicated set of uh, one syndicated owner covering, uh, say, uh, the, all the regions that they represent, and leave the other um, player uh, the, and their competition out of such a deal? Oh, sorry, Minister. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Pratt. Look, I mean, I think that the most important issue that you've to cover here is that the code isn't yet law, and that the fact that these deals are already being struck is, in fact, a good sign. Just because the deals have not been struck yet with smaller or regional media companies, that's not evidence to suggest that they won't be, um, and that will remain the case, or that the standard offers won't be made by those digital platforms. We're well aware that discussions are taking place right now and that the digital platforms are taking steps to address this issue. Senator Pratt. Thank you. Um, can I ask, in that context, uh, what it would mean in terms of those thresholds if such a deal said, OK, well, Victorian newspapers have done deals. We think that's significant enough to meet the threshold, but Queensland has been left out. How, you know, I still don't get a clear indication of how you're going to judge the significant contribution. Minister. I'm not entirely sure we can get into the details of those sorts of hypotheticals. One of the reasons why we've maintained this flexibility is so that all those hypotheticals that, whether it be you or Senator Hanson Young or Senator Patrick have, have raised today, can be dealt with efficiently and fairly. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you. Um, could the minister just outline? Uh, do you have a working definition of what significant is? Minister. Minister? That is an issue for the Treasurer to consider at the time with the information that he has available to him. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you. Um, could I ask the Minister whether uh, she would be able to um, outline for us today what arrangements uh, have already been uh, struck between the big players, uh, sorry, the, the big uh, tech companies and uh, media <coughs> and media organisations which would um, uh, fall outside this code, of course, because they've been struck uh, prior to it, uh, but would fall into uh, the consideration uh, under this particular uh, clause in Schedule 1 in terms of um, considering the significance. Minister. Yeah, thank you. So there is a letter of intent between Google and Seven, Nine, The Guardian, uh, and 74 small, public, small regional publishers, additional pub and 74 publishers. Um, Facebook, obviously, we've heard has a, a deal in the offing with Seven, uh, and there apparently is more to come. Senator Hanson Young. So just to clarify, Seven News, not Seven Publishers. Minister. Seven West Media. Yep. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you. Um, was there um, uh, anything that falls outside these amendments uh, that was part of the negotiation between the Treasurer and Facebook? Is there anything um, else that uh, Facebook um, has 
uh, demanded in this uh, arrangement in order for them to put uh, uh, Australian news back on their platform? Minister. Certainly not that I'm aware of, Senator Hanson. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, did Facebook see a copy of these amendments prior to them being circulated in this chamber? Minister. No. Senator Hanson Young. Is there any uh, document um, which outlines the intentions of the government in amending this legislation that has been given to Facebook prior to these amendments being circulated? Minister. Uh, Senator Hanson Young, I think that the Treasurer has made it pretty clear that he has been in conversations with Facebook over not just the weekend, but for weeks in advance of this legislation. So I would imagine that a lot of issues were canvassed, but that not, is not necessarily the outcome of it, or the <laughs> that doesn't determine the government's amendments. Senator Hanson Young. Um, so just to be clear, is there any um, uh, written uh, agreement between the Australian government uh, and Facebook? Minister. No. Um, Senator Hanson Young. Is there any um, agreement between the Australian government and Google? Minister. Senator Hanson Young, uh, there have been good faith negotiations and that Google has made their intentions and their commitment to Australian news media clear to the Treasurer. Senator Hanson Young. Um, can I go back to the um, issue of the designation power and the consideration of um, uh, what uh, uh, arrangements perhaps are in place uh, before that power is uh, used? Um, could the minister outline the role of the ACCC in helping to um, advise um, whether uh, there is still a power imbalance between the big tech companies and the media organisations? Minister. Mm -hmm. So uh, the Treasurer will uh, avail himself if he needs to from, with information from the ACCC. He can request that information from the ACCC as to whether there is a power imbalance that's remaining between the digital platforms and news media outlets. Senator Hanson Young. What is the um, uh, process for a, uh, a small or a regional uh, uh, publication uh, if, after this legislation passes today, um, they ha are not able to even uh, get in uh, the room with Facebook, um, get a call back, an email back? I mean, I must say, I've spent months now. Um, uh, working uh, on this issue with a number of um, small uh, and independent publishers, and their constant frustration has been the um, uh, inability to even get around the table uh, with a number of these tech giants. Um, uh, Facebook, in particular, has been by far uh, the the worst when it comes to um, their attitude towards uh, Australian publishers, particularly the smaller players, refusing to even um, uh, get back to them uh, to, to answer their calls and their queries, let alone to sit around the table and have uh, a genuine negotiation. Um, now, uh, th this legislation is meant to try and um, give uh, a bit more firepower uh, to these publishers in, in this exchange, in this process of negotiation. Um, I'd just like to know what happens if Facebook uh, still refuses uh, to either contact uh, sit around the table or uh, behave uh, in, in a um, uh, fair and decent manner in relation, particularly uh, for small um, publishers. I'm not. I'm not. I don't. I'm not worried about the big players. They will look after themselves. They already are. I'm worried about making sure that there is a genuine line of communication and good faith between uh, these tech giants and the small publishers who let's be honest, are the ones that really do deliver the local news, uh, the information to their communities, and uh, who curate this in a very, um, uh, you know, often uh, sometimes narrow, but in a very um, uh, significant, uh, give a very significant contribution 
uh, to uh, their audiences and their readers. Minister. Uh, thank you, Chair. So, uh, Senator Hanson-Young, I want to reiterate that the code is obviously not yet law, and the fact that there are deals already being done, and yes, they have been with larger news outlets, um, is a good sign. Um, just because deals haven't been struck with the smaller and regional media companies doesn't necessarily provide evidence um, that that will remain so, and in fact, um, that standard offers we expect would be made by the digital platforms. Certainly, the Treasurer has been very clear that in his discussions with Mr Zuckerberg, uh, both over the weekend and prior to that, that Mr Zuckerberg has demonstrated a willingness to negotiate in good faith with Australian news outlets. Senator Hanson Young. Um, is there a current working list of uh, publishers uh, uh, which either um, are registered or will be registered? Uh, in relation to um, uh, being able to um, uh, use these processes uh, to get Facebook to the table to negotiate? Is there a working list that the government is aware of? Minister. Hanson Young, there is not a working list, but the explanatory memorandum makes it clear that there are between 100 and 200 publishers, uh, Australian news publishers out there that would fall within this, uh, the, you know, the eligibility criteria. Senator Hanson Young. So, um, between 100 and 200 publishers that could be um, eligible uh, fall within the criteria. I, I guess what I'm getting at is. Um, uh, we need to be making sure, if, if this legislation passes uh, uh, and uh, the government um, is not intending at this stage to designate, uh, to use the power of designation, we need to make sure that this, this list of uh, publishers actually understand a what they need to do and b that uh, if, it, if they're not getting anywhere that someone in the Treasury's office or someone in the Communication Minister's office or somebody in the ACCC is actually looking out for them and helping them step through the process so that they don't get left out in the cold. Minister. Uh, Senator Hanson Young, there is, the Australian government has not said that they will not designate. This is all about outcomes. We've made our expectations very clear, and the news of those recent deals have actually um, demonstrated that the large digital platforms understand our expectations. Senator Pratt. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, can I ask, in the context of designation, if the government elects not to designate any platforms or services? And we did ask this question of the minister in the House, and it was not a clear answer. Can we ask? Will ACMA still register news businesses under the code? So, to express that in another way, will the ACMA still register news media businesses in order to assist digital platforms like Google when it comes to providing standard offers? Minister. Yes, ACMA will still register businesses under the code. Senator Pratt. So, businesses that are wondering where they fit in this in terms of their definition of uh, whether they would be eligible uh, as defined as public interest journalism. They should reg seek to register with ACMA. How will ACMA make decisions about who will and won't be registered? Minister. Thank you. So there is an eligibility an eligibility criteria under the code. To participate in the code, a corporation must apply for new, their news business to be registered under ACMA. An applicant corporation seeking to register a news business must also apply to be registered by ACMA as a registered news business corporation and demonstrate that they operate or control that news business either by themselves or together with other news corporations. This is outlined in the explanatory memorandum. Um, point, uh, 1 1.51 to 1.57, under which news businesses can participate in the code. Senator Pratt. Uh, it seems to me that there's a specific uh, business structure in mind here. Uh, do you expect 
news outlets that you know local news organizations that have operate under different models will uh, be supported to be able to change their structure so that they can be assessed minister so one of the uh, 1.56 in the EM describes a news business as meaning a news source or a combination of news sources, and a news source includes a newspaper masthead, it could be a magazine, a television program or a channel, a radio program or a channel, uh, a website or part of a website, or a program or audio or video content uh, designed to be distributed over the internet. I think that's a rather broad definition and considerably sort of catch-all. Senator Pratt. Uh, can I ask how many, so how many businesses are currently registered with ACMA and will they have extra resources? Uh, do you expect all of those types of businesses to now register with ACMA so that they can be made available to approach Google about accessing their standard offers, just as an example? Minister. Businesses can't be registered until this code comes into the law, so we're getting a little chicken and egg here. But uh, you know, there is an expectation that that would be the case. Um, Senator Patrick. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, just a very quick question to start with, and, and uh, excuse my uh, lack of knowledge here because of the late um, tabling of these amendments. Was there an explanatory memorandum uh, tabled with these amendments? Minister. Yes, I tabled it last night. Senator Patrick. Thank, thank you very much. Um, uh, that's helpful. My staff will no doubt try and get that to me. Um, I just wanted to go to the uh, subdivision BA talking about mediation. Now, my understanding of the history of this is that it was originally in the bill but got taken out. Um, and it, for that reason, I haven't really paid an, enough attention to, to this. So I just want to get an understanding about the mediation, where that fits into the total a schema in terms of companies negotiating with uh, Facebook and Google, uh, how, that, um, how that applies in circumstances where the company is not designated, uh, how, how it applies if it is designated, so if Google and Facebook are designated, and uh, what happens in the event that mediation uh, fails. Minister. So, Senator Patrick, they can negotiate outside the code. They can negotiate inside the code for a period of three months. If they cannot come to a satisfactory outcome within that three months, then they go to final offer arbitration. Sorry, me, sorry, sorry, they go to mediation. Sorry, they go to mediation for two months. And then, if they don't reach an agreement there, then they go to final offer arbitration. Senator Patrick. Thank, thank you, um, uh, Madam Chair. So I just want to understand the mediation option is available to them only in circumstances where a, the, a company like Google or Facebook are designated, or is the media, mediation available to them uh, without the uh, designation? Minister. So the provisions in the code are only available on designation. Senator Pratt. Ask in the context of arbitration, uh, if uh, the minister considers designating a company on the basis of, say, publishers that have missed out on being able to secure deals, uh, will those companies that already have deals be able to join in the arbitration, or will they be excluded? Minister. If a news media company already has a deal, they wouldn't be part of any negotiations with other news media companies and the digital platform. Senator Pratt. Well, I'm just people might re organisations might revisit the fairness of such a contract. Uh, there's nothing in this that would overturn the fairness of those contracts and would cause the minister to assess whether those deals are fair. I know indeed that part of the assessment would have to be whether or not the digital platform has made a significant contribution. So if a digital platform puts forward, well, we've already cut these particular 
deals. We think that's significant. Uh, and you've got a whole bunch of new players who want to participate in arbitration because they've been locked out. Surely that might indicate that the deals that have already been done aren't significant enough to qualify as a significant contribution and therefore they should be revisited. Minister. Yeah, okay. So so deals are a matter a commercial matter between two parties, whereas designation is entirely separate from that and, and should remain so. Senator Pratt. I can't see with respect, Minister, how they can be separate because it still relies on the Minister to assess whether the existing deals that have been done qualify as a significant contribution. So that means in some context uh, the minister needs to assess the adequacy and fairness of those deals. Minister. So the Treasurer will receive a report from the parties involved and will make an assessment based on the deals that have been done already as to whether a significant contribution has been made, but it's important to maintain the flexibility rather than define it, otherwise that will in fact limit opportunities for smaller and regional publishers. Senator Pratt. I still want to revisit whether these deals are binding. So, for example, a digital platform does deals that suits news big news media outlets. They're already dominant players really well. There are smaller players that feel forced into making deals because they can see, for example, that um, their existing advertising revenue that they get from other sources is going to be gobbled up and stolen by the news media deals between the big players and the platforms. So they try to save themselves from this by signing a deal. The minister has to assess whether that's significant, and then you get other players who aren't part of that deal with that platform that then say, well, we don't think we're being treated fairly. We can't get a deal at all. How can you not consider whether the minister needs to revisit the deals that have been done when assessing significant? Minister. So the whole point of this legislation is not about imposing terms on the parties. It's to ensure that where a deal can't be struck, that there is an avenue, that a pathway for arbitration to, uh, to take place. Senator Pratt. Okay. So <coughs> if all news media, uh, all, all of the companies registered with ACMA who are news businesses do cut deals, but actually they're still driven into unsustainability. How do they enliven their negotiating power to bargain if they're already locked into unfair contracts that have no access to arbitration? Minister. So I think we're going to commercial arrangements that are already in place, and that's not the purview of this legislation. This is for those uh, arrangements that aren't yet in place and should be, uh, but I think that you know, we're now getting back into the area of hypotheticals, and I don't think that it's appropriate to talk about hypotheticals here. The code isn't in place. The, ho the code isn't yet in place. The fact that deals have been struck already with large media organisations is a good thing, and is an indicator of the good faith that these platforms are now going to approach the deals that they will strike with smaller and you know, regional providers. Senator Pratt. So in terms of the deals that have already been enlivened or being considered, if those news outlets that are making those deals with digital platforms currently, if those deals lock in unfair contract terms, the bargaining provisions of this can't be enlivened, despite the fact that the minister might assess that the contribution of the uh, deals already that have already been done wouldn't meet a threshold of significant contribution. 
Minister. So the deals that are being struck or have already been struck have been done so on the basis of commercial terms. And again, we're talking hypotheticals here, and I'm not sure whether Senator Pratt has a, an example of a deal that's been struck on unfair commercial terms. So um, you know, perhaps the, the specifics, if we could deal with specifics rather than hypotheticals, we could uh, get a better answer for you. Oh, Senator Pratt. Like, just to revisit this clearly, Minister, I'd like you to confirm if the minister does not designate any digital platforms under the code, will ACMA still register news businesses? Will this registration process assist small publishers in accessing support for negotiations with digital platforms? And will this registration process assist the minister in determining whether there has been a substantial contribution to the sustainability of the Australian news industry. Minister. As Minister Fletcher made very clear, uh, ACMA will still register businesses under the code. Senator Pratt. Okay, so in terms of assessing the uh, significant contribution of uh, a digital platform, Will that registration base of businesses form a basis for assessing that contribution in terms of those that have made deals, haven't made deals, good or bad? Minister. We're beginning to repeat ourselves. Yes, that is the case. Everything will be considered uh, in making a, def uh, a decision about what, a sustainable, what sustainability means. Senator Pratt. Is it possible for um, media outlets, to, will they have to do deals with those that are designated under the ACMA code? And what if they do deals with outlets that are outside it? Now, I know um, that would, you, it would be um, uh, difficult to see that happening because they, they wouldn't necessarily be news media in terms of publishing standards, etc. But I'm keen to know. What happens if no deals are done with those registered business, news businesses? Minister. So uh, any deals that are done with businesses that aren't registered are entirely a commercial decision for the platforms and those businesses and not at all within the purview of this legislation. But certainly the Treasurer's decision as to whether to designate or not will occur with the understanding of those businesses that are within that are registered within ACMA. The ACMA code, yeah. And 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 an awful lot of other factors as well, taking into account to make before the Treasurer makes a decision to designate. Senator Hanson Young. Um, thank you. Just uh, continuing on uh, this question, trying to just get some clarity around uh, this uh, section B um, of Schedule one three B and the uh, um, um, uh, new addition from the government's amendments in relation to the significant contribution. I'd like to know whether, um, and it's important that we talk specifics here because this is why people um, have a lot of questions, is because I understand the argument the government's making that you're trying to keep it as broad as possible, but um, sometimes you can make it so broad that people uh, miss out. So we're just trying to make sure people are not going to miss out. I want to know whether if um, a uh, television channel uh, that perhaps doesn't have uh, links to uh, the, uh, you know, an, an, a newspaper or radio stations, um, just one publisher is purely a standalone television uh, channel in this country, would, if they were not included, if they aren't able to strike a deal with Facebook or Google, um, does the government still consider that uh, Facebook or Google have um, uh, given a significant contribution to Australia's media landscape? Um, just to be clear, Minister, what I'm asking for is if there is, we don't have many channels. If one of the uh, three commercial channels was not able to strike a deal. Could the, does, the, does the government consider that Facebook and Google have 
not made or have made a significant contribution? Minister. So that's a very specific question, and an awful lot more has to be taken into the context of the decision that the Treasurer will make at the time. One of the reasons why we've kept this so broad is that so people don't fall through the cracks, and in fact that the nest is cast far more broadly, far more widely. Senator Hanson Young. Okay. Uh, let's be clear. If Channel 10 is not able to strike a deal with Facebook, uh, is that a problem for the government? Minister, well, it would depend on the other deals that Facebook has struck, and with other news outlets, and not just television channels, and not just news media, not just print media. Far more broadly, it's a it's a contextual decision, and it should be a contextual decision. Senator Hanson Young, uh, um, that I find extremely concerning. That if one of the three commercial television stations is left out that the government would still be prepared to consider that Facebook has given a significant contribution. I, I, I find that um, not very reassuring. Um, uh, our media landscape um, is um, highly concentrated as it is. Um, there are not that many players, even in the um, medium uh, space, let alone the um, large space. I couldn't imagine that people up in the gallery in Channel 10 right now are feeling very good about your answer. I'd like to, you to consider that again. Um, are you suggesting that if Channel 10 was not able to strike a deal with Facebook, but Channel 7, uh, Channel 7 and Channel 9 were, that that's enough to tick a box for this government in terms of Facebook's contribution? Minister. Sorry. Thank you, Chair. We're not suggesting anything of the sort, and to do so, Senator Hanson Young, is to create a hypothetical and then make it a fact. It is a, it is a hypothetical. And, to, and then to, and to assert it as fact, this code is not yet in place. The fact that deals are being struck now is a good sign, not a bad sign, before this has even been legislated. So I wouldn't actually go out there suggesting that you know, they're you know, frightening the horses, that there is, you know, that the sky is going to fall when the code is not yet in place. There are plenty of opportunities here for good work to be done, and I think that the digital platforms have demonstrated that in just the last few days and weeks. Senator Hanson Young. Senator Pratt, sorry. Thank you. Can I, um, following up on that line of questioning, if uh, the existing deals that are done uh, needed to be rated as a significant contribution, would that leave an organisation like Channel 10 able to access arbitration or not? How would you assess significant contribution? Is there any guarantee that those who are left on that list without deals, registered with ACMA, are going to have their rights enlivened in terms of accessing arbitration? Minister. So again, Chair, I think we're going around in circles because this has already been addressed numerous times. The issue of significant contribution is based on information that's available, is, a ba is based on available information at the time. The fact that we haven't actually passed this legislation yet means that we can't define what significant contribution means because it's not, it hasn't come into play yet. It should be flexible. It should take into all information into account, and it does. Senator Pratt. Can you guarantee that this bill will support the interests of small and regional publishers? Minister. The government amendments will improve opportunities for regional and smaller publishers because the decision to designate a platform under the code will now take into account of whether a digital platform has made that significant contribution to the sustainability of Australian news industry. Senator Patrick. Uh, just going back to the, the hypothetical, of course, uh, in this chamber, we always deal with hypotheticals because we're always dealing with laws that have not yet, yet passed that will have effect moving forward. And you know, I think it's uh, reasonable for Senator Hanson Young to put a proposition. Now, of course, you could say the legislation wouldn't permit that, but in circumstances where you can't say that, it's proper for us to explore how these laws may, in fact. Um, uh, play out, particularly in circumstances where you've just said to the Senate, 
that the words significant contribution have not been defined. Now, I find that ex extraordinary because drafters, when they use language, they are very precise in what they do, and that, that you know, words like may, must, uh, reasonableness, those sorts of things, t uh, you know, tend to uh, 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 play out very, very significantly if a matter is brought before a court. Now, it's very difficult in these circumstances when a minister is offer is uh, uh, is granted a, a discretion because the, the courts are very reluctant to. Uh, play into those sorts of discretions and to interfere. So it is important to understand what that means, and I find it almost unbelievable that in the drafting of those words there is not a definition in mind or a reason in which the words significant contribution uh, were, were used. There must be, have been some uh, discussion or reason or definition that sits behind that those very important words in the provision. Minister. So again, I go back to the importance of flexibility, particularly in a fast moving landscape like this, where you have ministerial discretion, it's important to maintain that flexibility. Otherwise, poor outcomes could be made as well as good. Senator Patrick. So in the in the development of this legislation, the government were very clear in saying this wasn't about um, uh, this wasn't about uh, you know, news uh, getting particular deals. It, it ends up that's the effect of it. The root of this comes from the ACCC's recommendation uh, dealing with what is effectively a monopoly, dealing with an imbalance in power. Now, if a very large company does not become designated, we still end up with a proposition that the smaller, typically country or you know, niche uh, media organisations are left in the very same situation that the ACCC warned against, that the ACCC was trying to remedy. Uh, again, I, uh, you know, I'm just very troubled by uh, this provision and how it will affect the uh, implementation of what the ACCC uh, ha has raised as a concern. Does this not undermine the ACCC's desire to deal with uh, huge imbalances between a small player and a large player because uh, you know, the Treasurer has, has found that in a number of different cases a deal has been done, but it doesn't resolve the, the power imbalance between uh, perhaps a smaller player that uh, we want to have foster are fostered amongst uh, our you know, sort of journalist community. Minister, no, Senator Patrick, that's not the case. And in fact, the, the uh, treasurer will have to take into account advice from the ACCC. Will take into account advice from the ACCC about significant power imbalances. So that is, it actually, this actually gives effect to the ACCC's recommendations as opposed to defies them. Senator Patrick. So if there are, let's say, two or three small players. Who can uh, who, who attempt to contact? Maybe they can't contact, as Senator Hanson Young has uh, suggested. But uh, they, you know, perhaps one or two of them contact Google uh, or Facebook, and, and they uh, simply don't engage because they are small and perhaps insignificant in the minds of a very, very large co uh, overseas uh, corporation. Uh, is it enough that? A smaller, uh, yeah, say three smaller players, uh, one in your home state, one in my home state, uh, uh, make representations to the, the treasurer that they are still finding themselves in a situation where they're dealing with uh, the Goli a Goliath. Uh, that that would fit within uh, the, the, these these new provisions. Uh, that the treasurer could make a ruling on the basis that these. A couple of small players uh, can't uh, negotiate, haven't been able to negotiate. Uh, therefore, uh, we, we, you know, the treasurer would be able to make a statement that they have, have you know, there's the significant uh, contribution um, has not uh, test has not been met. Minister. 
Senator Patrick, I think you've just made the case for having ministerial discretion and flexibility within that discretion. Senator Patrick. I understand the nature uh, of how that discretion will be exercised. It's not an unreasonable thing. The parliament is being asked to, to grant a discretion to the minister. It's not unreasonable to ask uh, how that discretion may, may be exercised. And we can do that by putting forward a few different examples and you know, trying to uh, you know, tease out what discretion we are actually granting to the minister. Minister. And what you're trying to do, Senator Patrick, but the problem is you can't because decisions need to be made within the context of the time. And what you can't do in these hypotheticals is describe the context of the time, what deals have already been struck, which is the digital platform, you know, what has been the contribution to the sustainability of the Australian news industry that's assessed. So that can't be, that can't be done. So your hypotheticals are, are simply impossible to answer in these circumstances. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you. Um, in terms of a significant contribution to the sustainability of Australia's uh, news businesses uh, and uh, the Australian news industry, um, would losing uh, one third of Australia's uh, uh, television channels uh, uh, from being able to access uh, remuneration uh, in this way um, be a problem? Minister. It would be a decision for the Treasurer, but I would imagine that would be a very significant consideration. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering uh, uh, at what point the government will uh, consider uh, whether the inclusion of Facebook Watch and YouTube um, uh, come into the uh, discussion, because we know, of course, that um, many of uh, Australia's um, uh, news publishers are moving more and more to um, uh, video. Um, not every uh, television station, of course, in this country has a newspaper as well or a radio station. Um, they primarily rely, um, of course, we're thinking uh, the ABC, SBS, Channel 10, um, on uh, content that is watchable. And with uh, Facebook Watch, uh, not included, uh, with uh, uh, YouTube not included. Um, is there um, a consideration for the government as to at what point that will be reviewed? Minister. So there's two issues there. The first is that the bill is specifically about news content, not general content, and I think that's an important distinction to make. Um, the other is that uh, you know, this bill and the current uh, discussions about Google and Facebook have come as a result of the ACCC's recommendations and in, from their digital platforms inquiry and, uh, and any future designations or, or, or digital platforms that would be considered for designation will also come from the ACCC's recommendations. Senator Pratt. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I just d Drilling into the technical detail in terms of the old law and the new law, I want to commence by asking does the government regard distribution through a platform as a contribution? How will that be assessed in the context of a significant contribution? Or does making a contribution require the exchange of revenue? Minister. I'm just, can you give me a moment on that one, Senator Pratt? I have to admit that's something I hadn't considered. Uh, but I would imagine that that would be, as again, you know, part of making sure that this, the decision that we make is, is flexible and takes into consideration all aspects. I think that that's an important consideration to make. Minister, you seek me call to continue your answer? Thank you, Chair. Chair. Um, so on Schedule 1, Item 1, page 8, um, item 3B says, says Senator Pratt that whether a group has made a significant contribution to the sustainability of the Australian news industry through agreements relating to news content of Australian news businesses, and that includes agreements to remunerate those businesses for their news content. Senator Pratt. Thank you. Um, the new law says a responsible digital platform corporation cannot differentiate between news media businesses by reason of their participation 
in the code. However, a responsible platform can differentiate between news media businesses on the basis of a commercial agreement and can remunerate different news media businesses differently under different com uh, commercial agreements. Now, that's the new law. The old law said, sorry, the current version of it said, in the, I think, which is being replaced by these amendments, says a responsible platform cannot differentiate between news media businesses by reason of their participation in the code. Now, I understand that, uh, um, therefore, remuneration might be different under different commercial agreements. How does that relate to agreements that might also affect their ac uh, the access of someone who has a deal versus someone who doesn't have a deal uh, in relation not just to remuneration but also in relation to distribution? Minister. Uh, thank you, Chair. So, under the current drafting, the anti-avoidance provisions prevent digital platforms from retaliating against news businesses on the basis of having entered into an agreement to pay remuneration under the code. Um, so, the plan is to clarify via these amendments that digital platforms would not be penalised from engaging in normal commercial practices, such as paying remunera different remuneration amounts to different news businesses, um, and uh, or promoting or boosting a news business's news content as part of terms of those commercial deals. Um, the scope also of the news content that's captured by the anti-avoidance provisions uh, are also clarified here and can be um, and will be made abundantly. It'll be made abundantly clear that a news source must regularly produce news content that's subject that's the subject of um, bargaining and arbitration. So that's the definition of covered news. Senator Pratt for your explanation. It doesn't mitigate my concerns. So if, for example, a digital platform does a deal with a local newspaper uh, and says, we're going to help drive traffic and we'll complement each other's advertising, that's a great commercial deal, but the competing paper sits on that ACMA list without having struck a deal, only to find that uh, the competitiveness of the advertising that they normally get through their own revenue streams uh, that have nothing to do with these platforms are now becoming coming undercut and less sustainable because of the kind of deals that have already been done. Previously it said you can't differentiate between businesses by reason of their participation in the code, and I'm now concerned uh, and I'd like an explanation around how those commercial agreements for those that are left out isn't just about the revenue side of whether they're going to get a benefit of revenue, but whether, in fact, that benefit is actually created and gobbled up from actually pushing, increasing the competitive pressure on the other media players. I want to know how you'll assess that issue because it seems to me that these deals might not contribute to a positive significant contribution. They could undermine a contribution if indeed players that are left out of the deals um, uh, become more, more unsustainable. Minister. So, uh, thank you, Chair. So, the, um, the non-differential provision doesn't impact normal commercial deals. That's a matter for the A to uh, to apply the law there. The provision only deals uh, with um, uh, with those provisions. So, the provision only deals with those negotiations that are made under the code. Senator Pratt. Okay, but this is. I think this uh, emphasises my point. If you've got deals that are made outside the code, you can assess whether those deals are significant in the context of media um, uh, uh, sustainability, but you don't have access to see 
what's inside those deals in terms of working out whether those deals have actually increased the competitive pressure on those that have been left out of deals. Minister. So in enforcing the code, the ACCC has information gathering powers that include uh, the provision of uh, sorry, the provision of that will cover the non-differentiation um, the non-differentiation provisions. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you. Um, I'd just like uh, the minister to um, outline uh, to us uh, how the standard offer process will work and uh, what um, assistance uh, publishers will have in um, accessing the standard offer, uh, understanding the significance of it, um, and where do they go if indeed they believe uh, they should be um, negotiating with Facebook and Google in relation to a standard offer but still haven't received even a phone call back? Minister. Sorry, Senator Hanson. Just give me a moment. I have so many bits of paper in front of me. I do have one specifically on this for you. Um, Senator Hanson Young. Um, that's fine, Minister. I genuinely want a, a fulsome answer, so I appreciate you getting the information. Minister. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so the government has always said that it's preferable that deals can be done outside the code. We've seen that a number of media organisations have already entered into letters of intention with Google, and obviously yesterday Seven West Media announced that it entered into a letter of understanding with Facebook. We expect that the digital platforms to continue those efforts to enter into agreements with more news media businesses, and they can do this by putting a default offer on the table, which publishers can then choose to accept or as a catalyst to reach a commercial agreement. It's important to remember that in deciding whether uh, to designate a digital platform, uh, the Treasurer will have regard as to whether those digital platforms have made a significant contribution to the sustainability of the Australian news industry through agreements relating to news content. Senator Pratt. Thank you. Um, I've got a question that's come in over uh, Twitter, and someone wants to ask, what is the definition of Intentionally. Um, uh, Senator Pratt, if you could resume your seat. Um, Senator Brockman. I think we're getting into very dangerous no, territory. No. Senator Brockman, to, what is your point of order? The point of order. Senator Pratt clearly indicated she was taking questions over a device. Senator Brockman, that's not a point of order. Feed. That is a debating point, and, and, and uh, this is the People's House. It is a legitimate question. Senator Pratt. I'm very happy to frame it as my own question. Do we have any definition of the uh, of intentionally? So, uh, what's written in the legislation says it only covers uh, news content that's distributed, that's uh, made intentionally available. Now, I'm assuming that means that if I copy and paste a news article, then there's no way of tracking the outcomes and the revenue streams. Or does it also mean that if uh, you know, I tweet something and I get people to share it and it all goes back to a particular news article that I can't artificially drive up the revenue streams. What, what, does, what does intentionally mean? Minister. Thank you. Uh, so intentionally, Senator Pratt, means in the context of the change in this change to the explanatory memorandum. It's been added to make it clear that if, if Facebook takes all news off its platform in Australia. It's not intentionally making news available in Australia. Senator Hanson. Thank you. Um, uh, Minister, previously you have uh, told the chamber that 100 to 200 publishers are expected to be uh, registered uh, as um, uh, news publishers for the purposes of uh, this code and the purposes of uh, striking a, uh, an arrangement, um, a commercial arrangement with uh, the two big tech giants. Um, you've said that there isn't a working list of uh, these publishers, um, but for surely Treasury has 
um, some idea of who they are if indeed you've come up with um, one to 200 publishers uh, who could be eligible. Um, how do these media organisations know who they are uh, in the, for the purposes of this, if there is no working list? Have they been contacted? Will they be contacted? Uh, what is the role, uh, the proactive role um, of ACMA to ensure that these publishers um, should be uh, participating in this process, uh, engaging with the big tech giants, trying to strike a deal uh, to ensure, as um, you've gone to many times today, that we want to make Australia's news industry sustainable? Minister. Thank you, Chair. So, Senator Hanson Young, ACMA is reactive, it's not proactive. If those uh, small publishers, whoever those news outlets may well be, if they want to be included on the digital platforms, if they want to be included as part of the code, then they will proactively reach out to ACMA. Senator Hanson Young. Um, it's been raised with me uh, by a number of uh, uh, publishers and, um, and, and bodies representing the needs and the interests of publishers that there is a lack of information about how this will be done. Um, uh, perhaps a, a concern about the level of resources, even registering um, uh, uh, will take. I'm just wondering what um, services or support uh, will be delivered by uh, the government to ensure that those who are eligible and can walk in uh, to a negotiating uh, uh, meeting with Facebook know very well, you know, look, uh, we, we will be registered. Uh, we have every intention that, uh, and, and understanding that ACMA will register us, or here is our registration, um, and, and, and feel like they are empowered uh, by this process. I, the reason I'm asking all this is because there is still uncertainty. People are, are feeling like they're going to fall through the cracks. I'm, I'm urging the government uh, to consider what other services they need or support they need to offer to ensure that people don't unnecessarily fall through the cracks here. Minister. So if these news outlets were to negotiate directly with Facebook or with Google or with a large digital platform, there would have to be a certain amount of work done already. I would imagine that the intention is here for them to register with ACMA would require far less, far less work than it would to negotiate directly with those, news org with those digital platforms. So this should make life easier for those news platforms, not more difficult. Senator Hanson Young. Um, Will the government undertake uh, to uh, support and uh, ensure that uh, queries and questions by small and regional publishers will be responded to uh, by the minister's office uh, if they need direction as to how uh, to engage in this process? Minister. I think, Senator Hanson Young, that the Ministers, the Treasurer's Office have always made themselves available to requests from news media outlets if they had an issue. And that's why this code is coming about. Senator Hanson Young. Just to be clear, does a publisher uh, uh, seek the uh, guidance and advice from the Minister for Communications or the Treasurer? I just don't want people getting a, a, the, the run around here. Minister. Uh, they would engage with ACMA in the first instance, and then they would engage with the ministers, whether it be the Treasurer or the, or the Minister for Communications, uh, after that. Yeah. Senator Hanson Young. If indeed this legislation passes this week, um, when will ACMA be uh, uh, up and running uh, to uh, engage in this process with publishers? Um, are, they, are they ready to go? Uh, are, they, um, uh, are, they, are they just waiting for the legislation to pass, um, or is there some type of time frame by which um, we need to uh, uh, see before publishers can start registering with ACMA and having uh, th that support? Minister. Thank you. So ACMA will be up and running as soon as possible, and they have already issued guidance to industry as to how they will consult and, and negotiate between them. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you. And have ACMA raised any uh, concerns with the government in terms of resourcing this from their end? Minister. We'll make sure that ACMA is appropriately resourced, but there has been no specific inquiry. Senator Hanson-Young. Um, thank you. Uh, just to alert um, and bring 
the chamber's attention. I have circulated a, an amendment on sheet 1215. Uh, it is an amendment to the government's amendment <coughs> in relation to uh, Schedule 1, item 1, page 8. Uh, 3B. It goes to this uh, point that we've been debating here uh, this morning uh, in relation to the significant contributions uh, to the sustainability of the Australian news industry. Um, uh, as I said, and I think it's, it's fair to say that um, all the questions uh, this morning um, have been uh, surrounding this element, uh, there is a um, concern uh, that unless it is specifically referenced, uh, that small, medium and regional publishers uh, will be overlooked in that uh, definition of the significant contribution. Um, so all I am asking for uh, is that uh, we uh, clarify that in, in this point B uh, with the words, including by entering into agreements with a significant number of those businesses and this is uh, the important amendment, that include small, medium and regional organisations. Um, the, the government has said they intend uh, to ensure that this is the case. I don't see why there would be any problem uh, uh, ensuring that, that's, that they are included. I would really urge the government to, make sh uh, to, to accept this amendment. It would put at ease uh, uh, a number of the, 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 the nervous organisations this morning. Senator, uh, before um, uh, I ask the minister uh, to speak, uh, Senator Hanson, are you moving that amendment? I will, I, I'm moving that amendment as circulated. As circulated. Minister. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Senator Hanson-Young. So the amendment that you've circulated, the government believes, is unnecessary because the existing provision already enables the Treasurer to consider these matters. And the amendment may, in fact, reduce the flexibility of the Treasurer to take into account the full range of considerations relevant as to whether a digital platform has made a significant contribution to the Australian news industry. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you. Um, look, I, I, I understand that the government believes that um, uh, they've said enough in relation to this. Uh, but the truth is, out there in the real world, uh, they haven't. Out there in the real world, uh, media organisations, uh, small, medium and uh, in the regions, are worried that they will be overshadowed by the big players. The whole point of this legislation was to ensure there was a power uh, uh, rebalance, uh, to make sure that those creating public interest journalism in this country are, um, are paid for the contribution they make. Um, I'm extremely concerned uh, that uh, the, the, these big global tech giants will weasel their way out of this unless we make it absolutely crystal clear that when we talk about the ecosystem of Australia's news industry and public interest journalism landscape, that small, medium and regional players do play a significant role in that. Um, all we're asking for is for them to be, in, uh, to, to be noted and given a, a, a nod that this government uh, also believes that they, do, they are a significant part. Um, I, I don't see why the government uh, wouldn't agree to this and it would put to bed uh, the criticism that is coming. And, and I must say, I, I feel that even um, uh, from uh, those of us on this side of the chamber, um, after all the questioning today, uh, if the government isn't willing to put this in, um, it begs the question, uh, can we really believe you? W w why, why wouldn't you accept it? You say this is the case. Let's just put it in there. Minister. Thank you, Chair. Uh, look, Senator Hanson-Young, I think that, on the whole, the, 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 there in this chamber there is vehement agreement that this legislation is a significant move in the right direction. As to your specific amendment, this is not simply you know, a, a government opposition 
we have actually received advice from Treasury on this amendment and the effect of this amendment, and Treasury have come back to us with official advice saying that the amendment is unnecessary and will, limit the, will actually reduce the flexibility of the Treasurer to take into account the full considerations relevant to whether a digital platform has made that significant contribution to the Australian news industry that we're looking for. Senator Pratt. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. President I want to uh, ask, in relation to the ACCC's involvement, has the government considered ways that the ACCC's role could be uh, strengthened? For example, uh, look, considering the fairness of the provision of standard offers by digital platforms, who's going to assess whether they are a decent offer or not? You know, they're not yet inside the code uh, because that hasn't been enlivened through registration. But nevertheless, uh, those standard offers will still need to be assessed in relation to strengthening sustainability. Minister. Uh, thank you, Chair. So, a responsible digital platform corporation may make a standard offer to a corporation that operates or controls a news business by itself or together with other companies. A news business corporation must be registered um, under the new Part 4BA to accept that standard offer. Um, regulations may be made that restrict standard offers to a class of registered news business corporation. If no regulations are made, the responsible digital platform corporation must make the standard offer to every registered news business for the offer to be recognised by the code. A standard offer may also uh, be made that relates to one or more of the designated digital platform services of the responsible digital platform corporation in respect of the remuneration or other matters. A registered news business corporation that becomes bound by a standard offer may receive benefit uh, of the general requirements. However, becoming bound by a standard offer may prevent a registered news business corporation from utilising the bargaining or the arbitration divisions of the code. In addition, a responsible digital platform corporation may also make a standard offer relating to one or more non-designated digital platform services on terms that include the registered news business corporation um, would not be able to usual, would not be able to utilise the code for one or more designated digital platform services of that digital platform corporation. I should also add that a standard offer will not exclude bargaining or arbitration if, before the agreement became binding, uh, a registered news corporation has notified the responsible digital platform corporation that it wishes to bargain. Standard offers will also have a duration of two years, or they must have a duration of two years, in order to become valid under those relevant provisions of the code. Um, in addition to that, there is a process for making a standard offer. A responsible digital platform corporation may choose if and when it, w it wishes to make a standard offer for a future two-year period to registered news business corporations. A standard offer will remain open for a period of 60 days unless it's otherwise prescribed in those regulations. And if a registered news business corporation wishes to be bound by the standard offer, it must accept the offer during that offer period. At the end of that offer period, the offer becomes binding on the responsible digital platform corporation and all registered news business corporations who accepted that offer. During that offer, offer period, a responsible digital platform corporation may withdraw the standard offer, in which case the offer will be not be binding under the code. A registered news business corporation may also revoke any acceptance of a standard offer during that period. The content of the standard offer can be determined by the responsible digital platform corporations, and the regulations may prescribe features that may be included in a standard offer in relation to that remuneration. For example, the regulations could set out that remuneration should be based on a percentage of the cost of producing covered news. A responsible digital platform corporation would then need to decide what percentage would be appropriate and include this in any term in any standard offer. The standard offer provisions do not prevent the responsible digital platform corporations reaching agreements with registered un or unregistered news businesses through other similar processes, for example, offers to certain kinds of new businesses or offers subject to deadlines for acceptance. Thank you. Senator Pratt. Thank you. That leaves me still with a number of questions. If those standard offers aren't decent enough to have made a substantial contribution to the sustainability of news media, um, how will uh, that be assessed? And you didn't really ask, answer my question in the context of the ACCC and whether they would have a role in looking at whether the uh, standard offers 
do in fact make a contribution to the questions that the minister would later, later need to address. Minister. So I, I think that when we originally spoke about the minister's discretion in making the designation, we said that the ACCC would be involved in that process and would make um, comment or report to the minutes to the treasurer on the existence of power imbalance um, on the basis of the offers that are out there and the deals that are already done. Uh, uh, Senator Pratt. So the ACCC keeps a registration of standard offers in other industries. Why this would seem an obvious area where a similar role for the ACCC should be resourced and enlivened. Minister. I think we'll take that as a comment. Senator Pratt. Can I ask you, didn't consider bringing those provisions into this legislation where registration of standard offers is required by the ACCC? Minister. So, under the provisions of the code, uh, as the details of a standard offer will be provided to the ACCC as well as to the digital platform. Thank you, Minister. Senator Pratt. That's not the same as registration of it, but I do understand uh, that we probably won't get any further on that. Can I ask, in terms of who has access to a standard offer, do they have to be on ACMA's list? Or, for example, could an independent media journalist uh, that is under the 150k uh, profit uh, be able to uh, strike a deal under that standard offer? You, you've said that commercial agreements aren't um, subject to the code, so I guess it would just be a different commercial agreement. However, you would also have to rule out um, whether such, the use of such offers are making a contribution to sustainable media or not. Do you, can, can these offers only be, be picked up by people on the ACMA list? Minister. Yep, yep. So standard offers outside the code can be made to anyone. Standard offers within the code are made to those on the ACMA list. Thank you, Minister. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you. Um, what are the rules surrounding the ACMA list? Will that be published? And if so, when? Minister. Uh, Senator Hanson Young, parties that are registered with ACMA, there will be an on that will be available online. You'll be able to see who they are. Sorry, Senator Hanson Young. On the, the ACMA website. Minister, Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you. Um, I just want to um, go back to this issue of uh, uh, the um, government's um, uh, refusal to uh, amend uh, their amendment to include uh, small, medium, and regional uh, publishers. Um, is this because Facebook only wants to do deals with the big guys? Minister. No, it's on Treasury advice that it would limit the flexibility of the Treasurer. Senator Hanson Young. In the uh, Treasurer's negotiations with Facebook, uh, were any uh, uh, media organisations uh, 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 referenced in terms of the deals that would need to be done uh, to satisfy? Uh, whether Facebook had made a significant contribution to the Australian news industry. Minister. Uh, Senator Hanson Young, my understanding is the discussions weren't that specific. Senator Hanson Young. Has the Treasurer specifically asked Facebook to pay for the content of small and regional players? Minister. No, not that I'm aware. I think that the discussions between the Treasurer and Facebook have, about, have been about negotiating in good faith.
Senator Hanson Young. Has the Treasurer advocated in his negotiations uh, with Facebook uh, that small and regional uh, news agencies um, uh, must be part of the players that this big tech giant engages with and strikes deals with. Minister. So the Treasurer has made it, uh, my understanding now is that the Treasurer has made it clear in his discussions with Mr Zuckerberg that he expects Facebook to, to negotiate with uh, both small and regional and medium sized news outlets as well as the larger players. Senator Hanson Young. And what will the government do if he doesn't? Minister. Making a designation. Well, that is exactly what will be taken into account when making the decision about designation. Senator Pratt. Thank you. I just wanted some clarification on my uh, the answers that we received to the previous questions I asked. So, in terms of the role of the ACCC. Uh, is their role enlivened when deals are done using standard offers, um, or is it only enlivened if, the, if, some, if an organisation is designated? Is that Minister. So the platforms can make standard offers outside the code, but the ACCC's role is enlivened when standard offers are made within the code. Senator Pratt. Just to clarify, uh, well, I think it's fairly clear now, but um, how do we assess uh, and how does the ACCC play a role in whether the contribution of these deals is making a significant contribution? If those standard offers are only assessed by the ACCC uh, if the code is enlivened, how do we know that these standard offers are fair at all or that they might be fair to those that sign them but they come at the expense of uh, the sustainability of businesses? that haven't had the opportunity or have been refused a standard offer. Minister. So when the Treasurer is making a decision, uh, he will take into account he requires the digital platforms to report on whether they are making a, a significant uh, contribution to the Australian uh, news industry or sorry to the sustainability of the Australian news industry and the ACCC will be able to inform that report. Sorry, the ACCC will also inform the, the Treasurer when he is assessing that report. Senator Pratt. So that would require an organisation that hasn't been able to get an offer to seek uh, to go to the Treasurer and say, we would like you to designate because we've been locked out. Is it only then that the ACCC would start to look at uh, the power imbalances or who's in and who's out of those uh, deals that have been negotiated? Minister. Yeah, yeah. So when making a designation, the Treasurer will take advice from the ACCC. It'll also take advice from Treasury. It'll also require a report from the digital platforms themselves that will be required to demonstrate that they are making a significant contribution to the sustainability of the Australian news industry through reaching those commercial agreements with news media businesses. Senator Pratt. What oversight does the ACCC have of these deals if the code is not enlivened by someone, by an organisation making an application? Minister. So the ACCC will have information about those deals, not a register, it will have information about those deals. Senator Patrick. Yes, thank you, um, uh, Madam Chair. I just want to indicate that I'll be supporting the Greens amendment in, in, uh, that, that they've moved to the, to the motion. I think it is important that we have to protect 
the small players, and the government's amendment uh, basically uh, allows the treasurer to, to um, not make make a designation in circumstances where some of the players are happy. Um, the minister can't define what significant contribution means. Uh, that leaves this uh, this chamber with great ambiguity, and in those circumstances, the chamber should act to protect the smaller players. I'd also uh, foreshadow, in, in the event that uh, Labor, for example, doesn't want to support the Greens amendment, uh, that uh, uh, another way to remedy this situation is to return the bill to a position it was when uh, I understand people were supporting, based on conversations around this building and, indeed, the committee report, uh, by uh, removing uh, Schedule 1 uh, as a possibility. Uh, sorry, um, uh, Item 1 on uh, sheet PG138, uh, so indicate to the Chamber that when we put this to a vote, I would ask that we separate um, uh, Item 1, uh, be voted on separately, to Item uh, 2 through 5. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Uh, Minister, did you have no comment? Thank you. Sen Senator Sorry, can I just uh, the question before the chair now is that the amendment to the government amendments moved by Senator Hanson Young on sheet one two one five be agreed to. That is the question before the chair. Senator Pratt, um, I'm still not in a position to uh, go to a vote on that because there are outstanding questions in terms of how they both interrelate. So I need please to ask some further questions, um, because when we're looking at reporting and benchmarking, it's still not entirely clear to me about who's in and who's out. But can I ask, please, about consultation with industry around the drafting of the professional standards test, uh, and that's section 52P. Uh, can I ask have the Press Council, Independent Media Council, Free TV, Astra, Commercial Radio, have they been asked to provide input or comment? Minister. There was public consultation, a public consultation process in which all parties, uh, all, all media outlets were invited to make submissions. And that went on for a period of four months, four weeks, four weeks. Once the exposure draft was released. Senator Pratt. Okay. Th thank you. Um, were any changes made to it as a result of those consultations? Minister. Yes, there were. Senator Pratt. Can I ask the minister, please, uh, to inform the Senate? why provision 52P of the bill allows regulations to be made to replace or add to the standards of practice of the Australian Press Council, the Independent Media Council, Free TV, Astra and CRA with government standards. Does this flag a lack of support for these provisions by these bodies? Minister. Uh, thank you, Senator. I'll have to take some advice on that. Specific, very specific question. I don't have an answer for you right now, but my understanding is that it certainly doesn't demonstrate that. Senator Pratt. So, if regulations allow um, those professional standards to be amended uh, by government, does that not mean that the government prefers its own standards over and above the, you know, the professional boards? that should be defining these things. Minister?
Minister. So the way these provisions are drafted, they don't override any professional standards that are already in existence, and if they, if there are different, then the appropriate regulations apply. Senator Pratt. Will the government be able to impose the uh, new standards by regulation? Minister. No, that's, I think that's what that meant. Okay, but Senator Pratt. Nevertheless, this provision gives the government the power to do that. Minister. No, that's not the case. Senator Pratt. Can I ask uh, why 52P1, A, V and um, 6 of the bill allow regulations to be made to replace the complaints process of the Australian Press Council and the Independent Media Council with a government-run complaints process or add a government complaints process to them? Minister. They don't. That's not the case. Senator Pratt. Okay. Okay, so what is the intent then, please, of those sections? Is it to allow government to impose by regulation government supervision of the print digital media? Uh, and we would be out of step with every Western liberal democracy if that was the case. Why are these provisions here? Why does the government need its own regulatory process separate to those stand, uh, the standards generated by those bodies? Minister. It's to enable any new industry standards to be able to be picked up by the code. Senator Pratt. Into a little bit more detail, it would mean new industry standards that are put forward and generated by those councils. Okay, so there's no Sorry. prospect of government uh, putting forward its own standards via regulation. Minister. That's correct. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you. I'd just like to, um, the minister to outline how the review process uh, uh, within 12 months is going to work, particularly considering uh, this. Um, growing concern around uh, this new amendment that's been put in here at the whim of uh, Facebook. Um, could the uh, minister please outline uh, what the terms of reference are going to be uh, of that review and um, uh, the, uh, the, the obligations of the government to uh, consult with small, medium and regional players in doing so? Minister. So, Senator Hanson Young, it will be a Treasury review. The terms of reference for that review have not yet been set. That's entirely intentional. We want to see how the code plays out before we set the terms of reference to make sure that we can cast the net as widely as possible to include exactly those players that you've mentioned. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you. And will that terms of reference be um, tabled uh, in this chamber at some point, and when would that be? Minister. Uh, so there's no official requirement to do that, Senator Hanson Young. So I doubt that that would be the case. Senator Hanson Young, is the minister able to uh, undertake to the Senate that um, the terms of reference will be made available to this chamber um, uh, as soon as uh, it is available, uh, as soon as it is um, completed, and that the uh, uh, that the uh, and and that uh, and could the could the minister please outline what the treasurer's process will be uh, in determining what those terms of reference are? Um, who will the treasurer consult with? Um, and uh, is there a um, uh, is there somebody in the treasurer's office who is going to be responsible? And if so, who? Minister. So, treasurer will provide advice to the treasurer um, on the terms of reference, as will the A Triple C, um, and those terms of reference will be made available publicly. Senator Hanson Young. Um, is there somebody in Treasury uh, that will be responsible for driving this process uh, uh, specifically, and could you tell us who that will be? Minister. Uh, so that's the responsibility of Treasury, and it's probably not appropriate a decision to be made by this chamber. Senator Hanson Young. Um, has that been decided, or you just don't? The, the department hasn't, the Treasury Department just hasn't decided, uh, hasn't worked that out yet. 
me uh, which Department of Treasury is in, in charge of this. Senator, uh, sorry, Minister. So, uh, Senator Hanson Young, what I can tell you is that, that this bill was uh, generated in the Markets Group of Treasury, and the leader of Markets Group is Megan Quinn. Uh, I'm sure Ms Quinn will have a significant contribution to that review, but whether she will be responsible for that review is too early to say. This bill isn't, hasn't even been enacted into law yet. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you. And what will the role of the communications um, minister and his department be in this review? Minister. Uh, Treasury will consult with the Department of Communications and with the Minister's Office. Senator Pratt. Uh, following up on my questions in relation to um, standards of practice, uh, does the, the government said we need these provisions in order to bring in new standards. Um, can I ask, though, did, not, did the government not consider strengthening uh, the current standards within current organisations rather than saying, well, let's just have a diversity of other standards? How will, you, uh, how will the government address um, a proliferation of uh, of different standards and you know a whole way a whole um, we've still got to keep this within the realm of journalism and news and yet I am concerned that uh, unless there's a consolidation of those values within our current perceptions of that uh, that I, I'm really concerned about how perhaps the government could use this regulation. Minister. So, uh, professional standards, as always, should be first and foremost the responsibility of industry, and that is the intention for that to remain. Senator Pratt. Okay, so I'm assuming if you're saying it's not your intent to impose government regulation on existing sectors, um, what is the point in terms of them being drafted in their current form, or is it simply that you can recognise different parts of the industry with different standards alongside these existing organisations. And please explain what the point of that would be. Minister. So again, I just repeat that the reason why this provision has been made is so that if professional standards are updated, they can be included within the code using regulatory powers as opposed to having inconsistencies. Senator Pratt. So if the Press Council has a variation in its standard and the Independent Media Council has covers the same thing but with different thresholds, are you saying you might take one version of those standards and insert them in all the other codes? I really or do you do you have confidence in how those councils are currently conducting themselves. You said it's not your intention to override them, but I don't understand why you need to take a, co uh, a code of practice from one uh, professional council and put it into another. Minister. So inconsistent standards between organisations hasn't been a problem thus far. It's really more if a new organisation steps up and creates its own set of standards, we want to make sure that they can be incorporated into the code using regulatory power. So it happens immediately. Senator Pratt. Whose standards would you choose? Would you write them yourself or would you... Uh, Minister. So it's media organisations themselves that sign up to standards. We don't need to impose a particular set of standards on any particular media outlet. Senator Pratt. By inserting new standards, it simply allows you to put in new bodies that meet their own standards. How, on one hand, it seems like you wanted to strengthen standards, but you haven't given me any confidence that you, this won't be used to bring in new organisations who don't meet the current standards. Minister. Well, I think that, we're, again, we're dealing with the potential for 
new bodies that are set up, so it's very hard to anticipate what those new bodies would be, what the standards they might set might be, but we want to have the flexibility to be able to bring them in under this umbrella. Senator Pratt. You're saying that that would also give the, you the ability to say there's a new body, it's got this great set of new standards, and you want to take them, take those standards and insert them into the standards of all the existing bodies. You've said it's not your intent, but it seems like this gives you the power to do that. Minister. So we wouldn't modify the standards of any one particular body, but we would give all bodies an opportunity to adopt standards of other bodies. Senator Pratt. So in that context, you would give them the opportunity, but nevertheless, doesn't this regulation allow you to impose that standard? Minister. No, that's not the case because to meet the professional standards test, you have to meet the standards that are in that particular test. Is that correct? You can meet the standards that are within that test. Senator Pratt. Thank you. I need to move on uh, to some other questions. Can I ask, please, in the amendments that we've got before us, why do they say uh, need to ensure that content is ranked preferentially? by digital services. Can you explain uh, that part of the amendment? Minister. Chair, if you'll just forgive me, can I take advice on that for a moment? Yes, certainly. Minister. Uh, I'm hoping I understand your question, Senator Pratt, but my, my understanding is the reason for this is to allow for existing commercial agreements to, um, to take effect and, uh, and not undermine them with the introduction of this code. Senator Pratt. Okay. Can those existing agreements still be assessed uh, for the purpose of a sustainable contribution to the viability of news. Uh, I think we've been through that, but I need to um, want to be able to understand the extent to which those deals will be assessed. Minister. Again, I think we've already been through the assessment process in as much detail as I can possibly give you to. Uh, Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you. If, uh, after um, assessing uh, what deals have been done and what deals haven't been done, if, there, if the Treasurer determines that a uh, significant contribution to the sustainability of Australia's news industry uh, has not uh, been made uh, by uh, Facebook or by Google, uh, does the minister? Um, uh, is the minister willing uh, to designate one of those uh, services 
uh, without the other? Minister. Yes. Uh, Senator Hanson Young, wait for the call because Hansard's got to keep up. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you. And does the uh, minister is the minister? Sorry, I'll start that again. Is the minister prepared to designate Facebook newsfeed, even uh, with the threat of Facebook shutting down all news in Australia? Minister. I I think, Senator Hanson Young, that that's exactly what's been demonstrated in the last week. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you. Well, uh, no, because the government has buckled here. So I just want to be, I just want to be clear. Um, you've come, what you've brought to the chamber today is an amendment to your own legislation because Facebook threw a dummy spit. So, uh, <laughs> um, what is the metal? of uh, the Treasurer and your government in uh, designating Facebook news feed if they don't do deals uh, that satisfy the needs of small independent regional uh, players? Minister. I don't think that goes to the operations of this bill. Senator Hanson Young, the question is about how much metal the Treasurer has. I think the fact that this bill has been put forward in the first place demonstrates the determination of this government to get this right. Senator Hanson Young. But, but you've blinked. You've weakened the power that the minister has because Facebook bullied you. So I'm, <laughs> I'm asking you, if Facebook knows all they need to do is switch news off again and, and, and you'll back off. If that is not correct, we need a demonstration that that is not correct, because so far um, that's what's happened. Uh, you're refusing to make sure that all news agencies in this country will be considered. Uh, you're refusing to include small and regional players. Um, it seems to me uh, that the uh, uh, Treasurer talks a big game, uh, but at the end of the day this is more about uh, a face-saving exercise for him. Uh, than it is for uh, the, the big US billionaire uh, over in uh, San Francisco. Senator Pratt. Thank you. I would note, Minister, that either inside the, the previous version of the mandated code uh, versus the um, version of it where the big stick gets people to comply. None of, no, neither system guarantees uh, the outcomes. So in that context, I want to uh, ask you in relation to um, ranking preferentially by digital services. I'm assuming, I think you've explained that it allows commercial deals to be made uh, inside, uh, but that they can still be considered for their contribution to the uh, sustainability and success of new services. What does ranked preferentially actually mean? What do these deals look like or agreements look like? Uh, because they're in that overall section of the legislation about those agreements. I'm assuming it's algorithms or something. I'm hoping for an explanation. Minister. Uh, Senator Pratt, the definition is broad. It would include things like ads on Google or posts appearing in newsfeed, but amongst other things. Boost. Senator Pratt. I'm assuming you're saying that that's for the, uh, between the platform and the corporation that it'll be fine in these contracts to um, have sustainability in terms of distribution and financial return, not be a level playing field in that transaction, but to have privileged that, um, those arrangements within those contracts, and that that doesn't put it in breach of the, well, how, how might that in trigger or not trigger enlivening of the code? Does this part of the bill 
mean that does this part of the bill affect how those contributions are assessed? Minister. So, yeah. Senator Pratt, I think that there is a conflation of two issues. There is the non-designation issue, sorry, non-differentiation issue and the designation issue, and they're not the same thing. Senator Pratt, me why they're not the same thing? Uh, I'm Senator, keen Senator Pratt, for you to explain this Pratt, amendment Pratt, and how it works. You so. need to wait for the call. Thank you. Minister. Senator Pratt. I would like you to be able to explain this amendment and how it works in practice, both in terms of the contracts that might be entered into and what they contain and how those contracts might uh, impact on the rest of the scope of the legislation. What does ranking preferentially mean? Minister. Essentially, this amendment says that um, uh, commercial agreements uh, that do not discriminate— is that right? Sorry. Forgive me. Existing agreements or agreements in the future okay, are not held to discriminate if they fall within these amendments. Senator Pratt. So I can understand that, therefore, the ar contractual arrangements might not just be about we'll give you revenue if you click on this link, but it could have rankings and generation of traffic and all that kind of value that might come with a with that, uh, which means you can, therefore, differentiate within the contracts about how you might relate to other players um, in terms of your agreements with them. I'm assuming that's the case. Is this part of the cha critical change? Uh, you know, why did you come to this conclusion? This is, seems to be a key change. Before it was you can't differentiate. Now you can. Why, why has this change been made? What's key about it? Minister. Random, thank you, Chair. Sorry, the explanatory memorandum previously said that you could differentiate. We could discriminate. Sorry, you could differentiate um, based on the commercial agreements. This simply clarifies what is already in the EM. Uh, Senator Pratt. Okay, but the current the the EM that I've got here said that. The responsible digital platform cannot differentiate between news media businesses by reason of their participation in the code. Yeah. That's right. All right. So Order. why why is why is why this change now, Minister? It's to clarify nothing more. Senator Pratt. So the current law, as it's explained on page. Six of these is wrong because you're saying you could differentiate under this new version and the old version. Minister. It's to clarify that discrimination in normal commercial practices is allowed. 
Senator Pratt. Okay. Was did the existing uh, code before you amended it say differently? Because it seems to say that. Senator Pratt. Okay. What did the previous law mean? Uh, or the current law, as it's explained in the bill, what does it mean that a responsible digital corporation cannot differ differentiate between news media businesses by reason of their participation in the code? I now understand the new version, but it means I no longer understand the old version. Minister, it's the only one that's relevant. It's the only one that's relevant. Senator Pratt. I have to say it is still relevant because um, it gets to the core of a level playing field and how the government uh, expressed you know, a, how it wanted to address bargaining power. Um, so yes, the new one is the relevant one uh, and we, under this legislation it will be possible to rank preferentially digital services and alter your algorithms, etc., based on the deals that you've done, so that you can create some more sustainable revenue with your news partner. It might mean that you're not handing over money, but you've made a commitment to generate more traffic for them. Can you please come back to, in that context, how you assess the impact of those deals if they are outside? the code on the ultimate question about the sustainability of the Australian news industry and players that might not be able to get in the tent with such a deal, um, uh, are they able to critique the fact that it's, not, that it's not only that they haven't been able to get a deal, but it's that the deal that's been done uh, in this preferential ranking uh, is damaging their existing revenue streams. Minister. We're talking about two different things. The non-differentiation is a change in the law, that it was, a change that was already in law, and the designation is an entirely different issue. So the question is that the amendment put forward by Senator Hanson Young um, to the government's amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say, are you seeking the call, Senator Pratt? I just wanted yep, to sure. um, speak to Senator Hanson's amendment very um, Hanson Young's amendment very uh, quickly. Um, we're aware that the bill has been introduced and amended by the government in the context of these negotiations uh, with digital platforms and news media that we've been seeing. We've seen reports that the Prime Minister himself has been sending signals to the platforms as part of these negotiations and that the Treasurer and Minister have been involved in a range of those discussions. So we would note, as the Labor Party, uh, our shadow minister, nor we as a party, we've not been in the room or at the table. And we are very conscious that ad hoc amendments can impact on the balance of negotiations that uh, the government is undertaking. We also note that there are a host of other matters and concerns in relation to this bill that have been raised by stakeholders that are not addressed. We've had some discussion about those in the context of the press council uh, already, but SBS, ABC and Free TV. So on that note, we appreciate the sentiment of this amendment, but we do not regard that the amendment cures the uncertainty around designation at all, uh, and in, in that context note the minister's advice to the chamber, and we therefore oppose the amendment. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you. Um, I thank uh, Senator Pratt for putting Labor's position uh, on the record. I'm disappointed uh, that despite um, the massive amount of concern and questioning in the chamber today in relation to this, uh, that um, they won't support uh, this amendment, uh, notwithstanding uh, the advice from the government. But let's be honest, 
uh, of what's going on here. Um, uh, the uh, Treasurer uh, has struck a deal with uh, Mark Zuckerberg. Um, uh, they don't want to um, amend uh, uh, it on the floor. The governments uh, don't like that. However, this is the exact role um, of this chamber, is to improve uh, legislation to make sure uh, that uh, it doesn't have unintended consequences. And our concern remains that small, medium and regional players will get left out in the cold. Now, if the minister doesn't want that to happen, uh, notwithstanding the success of this amendment, um, be, be, be very sure that week after week after week we are going to be keeping a very watchful eye on this. We are going to make sure that for every media organisation in this country who is not being able to get a fair hearing with these uh, uh, tech titans, uh, that, they, uh, that the minister sorts it out. Uh, if he wants the discretion in relation to this, if this government uh, wants to make sure that the power is in the Treasurer's hands, well, it will be on the Treasurer's head uh, if anybody misses out. Uh, and over and over again, we will expect answers in this place as to who has been screwed over by Facebook or Google, over and over again, until you understand that it is your job to look after all players, not just the big monopolies, not just the Murdoch press, not just the, the Nine News empire. Um, it is in, a, in this country, media diversity is at a crisis point, and it is at a crisis point uh, because not just the power that these big tech giants have, but the concentration of media ownership uh, uh, across the various different platforms. Um, I don't think um, it would have been too much uh, for the Labor Party or indeed the government themselves uh, to send a very clear message uh, to Facebook and to Google today that we expect, as the Parliament of Australia, for them to understand that small, medium and regional media in this country are essential are absolutely fundamental to the sustainability of the news industry in this country. Absolutely fundamental. So we will be holding your feet to the fire, Minister, and the Treasurer in relation to this issue uh, going forward. And we expect that in the review in 12 months' time, transparency and honesty about how this is impacted on the various different players. And it will look quite obvious to everybody if there's only deals done uh, with the friends of this government, those in the media who are their mates, and not done uh, with the small and regional publishers, it will be quite clear that this government has been duped. So here's an opportunity to fix it. If you're not going to take it, expect, expect a fight in the months to come. Senator Pratt. Madam Deputy President, uh, what a ridiculous attack. We are in the middle, as in, the government is in the middle of sensitive negotiations. We have seen people's Facebook accounts blocked, all sorts of crazy things have happened. We have no indication what the effect of this amendment would be on those negotiations. We have small publishers, small businesses, community health organisations stakeholders right around the country that, that do not want to that are already in a difficult place and this kind of amendment thrown in at the last minute when labor has not been at the table we've got no explanation of how such an amendment would impact on the very organizations that you senator hanson young purport to protect so it seems absolutely ridiculous to me to be lectured by the Greens on this issue. The government is at the table in these negotiations. If the government was, were to tell us that this is the best way of protecting small players, then we would be uh, at the table in supporting that amendment. However, not being at the table, we have no evidence to go on that this would make the situation any better. It seems ridiculous uh, to be inserting such things 
at the last moment. We, are, we, like, we, like all senators in this place, we have a keen eye on small publishers, on regional news, and we want to see them supported in their fair access to outcomes uh, in terms of their sustainability. That is why we have had such an extensive debate today. You haven't inserted new powers for the ACCC. There are a whole range of things that could be put forward to address these issues. Instead, we get an off-the-cuff amendment from Senator Hanson Young that we have no confidence or no uh, insight into it making any difference to the outcomes. We, we, in this instance, we take the minister at her word, and but we will also hold the government to account for these outcomes. So the question is that the amendment as moved by Senator Hanson to the government amendments be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the noes have it. Aye. Ring the bells. Uh, ring the bells for four minutes.
order. Lock the doors. So the question is: the amendment is moved by Senator Hanson Young to the government amendments uh, on sheet uh, 215 be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair. The noes to the left. I appoint Senator Seward as teller for the ayes and Senator Giacconi as teller for the noes. Order. There being 12 ayes and 37 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. <clears throat> so the question now is that the amendments as moved uh, by the minister. Oh, are you seeking the call, Senator Patrick? Yes, uh, thank you, um, Madam uh, Chair. Uh, I will ask that uh, item one be put separately, yes, and I sorry. will ask the chamber not not to support this part of the amendment. Uh, Labor have raised uh, concerns about this this morning, and whilst uh, the argument used in relation to Senator Hanson Young, Young's bill was that that you didn't understand the consequences of of, uh, of her amendment or what the, uh, the, the you know suggested there might be unintended consequences, if we remove this provision of the government's uh, uh, amendment. We go back to where we were, uh, understand, with the understanding we had yesterday, and so Labor should be in a position to reject this amendment. It's a small amendment to what is a very significant bill, a very large bill, and I liken it to the two wires on the service module of, uh, of Apollo 13. They might seem like a, a, you know, just uh, small wires. But after launch of this legislation, we're going to find that it doesn't accomplish the, min the mission. We're going to find that uh, the, the, the Treasurer will simply be able to not designate Facebook and Google in accordance with the Act. That will leave all of the small players, all of the regional players, without the ability to bargain properly against these very large uh, uh, digital companies, these foreign companies. We will uh, in effect, 
still have the very thing that Mr Rod Sims of the ACCC was most concerned about, which is a huge imbalance in power between Facebook, Google and the small players. So I would ur urge the chamber, when uh, this is put, to reject uh, schedule, uh, part one of, this, of, of these amendments because it effectively undermines the whole bill. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. If this place wants to go back to before uh, we made there was a deal, we, we saw just a few days ago uh, that Facebook was threatening to leave the country. Uh, we saw a host of crazy things happen out there, and yet we have, just like Senator Hanson did, coming from Senator Hanson Young did coming from Senator Patrick, an amendment that does not mitigate those risks. It does not cure the uncertainty that is here. Significant numbers, uh, putting a, 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 da, uh, a number on it, does not address the power imbalances in any way that need to be assessed. It could, in fact, further distort them. There is because we don't know who has we don't know yet who's been at the table in the deals. This has nothing. We Order. will not be wedged. Order. Be it on your head that we go back to the crazy land that we were in a few days ago. Order. What about Order. The Senator Pratt, okay. resume your seat. No, Senator no. Pratt. Thank, resume your seat, Senator Ciccone. Senator Pratt has the right to be heard in silence. We are in committee of the whole. Any senator can stand at any point and put their point of view. I would ask that Senator Pratt be heard in silence. Senator Pratt. I affirm. Uh, that Senator that Pratt, please resume sorry. your seat. Senator Hanson Young. Point of order, uh, Chair. Um, oh, I just want to correct the record because uh, Senator Pratt said this was an amendment being put forward by. Uh, Senator Patrick, it's not. He's, he's, all his request is that the That's government not, amendment Senator is Senator Hanson no. Young. That is not a point of order. Sorry. Okay. Point of order, Chair. Could you please clarify what is the question before the chair? Uh, the question before the chair are the government amendments. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Please continue. Sorry. And given that Senator Patrick has asked that the matters be split, the matter we are dealing with at the moment is number one of that amendment. Uh, please continue, Senator Pratt. Thank you. So, in dealing with matter one of 1197, you cannot split these apart. I have to say, the government, uh, if, the, if Senator Patrick wants to stand up for uh, these players that he's concerned about, why not include all of them? Why not say not just a significant number, but all players? I have to say that is what takes us back to this complete circul circular logic when the original version of the bill said you've got to treat everyone the same and you can have no preferential treatment. You can't just find the balance of that in the middle of these negotiations with the words uh, that Senator Patrick is seeking to put into uh, the legislation. So, it is incumbent on this place to consider these issues properly and, in the context of the negotiations that are already underway, it is ridiculous to me that inserting words like significant versus substantial uh, will have, will, will be able to make any assessment of the kind of difference they should make in the long term uh, in the long-term credibility of this regime. It is impossible to make an assessment of, how that will, of what that looks like, particularly in the context of the negotiations that are already underway. So the question is that uh, number one, Senator Patrick, you're seeking the call? Yeah, I do. I just want to clarify that I'm not moving any amendment. What I'm asking uh, the chamber to do uh, is to not support part one of this uh, uh, group of amendments uh, by the government because it introduces the uns an, uns an, an uncertainty that Senator Pratt herself has 
uh, raise questions about today. And uh, let's just understand what's happening here. Labor are capitulating to Facebook and Google. They want to be an alternative government, but they're not prepared to stand up to two big international corporations. Uh, I've said many, many times before I'd love to have a strong opposition because I think it makes government better, but unfortunately we simply don't have that. I am not asking anyone uh, to add, I'm not asking for anything to be added to the, this legislation. I'm asking that uh, the offending uh, provision that talks about a significant contribution that creates a real possibility that smaller media entities and indeed regional media entities will not be uh, uh, protected or get the benefit of being able to negotiate with these very large uh, behemoths of companies. It's disappointing, but I understand also, and everyone also needs to understand how this works. The government has introduced a, uh, a last-minute amendment, and the Labor Party can't actually react in that time frame, no. because they they have to take things back to the, the to the minister that is not in this place and uh, uh, interact, and then they have to take it to caucus. They are uh, they are a large organisation that are not nimble and unable to react to what's happened, and the government's just played them. The, the government has just played the Labor Party, introducing this at the last minute so that Labor has no ability to, to, to think this through and come to a decision. So that's uh, exactly what's happening here, and it's very disappointing. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Madam uh, Deputy President. Um, Senator Patrick has asked for item one of the government's very rushed amendments uh, that were only circulated uh, uh, this morning in this debate uh, to be put separately. That's absolutely uh, within his rights. Um, the attack on Senator Patrick from the Labor Party really just exposes their uncomfortableness with this whole thing, let's be honest. Um, it must be very difficult being able to come into this place day after day after day and not know um, which, uh, <laughs> where you stand on things. I mean, that's the truth of it. That is the problem um, with the Labor Party. And I also accept um, that uh, you know, what the government has done here is not just a deal with, uh, that satisfies Facebook and Google uh, and that they have blinked in relation to that, but they have also uh, in this amendment uh, delivered for their mates in the Murdoch press. That is what is going on here. Uh, that is why this is in here. And that is why the Labor Party is gutless in taking this on. Because Mr Albanese, we all know, has no chance in any universe to do anything if he's having to have a fight with the Murdoch press. That's yeah. what is going on. Exactly so right. let's just be honest. We're not debating anyone else's amendments but the government's. Our job in the Senate is to hold this government to account. Yep. They're mates in the Murdoch press, yep. and now, now they're best buddies of the billionaires over in the US who have made this government blink. That's what's going on, and that's why the Greens will also request that this item number one is put separately. So the order. So the question is that item number one on sheet PG138, as moved by the government, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
order, lock the doors. So the question is that item one on sheet PG138 as moved by the government be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint uh, Senator Davey as teller for the ayes and Senator Seawitt as teller for the noes. Order. There being 33 ayes and 12 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. Issue. I'll just wait for people to get back to their seats. So the question is that order. So the question is that item two on sheet PG138. Uh, beg your pardon, I understand two to five. Uh, so the question is that items two to five on sheet PG138 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. So I'm in the hands of the Senate. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, I seek uh, leave uh, to move Australian Greens amendments um, one to three on sheet one one nine five together. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Hanson. Yeah? Thank you. I'm just trying to find the right sheet that matches that. If you just bear with me. Sure. Um, this uh, amendment is in relation to making sure that the uh, revenue that is collected as a result of this uh, piece of legislation is spent on journalism here in Australia. This is an important amendment because uh, we know that after all of these uh, long debates about the importance of ensuring that uh, our media organisations here in Australia are able to be sustainable and uh, continue to do their important work in public interest journalism. The last thing we want to see is some of these big corporations who have uh, particularly international affiliation, uh, whether that be uh, uh, News Corp or others, be able to uh, bank this money, uh, put it into the coffers, 
putting the money to the boardrooms rather than the newsrooms. This is about sending a message directly uh, to uh, media corporations that there is an expectation that for the parliament to introduce this type of mandatory code, to go through this arbitration process, to ensure that the money is actually spent on creating more public interest journalism, not just more money for shareholders. Um, uh, I would like uh, the government to at least give an indication that that is their expectation, uh, that this money is spent on jobs uh, here in Australia, journalism jobs here in Australia, and to creating public interest journalism in this country, uh, not to be fitted away or frittered away um, on um, extracurricular activities by board members or executives. Uh, thank you, Senator Hanson Young. Senator Pratt. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. The sentiment behind this amendment is important, but we cannot support the amendment because it is unachievable. The MEAA, the Media Entertainment Alliance, said this is a major concern. We can't see where the revenue is going to go and how it is going to uh, be directed to additional journalists or journalism. The issue is this amendment does not achieve that accountability in any way whatsoever. The only way you could do that would be by deeper powers of inquiry for the ACCC, for example, to scrutinise the contracts. An amendment like this does very little or, in fact, nothing or could even exacerbate or overemphasise some uh, streams of revenue without even actually recognising where the real commercial interests lie. So it is a naive interpretation of this legislation to think that an amendment like this will fix this problem. We've just had a big discussion about ranking, etc., which will clearly be a driver of revenue. Uh, there may not even be anything explicit uh, uh, in that you can identify that demonstrates how there's been an uplift in revenue for one organisation versus another. It goes right down to the details of the deals that are done, and this kind of amendment does nothing to provide that transparency. Minister. The government will be opposing this amendment. So, Senator Hanson Young. Just to be clear, Madam Deputy President, does the minister expect the revenue generated by this code to be spent on journalism here in Australia or not? Okay. The question is that Greens Amendment 1 to 3 on sheet 1195. Have I got the right one? Oh, sorry, Senator Patrick. Okay. I just wanted to ask the minister ag again. Um, does the government have an expectation that the revenue um, that that flows from these deals will be spent in Australia? Okay, Senator Patrick. Yeah, I just want to indicate I'll be supporting this amendment. It does uh, create a minimum level of uh, content that would be in any, in any annual report. It doesn't prohibit further explanation by companies. It simply sets a minimum standard. And uh, uh, right now, uh, the minimum, the minimum is, is nothing. So uh, uh, this, this does more good than harm. Senator Pratt. I need to further place on the record that such an amendment as is put forward does represent in this legislation a new regulatory burden. It could be onerous if unevenly applied. We have seen that a number of news media businesses have negotiated deals ahead of the passage of this bill. How then this legislation relates to uh, reporting against this in terms of how it is enlivened? auditing and enforcement, there is a clear risk in our assessment that this kind of reporting regime could undermine the independence of some news media outlets. All right, the question is that uh, Greens Amendment 1 to 3 on sheet 1195 revised by Leave Together be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against no. The noes have it. Noes have it. 
Senator, Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Deputy Acting Deputy Chair. I uh, would like to now move uh, our uh, remaining amendment, the Australian Greens' remaining amendment, on sheet on sheet 1188 as revised. Um, this uh, amendment, amendment just uh, asks specifically for uh, the uh, reference to small and regional and independent publications to be considered um, as the, and the impacts of this uh, code on them in the 12-month review. Um, we did cover quite a bit of this earlier today, so um, I, uh, I understand the government intends that to be the case. Uh, but I think it's important to ensure that um, there is a discussion uh, in this chamber, which is why I'd previously circulated this amendment and uh, would like the government to consider it. Minister. Uh, Senator Pratt. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. We appreciate uh, the sentiment in this amendment. It is clearly in the public interest that public interest journalism be assessed as part of the review. However, I think that the, the government should clearly be, be able to make an undertaking in that regard without biasing the other issues that might also emerge uh, in the time of the implementation of this legislation. We would expect, for example, the work of the Public Interest Journalism Initiative, uh, PIJI and the Australian News Mapping Project. Uh, you know, these are all important considerations. However, this can't be done. Uh, we, we need to address a context in which the department has failed to produce basic information about newspaper coverage in Australia, particularly given the department's role in relation to the regional and small publishers' innovation fund. So that was announced back in 2017, as well as the public interest news gathering program announced in 2020. So, there's a wide range of issues that need to be researched and assessed in terms of the balance of this kind of review. Uh, we're very happy to emphasise the needs of small and independent journalists, the public interest uh, journalism initiative, etc. But this inquiry needs and review needs to address the needs of a much greater diversity of stakeholders. Minister. The government will be opposing this amendment. The review contained in the current legislation is broader in scope than that proposed in the amendment. The question is that Green's Amendment 1 on sheet 1188 revised be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against no. The noes have it. The noes have it. <laughs> Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you. Uh, um, um, Mr. Chair, I um, move uh, items one to three on a sheet 1197, or seeking leave to uh, move them together. Is leave granted? Leave is granted, Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it, it remains to be seen whether this legislation will remedy the imbalance of market power between the digital, uh, big digital platforms that dominate our information landscape and the media organisations that provide us with news and reporting that is uh, a vital underpinning of our democracy. Uh, I think in some sense greater uncertainty has, uh, has been uh, brought about by the government's uh, amendments this morning. It's clear that the bill only addresses a small part of a range of measures that are needed not only to improve media diversity in Australia. Uh, and to further support public interest journalism. It will also address other major issues, including uh, uh, the, the international tax practices of these digital giants that operate across the globe. This amendment deals with yet another aspect of the situation. The opaque nature of the algorithms and, biz and, and uh, business practices of big tech. Now, I know this might be foreign to members or to those present in the chamber. It's a fairly new area of, of engineering, uh, and that is having independent auditors look at algorithms. And that can be algorithms in respect of uh, uh, commercial applications, algorithms used by government, to make sure that those algorithms are performing the functions that they ought to perform, and indeed not introducing 
unintended consequences into what are automated processes. Uh, no, um, uh, not much needs to be said about, for example, robo-debt and the way in which that algorithm uh, did not perform properly. And uh, had there been algorithm uh, auditing, the government may have been in a substantially better financial position than what it is now after uh, having to make uh, payouts uh, back to people who, uh, it turns out, robo-debt um, uh, robbed of, uh, of, of money. Um, we've also seen in recent events the digital, pla uh, uh, the, the digital platforms are operating uh, with impunity under a shroud of near total secrecy. Uh, their anti-competitive practices and how their algorithms operate are all, uh, uh, are all shrouded from any oversight or accountability. This uh, secrecy has uh, deep implications for our democracy. These platforms have unquestionably amplified the spread of misinformation and falsehood aimed at undermining public confidence in, for example, the COVID-19 health response. They have undermined trust in democratic institutions and supercharged political polarisation. Even during this debate on the bill, Google's public campaigning involved actively limiting uh, the information that 250,000 Australians uh, could access through their so through their so-called experiments. Similarly, uh, Facebook's arbitrary decision to ban news sites extended uh, to government, political, and community organisation pages as well. Uh, amply demonstrating the outsized impact that the company's algorithms have on the way we do business here. So this has uh, implications far beyond those of uh, uh, the, the news bargaining code. Um, and in order to deal with them, we do need to have a level of scrutiny. Now, the ACCC actually has the power to go and look at uh, the activities and indeed the algorithms of, of companies uh, that was confirmed by Mr. Sims uh, at the committee stage, and uh, the intent of this amendment is to make sure that uh, the ACCC does so. So, whilst they have the power now, there is no requirement for them to do algorithm audits to go in and have a look at what Google and Facebook might be doing, what the algorithms are actually doing and to make sure that there is no anti-competitive uh, beh behaviour uh, being implemented through those algorithms, either uh, intentionally, and one, one would hope that doesn't occur, but even unintentionally. So it's consistent with the role of the ACCC. The problem we have here, and this parliament will need to come to grips with this sort of thing moving forward, it's, an, it's a new engineering field, relatively new engineering, engineering field, to audit algorithms independently to make sure that, uh, that, that they uh, are doing what they are promoted uh, to do. Uh, it's something we will have to take uh, notice of and deal with in the future, as, as I said, not necessarily just for this particular bill, but we need to open our minds to the fact that right across society where algorithms are being employed, um, uh, auditing is going to be required. And it, uh, it's no different to auditing of books. In order to establish confidence in, in uh, uh, our corporations, we require them to be audited. Co that gives public confidence, it gives confidence to shareholders. This is no different, simply saying, let's audit the algorithms. Uh, it's very clear in my amendment that uh, if the ACCC were to go and do an audit, they're not allowed to reveal trade secrets. They simply uh, uh, examine the, the code, make sure that there's nothing in there that's untoward, and report that back to, uh, you know, you know, back to the public, that everything's in good order. And if there's not, they can act in relation to that in using their existing regulatory powers. So the bill uh, doesn't seek to, in any way, compromise Google and Facebook in their in their uh, in their oper operations. Doesn't uh, seek to require anything to be revealed about how they do their business. Just simply that uh, that the ACCC regularly audit these algorithms 
and uh, you know, deal with any anything that's untoward within them. Thank you. Thank you Senator Patrick, Minister. Uh, the government's going to oppose this amendment. Okay, so the question before the Senate is that uh, Senator Patrick's amendment on one to three on sheet one one nine seven revised by leave together be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against no. Aye. The noes have it. Division required, ring the bells. Senator Patrick, just hang five. The minister has said that she only it sounded like one voice to her, so I will put the question again. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against no. no. Action replay. The noes have it. Aye. Division required, ring the bells. I thought I saw someone's lips move. What's that?
Shut the doors. Shut the doors. The question is that the amendment moved by Senator Patrick 1 to 3 on sheet 1197 revised by leave together be agreed to. Uh, the ayes shall pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I shall point Senator Seward, Senator Patrick, Senator. You were closest. You were closest. Senator Seward to call it for the ayes. Senator Urquhart to call it for the noes. Order. The machine went off. Oh, here we go. It's all right, it's back. Okay. Um, there being 12 ayes and 32 noes, the motion has been defeated. It now being past 12.45, the committee reports progress, and I shall now proceed to senators' statements, and I'll give the senators a chance to get back to their desks. It went off on me. Yeah, it's, uh, thanks. Thank you. Senator Fear of Anti Wells. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. On my desk in my office, I have a little plaque which my husband made for me. Written on the plaque is a quote by Marcus Aurelius, Roman emperor and philosopher. It reads When you speak in the Senate or to any individual, be straightforward, not pedantic. Use language which rings true. And in speaking today, I take guidance from another quote by Marcus Aurelius If it is not right, do not do it. If it is not true, do not say it. Integrity, the word most often used to describe the aspiration that we as politicians have. Indeed, it is a universal aspiration that all men and women seek to adhere to in their daily lives. But for those in public office, integrity is not just an aspiration, it is an obligation. Indeed, as I have said before, the higher the office, the greater the responsibility. So what is integrity? Common definitions refer to the adherence to a code of especially moral or artistic values, to incorruptibility, to honest tr honesty, trust and respect. At a time of far greater scrutiny on public officials, do we have in place the necessary frameworks to ensure that public officials do conform to principles of integrity, but when they fail to do so, there are appropriate sanctions? As politicians, we are the lawmakers, and as such, we should not be above those laws. Politics is about perceptions, and regrettably, the perception that the general public have about us is not good. And why is it not good? Because repeatedly, 
the actions of politicians from local, state and federal ranks have acted without integrity and contributed to the ongoing and deteriorating perception of the body politic. In any survey about the most trusted professions in our society, politicians usually rank amongst the lowest. And why wouldn't this be the case, given the continued exposure of questionable activities over many years? Whether it's alleged lies in election campaigns, dodgy pre-selections, misappropriation of public monies, personal benefits resulting from insider information, money sequestered in overseas tax havens, abuse of office for personal advantage, connections with foreign governments, the list goes on and on. Negative public perceptions are compounded when politicians dig their heels in, spin the story and fail to take responsibilities for their actions. They rely on the fast-moving media cycle and wait for the next story to take the wrongdoing off the front page. With perceptions of corruption in Australia increasing the erosion of public trust in institutions and the advent of an increasing number of political scandals, there are growing calls for a better National Integrity Commission than the one proposed by the government. Being from New South Wales, I'm conscious of the need to heed the lessons from the New South Wales Independent Commission Against Corruption, which was used to settle factional scores and destroy careers. However, the role of such a body needs to uncover corruption and expose it publicly. As we have seen with state bodies, they have powers which the police and prosecuting authorities do not have, including the power to force people to answer questions which may incriminate them but which is often inadmissible in court. Public hearings with appropriate safeguards are important. In addition, there should be no special treatment for politicians and their staff. Public trust will continue to be undermined unless members of parliament are subject to full and proper scrutiny. An article titled Integrity Concerns by Karen Middleton in the Saturday paper of 12 December 2020 cites for comments by former High Court Justice Mary Gordon QC. The article states that the only way a parliamentarian could be brought before the proposed commission was if both that parliamentarian and the Attorney General reasonably suspected a crime had been committed. Gordon was absolutely correct when she said that it is unlikely, let me tell you, that a parliamentarian is going to front up and say, I think on reasonable grounds that I've committed a crime. In an article in the Sydney Morning Herald of 4 November 2020 titled Weak Powers to Expose Federal MPs, former Judge Blast's Corruption Watchdog Plan, Anthony Wheely QC, Chair of the Centre for Public Integrity and a former Court of Appeal judge said that the proposed Commonwealth Integrity Commission had fundamental deficiencies. He said that the Commission would be splitting two divisions with completely different powers and that the division responsible for investigating alleged corruption by federal MPs, their staff or departments, would be unable to hold public hearings, make corruption findings or act directly on tip-offs from the public. In November 2020, Transparency International Australia, in conjunction with Griffith University Queensland, released a paper titled Australia's National Integrity System, The Blueprint for Action. The paper offers suggestions for a holistic, whole-of-government approach and it highlights two salutary statistics. First, our score on the 2019 Transparency International's Corruption Perception Index is 77, down eight points since 2012. And secondly, that in October 2020, 66% of surveyed Australians thought corruption in government was quite a big or very big problem, up from 61% in 2018. I have previously raised the question of vetting of politicians, and whilst this is a complex issue, nevertheless it warrants consideration in any discussion about integrity. I had the opportunity last year during a Senate inquiry to canvass the issue of vetting of politicians with the Director General of ASIO, Mike Burgess, especially in the context of foreign interference in our political system. He stated, I personally think or professionally think that actually there is imperfection in our democratic system, but actually it is right that it is the members of political parties that pick their people who would run as candidates, and it is right that the citizens vote those candidates in and therefore a government is elected, and those people are the chosen people by the community and the parties in terms of ministerial positions. That might be imperfect, but actually I think that's still a very good system. Why do I say that? Because ultimately, even in that imperfection, if politicians or ministers do the wrong thing by the law, there are ways of capturing that. I think the Director-General makes a very good point about the imperfection 
of our system. And this is especially the case where there is reliance on the political party machine to take action. However, over many years, and notwithstanding the increased internal vetting processes of the parties prior to pre-selection, the imperfection referred to by the Director-General is real and pro problematic, given the many instances of politicians who have been less than truthful to their pre-selectors and, in turn, been elected on the basis of falsehoods. Following the pronouncements of the High Court regarding issues pertinent to dual citizenship, we saw a flurry of changes by the parliament in relation to disclosures and tighter scrutinies by the political parties of candidates. And this demonstrates that change can be affected. But it is the intersection between the role of parliamentarian and politician that we have often seen the system protecting wrongdoing. Let me give you a practical example of where the system is defective and not working when we leave issues of integrity to the party machine. One New South Wales MP who later became a minister is reported to have been involved in the altering of branch records for a meeting at which 10 new members were accepted into his conference. The minutes forwarded to the party headquarters recorded that the members were rejected. However, those in attendance asserted the contrary and subsequently lodged statutory declarations to the party's state director. What is not in dispute is that the MP at the centre of the accusations will most certainly be challenged at his next pre-selection. So 10 new members could make all the difference. More than two years have passed since the formal complaints and statutory declarations were submitted to the party headquarters and to his Prime Minister. The allegations of record tampering and the MP's role are still to be resolved. The party machine in this instance seems unable or unwilling to make a judgment as to integrity. This is an imperfection in the system where the political PR concerns outweigh the importance of openness, truth and integrity. Once elected, there is no vetting, notwithstanding the exposure that many politicians have to highly sensitive information. As a minister, my staff were all vetted, yet I did not go through the process. Accordingly, at the very least, ministers should be vetted and politicians who assume offices, especially those with exposure to sensitive and highly classified information, should also go through some vetting process. Can I conclude by stating that I share the concerns that have been raised about the ad adequacy of the government's proposed National Integrity Commission? Restoring faith in the political class will require considerable effort, starting with at least a robust national integrity system with proper accountability, starting with the political class. Senator Walsh. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. And Australia's aged care system is in crisis. And at the end of this week, the government is due to receive the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety Report. And it is long past time that this government listened to the experts in aged care. And I'm not just talking about the Royal Commissioners and all of the many, many experts who gave evidence. I'm talking about the dedicated, hard-working people who staff the aged care system. The dedicated, hard-working aged care workers who know the problems all too well and who know the solutions. Dedicated, hard-working aged care workers like Cherie, who I met on Friday. Cherie came to Canberra last week to speak out on the government's latest attack on workers' rights its industrial relations bill that will cut workers' pay and make part-time work even less secure. Cherie knows what that looks like because Australia's aged care system is already built on casualised short-hour contracts. Cherie has worked in aged care for more than 20 years and she is contracted to work just 16 hours per fortnight. She consistently works above that, but she can't rely on the extra hours, and that has devastating implications for her. And this kind of extreme job insecurity across the aged care sector also has devastating implications for the elders in our care. For Cherie, it means she can't convince a real estate agent to give her a lease. 
she can't convince a bank to give her a home loan, and sometimes she can't make enough money just to meet her own basic needs. She handed me a statement on Friday which said, as a single middle-aged female with a lack of secure hours, I found myself living in temporary accommodation in a caravan. I have been unable to secure a long-term rental lease because I don't have guaranteed working hours. As a low-income worker, I'm not alone here. Where I live, most people are low-income, insecure workers. I have met seven other aged care workers in the caravan park. We are already the working poor and this bill is going to disadvantage us further. This is how we are staffing aged care in Australia today, in one of the richest countries in the world, in one of the most critical services that federal government is responsible for, the care of our elders. It is a disgrace. It is neglect and our dedicated, hard-working aged care workforce should not have to make the kinds of decisions that Cherie has, has told us about. Workers who do this critical, essential work should not have to choose between paying car registration or going to the dentist. Workers in this critical, essential work shouldn't have to choose which meal they're going to skip today. And I should not have to say this in the Australian Parliament. I should not have to tell the government that its aged care system is so woefully inadequate, that dedicated carers are living in caravan parks and skipping meals. I wish Cherie's case was an isolated example, um, but her experience is not the exception. It's the rule. Late last year, I met with Ross, another proud and dedicated aged care worker. Ross is passionate about aged care and wants to be able to dedicate himself to the role, to the residents and to the sector. But like Cherie, he isn't given enough hours of work per week to make ends meet. And so he's had to take a second job and he works over 50 hours a week because his aged care job is not enough. It's not enough on its own to make ends meet and support his three children. Ross told me about a 90-year-old woman in his care. He described her as an elegant and proud woman, a woman Ross has huge respect for. But this is a woman who, because of the aged care crisis, has had to sit in her own mess because there are just not enough staff to give her the dignity and the comfort that she deserves. Again, this is happening in Australia, in one of the richest countries in the world. And it's happening in one of the most critical services that the federal government has responsibility for. And it is nothing short of a disgrace. The stories told by Cherie and Ross are borne out by research across the sector. Last year, the United Workers Union found that 90 per cent of aged care workers did not have enough time to properly complete their work—90 per cent. And three quarters of workers said there weren't enough staff to provide quality care. It is no surprise, then, that the same survey found that almost half—44 per cent of aged care workers said they probably wouldn't stay working in the sector beyond the next five years. And this is a big problem. It's a problem for the workers. It's a problem for our elders. And it's a problem for us as a country as a whole, because we need hundreds of thousands of people in the next few years to take up the critical work in this sector. In order to retain the workforce that we have and attract a new workforce for the future, we need to do three things. First, we need to respect the aged care workers who are speaking out today. We need to respect them not just with our thanks in a crisis, but in their pay packets with a proper living wage. And we need to ensure proper training that reflects the dedication aged care workers already show to the elders in their care. 
Second, aged care workers need to have good, secure jobs with enough hours to make ends meet. The organisation of aged care on these short hour contracts it is damaging. It's damaging to the workers and it's damaging to the elders in our care. We must place good, secure jobs at the heart of our aged care system. And third, we need minimum staffing levels in aged care and we need them urgently. When I talk to people in the community about what is happening in aged care, they just cannot believe that we don't have legislated, mandated minimum staffing levels in aged care. They can't believe it. How can we operate an aged care system without minimum staffing levels? How can we operate an aged care system where the care of people's parents and grandparents is not supported by guaranteed minimum staffing levels in aged care in Australia. It is obscene. These reforms, they are needed and they are urgent and they need a big commitment, a commitment that this government has so far failed to give. And this failure was made patently clear when the Royal Commission handed down its damning interim report, Neglect, last year. Neglect describes an aged care system that is failing the vulnerable Australians it is supposed to care for and the families and the staff that work so hard to care for them. The interim report found that not only does aged care fail to meet the needs of elderly people, it neglects them and I quote, it is unkind and uncaring. The commissioners described the aged care industry as a sad and shocking system that diminishes Australia as a nation, a system that needs to be changed. People in aged care need to be treated as humans and not as a production line. And it's time we listened to the experts like Cherie. Cherie wants better. She wants better for herself. She wants better for the other aged care workers she knows. And most of all, she wants better for the elders in her care. Last week in Canberra, she told us, and I quote, it is an honour and a privilege to share a person's final journey and our older generation deserve to be treated with dignity and respect, but so do the people working in aged care. And she said this, we need laws that properly value aged care work and provide all aged care workers with secure jobs and fair pay. Cherie and Ross and so many other aged care workers, they're not just speaking up for themselves, they're speaking up for the security and the dignity of our aged care residents. And it's long past time the Morrison government listened to them. Senator McGrath. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. From Mandalay to Moresby to Manila to Melbourne, an iron silk curtain is falling. A Chinese silk curtain plunging as a parachute of leaden control on sovereign free nations, subjugating, suffocating, strangling freedom through economic war as a means of control. Communist China has declared economic war on free democratic nations, upsetting the traditional rules-based order, meaning we must carefully consider our dealings with China. China is an expansionist, rapacious, communist dictatorship intent on power. China, communist China, is intent on domination, not through the traditional means of war, but through three fronts of war, economic, political and cultural repression within a matrix of cyber warfare. Hong Kong is lost, her people now suffering, and it wasn't subtle. Hong Kong is no longer part of a one nation, two systems, legally bound agreement, in grievous breach of the 1984 Sino-British Joint Declaration. Hong Kong is now just another communist-controlled city with no freedom. Hong Kong is Tibet with sea views. We shouldn't forget that Tibet was the first nation to fall to communist China. And we must hold China accountable for the ethnic and cultural cleansing of the Uyghurs. It is time to take a strong stance against this threat to a rules-based order the Chinese Communist government want control not by direct force, but through iron silk to bind others to appease them. 
Barbara Tushman, in her seminal work The Guns of August, outlined the build-up to the outbreak of war in 1914. The similarities to today are startling. President Xi is the Kaiser. While the last emperor of the Qing dynasty was deposed in 1911, President Xi is the first emperor of the Red Mao dynasty. Intent of proving his leadership and the leadership and power of his nation. Communist China is akin to Imperial Germany, a growing power needing to prove power. Over recent days, the US State Department has expressed its concern about China's recently enacted Coast Guard law that for the first time explicitly allows its Coast Guard to fire on foreign vessels. The US State Department are appropriately, and I quote, concerned by language and law that expressly ties the potential use of force, including armed force, by the China Coast Guard to the enforcement of China's claims and ongoing territorial and maritime disputes in the East and South China Seas. This recent action by China will be used to intimidate China's maritime neighbours, especially in asserting its unlawful maritime claims in the South China Sea. This new threat is the next step in China's strategy to assert their dominance and expand their influence in the region. Meanwhile, Japan this week have lodged a dispute with Beijing after Chinese Coast Guard vessels entered Japan's territorial waters for the seventh time this year. China have proven to us time and time again they are more than willing to hide their actions from the rest of the world, whether it is the ethnic and cultural cleansing of the Uyghurs or the COVID cover-up in Wuhan, all while trying to exert influence over other nations, particularly those within the South Pacific, those nations, those nations of which we have a great responsibility to. As their neighbour, we have done much, but we need to be doing much, much more to be strengthening our strategic position, not just in Papua New Guinea against the influence of China, but across the broader Indo-Pacific. As we saw with Kokoda, New Guinea is the gateway to Australia and must be protected, not just because it is in our strategic interests, but because it is righteous. Throughout the world, we have seen China, the so-called developing nation, remarkably grow and expand their influence. I can recall backpacking in Ethiopia in 2007, seeing Chinese work gangs building roads in the hills. My concerns have been building for some time, and these concerns are shared by Queenslanders. And I know I'm not alone in expressing my concerns about the rising influence and subtle aggression of China, particularly within the Pacific region. Over time, China has slowly increased their influence and control over nations and global organisations. This is a clear step-by-step -step approach to the economic, political and cultural subjugation of sovereign nations. As is becoming alarmingly clear, where China's overtures are refused and influence rebuffed, the Chinese Communist Party is prepared to flex China's economic muscle to exert pressure on other nations, including Australia, or pass laws within Beijing that give Chinese Communist Party authority to exert significant force in any territory it deems to be its own. China used COVID as an alibi for their takeover of Hong Kong the first COVID casualty. And I think it is very clear who is next, Taiwan, which will be one of the greatest tests for the free world, whether we stand on the side of Taiwan or sit back and let freedom die on that island nation. I warn my fellow Australians that we've already allowed Hong Kong to be the 21st century's Czechoslovakia. We cannot allow Taiwan to be Poland in 1939. We must stand with the free people of Taiwan. This expansion and ability to make demands over so many nations means China is not only strategising for global leadership, or better put, perhaps dictatorship, but seeks to position itself as a price giver, not taker, using generous initiatives under the guise of development to later use to expand their interest or assert dominance. This form of economic slavery through the higher purchase of nations must be combated, especially within the Pacific. Trade with China, we must, and we will, and we shall. Trade, this, this mercantile magic, is so important as it enriches both our nations, but we cannot pretend that the regime in China today or tomorrow is the same China we have dealt with in the past. Agents of the Chinese 
communist government launch regular cyber attacks on Australia. I speak to you from the Parliament of Australia, which has been under cyber attack from agents within China. This parliament has been desecate, desecrated through cyber attacks by Chinese communist government agents. We've seen our economy attacked sector by sector. We've seen Chinese agents attempt to buy influence in political parties. Our universities have prostituted themselves. If there is a light to be found or a glimmer of hope for liberty, freedom and democracy, it is, the, it is that the world is waking up to this red dawn. Beacons are being lit, bells are ringing. The quad of Australia, India, Japan and America must quadruple and quadruple some more. We must continue to support our neighbours in the Pacific. We must stand with Taiwan. Our friends are our mates and our friends' friends are also our mates. We must continue to strengthen our relationship with our mates around the world. We cannot beat around the bush. China, communist China, is a threat to a rules-based order. We must be careful. We must be aware. The red dawn is upon us. The iron silk parachute is falling. Senator Macdonald. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak to the recent tabling of the Reef Water Quality Report Card, and I want to acknowledge the extraordinary work that has been done by farmers right along and through that catchment. Uh, what the Reef Quality Report showed was a reduction of 25.5 per cent uh, in nitrogen entering the Great Barrier Reef Lagoon. And this uh, also earned the farmers an A for water quality improvements. But what this report does is it shows up, uh, throws up a major problem with how agricultural impacts are assessed. Cane farms in North Queensland received an A rating for nitrogen runoff reduction, but they still received an E rating for overall land management. Now, what that says is that it is obvious that the other factors used to award land management ratings were rendered virtually obsolete when water quality results are so favourable. It demonstrates that land management targets which were originally set are to be a proxy for water quality are overly onerous. We now know that those, pro those proxy qu uh, targets are no longer required because of more water monitoring stations uh, and, and better data. So instead of encouraging farmers to continue good work, it is driving them off the land. I'm concerned because the Great Barrier Reef Foundation uh, has, amongst others, a project that is encouraging young farmers. Uh, this is the ultimate in ageism because it is disregarding the experience and the commitment of older farmers uh, and, uh, and not recognising their contribution. But more dangerously, it is sending a message to young farmers uh, that the work of their families, of their previous generations, um, is no longer valued and that the targets they have been, they're been told to meet, which are uh, too onerous and unachievable, means that they can never be successful. These results show that experienced farmers who have been on the land for decades are capable and are doing the right thing, but they are being ignored. And Why would young people rush to farming when they see their families having to undertake record keeping under the threat of obscenely harsh penalties, and yet they are still publicly slammed of claims that they are harming the reef. Now, I note with interest that these latest findings will form part of the upcoming five-yearly review of the Reef 2050 plan, which will look at the current water quality targets and will consult with industry as part of this process. This review must go back to sensible measurements that reflect reality instead of modelling and green dogma. It must recognise that industry-led initiatives such as Smart Cane BMP, which are different to government uh, initiatives, are effective and they strike a balance between farm viability and environmental sustainability. 
In Queensland, the Labor government talks up sugarcane industry's potential for clean energy production, for biofuels, uh, for recyclable um, products such as uh, knives and forks and, and other products that we hear talk of. But at the same time, it is setting targets for farmers around land management that they cannot meet. Paper targets, process targets, which don't recognise the fact that they are getting an A for their work and the results of water quality. And be clear, because today it is sugarcane, tomorrow it will be beef, horticulture, bananas, because these are policies that do not recognise farming as a viable and useful and important activity. All these industries are listed as failing in the, in the reef care efforts, and yet the one, the one measurement that we should care about, water quality, has improved dramatically and remarkably. I'll give you an example. Last week, 30 cane farms in Queensland were audited. Not one of them passed the state government's models, which are obviously no longer fit for purpose. So remember, these are farms that are being accredited and measured as getting an A, a, a on the report card for reef water quality, but they cannot meet the paper-based recommendation, uh, paper-based uh, tests of the state government. There is something very, very wrong about this. The magnitude of this water quality achievement by farmers is matched only by the ignorance of the Queensland Labor government in its single-minded obsession with sacrificing agriculture. The implementation of tougher reef regulations on farmers was rammed through in late 2019, despite a consultation period uh, in which the ag sector repeatedly, repeatedly demonstrated that its members were doing the right thing by reducing fertiliser use, managing erosion, and, adapt and adopting new technology and, and uh, management processes. And last year's Senate inquiry found virtually zero on-farm engagement by these state government MPs or their agents. If they had bothered to get themselves out from behind a desk and visited farms, as I and other members of, uh, of the LNP have done, they would have seen farmers using laser, laser levelling subterranean fertiliser application, cane trash blanketing, better targeted and less pesticide, fertiliser and herbicide use, construction of wetlands and silt traps, and tree planting close to waterways. But Labor has ignored all of this and appeared to have already made a decision before consultation started. And I've got a flag and, and have a call out to the unwavering advocacy of Green Shirts Queensland members. Uh, including Marty Bella, Mario Quagliata and Peter Jackson. And they were backed up by marine science Peter Reid when the Senate inquiry was set up. The inquiry found that just 3 per cent of the entire Great Barrier Reef zone was affected by land use, and on-farm engagement was severely lacking. Ag industry's only la own land care initiatives had good take-up rates because farmers care about the environment. They had not been shown proof they were harming the reef. They were simply being told they were and they would be penalised for it. So what we have to be clear on is that the new laws have done nothing to improve water quality because they were introduced after uh, this reef water quality results were, were uh, taken. Instead, Labor was returned to power at the last state election and the farmers' hopes of recognition and reward for their efforts were dashed. So this report demonstrates that everything the farmers claimed was true. It exposes Labor's staggering inability to apply common sense to so many of its policies, preferring indeed, indeed to listen to uh, extreme green groups over that of practical, honest, hard-working farmers who, by the way, produce the food and fibre that we so much uh, need and desire. The Palaszczuk government should be extremely ashamed of itself. It should apologise for the way it's treating farmers and adding so much unneeded stress to them with the latest reef regulations. 
I worry about the mental health of both our existing cane farmers but also the generation that is choosing not to come behind them. I spoke to cane farmers' wives, the uh, incredibly capable administrators of the, of the paperwork uh, in Mackay. They are up at dawn trying to complete the never-ending paperwork associated with reef regulations. They watch their husbands decline under the constant threat, so be clear, threat of harsh sanctions for even innocent land use mistakes. I want to mention the hard work being done by cane growers, Dan Galligan and Paul Shembury, uh, Queensland cane growers, uh, as well as uh, Georgie Somerset from AgForce uh, and the Queensland Farmers Federation. They are trying to keep the spotlight on these unfair regulations and to highlight the good and important work of farmers. But I have to urge both the Queensland State Government and our own Federal Environment Department to approach this review with open arms, with an open mind, be prepared to listen, to act, to act sensibly and to act practically. Throw your support behind cane farmers and cattle farmers who are, acting, who are proving they are acting in good faith and to limit uh, environmental damage. Thank you. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. In September 2019, I stood in this place to deliver a statement about this government's plans to impose a cashless debit card on 23,000 people in the Northern Territory. I spoke about the depth of feeling, the powerlessness that Territorians, particularly First Nations people, felt about this plan to impose yet another heavy layer of management on them. Territorians have been very, very clear in their opposition to this government's plans to put welfare recipients onto the CDC, as it's known. We knew back then that this government knew then, after 12 years of having the basics card system under the Northern Territory emergency response or intervention imposed in the Northern Territory, there is little to no evidence that compulsory income management results in widespread or long-term benefit. This was strongly supported in the evidence given to the Senate inquiry. The CEO of the Aboriginal Medical Service Northern Territory, John Patterson, told the inquiry, this feels like the Howard era intervention all over again. The last time the government intervened in the Northern Territory and did things to us instead of with us, it failed at great cost to families and communities." End of quote. The government knew there was no evidence to prove the cashless debit card had actually worked to do what it was supposed to do and bring in widespread benefit and support for the families receiving support payments and communities. They knew there were serious questions about the harm the card may be causing to families and communities and the stigma and shame associated with its use. Despite this, the government moved ahead last year with plans to bring the cashless debit card into the Northern Territory and make it a permanent fixture in the trial communities across Australia. This was before they had the results of a $2.5 million report they commissioned into those card trial sites. This government wanted to impose this card permanently on thousands of Australians without even waiting for the evidence. Perhaps that's because they knew the evidence just wasn't there. The report, the long-awaited report, was finally released last week into the cashless debit card, which is inclusive on whether it reduces harm from alcohol, drugs and gambling, but has found that people on the welfare cards are ashamed and embarrassed. The report, conducted by the University of Adelaide and commissioned by the Federal Department of Social Services, looked at how the program had impacted participants in the communities of Sejuna in South Australia and the East Kimberley and Goldfields in Western Australia, where the card has been trialled. Commissioned in 2018, the University of Adelaide's report on the cashless debit card looked at whether alcohol and drug use, violence and gambling reduced 
during trials of the card in Sojourner, East Kimberley and the goldfields, but the study found no conclusive evidence in relation to those issues. So the report tells us nothing we didn't know and is a complete waste of time and money. Yet this government continues to put its head in the sand over this issue. And why is that? Why is the government so hell-bent on inflicting heavy-handed punishing policy on welfare recipients? I'll tell you why. Because demonising and degrading people who find themselves in positions where they can't work or find work, who are in tough times and need support, is part of this government's DNA. And we saw that clearly yesterday with the disgusting social media comments, in particular made by the member for Bowman, Andrew Lamming MP. While he was supposedly at work in the other place on the taxpayer dime, this person was busy making comments on the social media pages of groups who oppose the CDC. And I quote from the member's posts, this card is merely to prohibit sinful activities." End of quote. That's how this government regards those Australians who have fallen on tough times, those who rely on disability pensions, young people, single parents, pensioners, that being poor is a sin, according to Mr Lamming. Not content with labelling people who receive social security payments as sinners, he went on to mock people whose mental health has suffered from the punitive policies of his government. All that money they can't spend on alcohol, gambling and drugs, keen to meet that person for whom their mental health is affected, send them to my office, keen to do an intro. But he hasn't stopped there. And he went on to suggest young people would spend all their payments on alcohol or drugs. Why am I telling the Senate this? Because we do expect senators and members of the House of Representatives to hold a high standard. People who are vulnerable in our society certainly don't deserve to be stigmatised even more by their, fed, by their federal representatives. We don't know the reasons why so many people are vulnerable in our country or their personal stories as to why they've had to fall on hard times or why it is that they need to rely on Commonwealth support. We don't need to know the ins and outs of their personal reasons, but we certainly need to know how to behave and how to respond genuinely and sincerely in trying to address the issues in a practical way and in a respectful way. Acting Madam Deputy President, I certainly call on Mr Lamming to apologise to those vulnerable Australians who have been hurt and stigmatised by those unnecessary comments. And certainly on behalf of the 23,000 Territorians who have been characterised as sinners, drug takers and alcoholics, I demand that he apologises for those comments and actually maybe look at this issue more pragmatically, respectfully and put forward the arguments in a way that actually support whatever it is his government wants to do without stigmatising further those groups who obviously through this report of the Adelaide University have already identified are embarrassed enough that they do need to rely on welfare. So while we were successful, Madam Acting Deputy President, last year in opposing the government's plans to put 23,000 Territorians onto the card, we know that the government is still trying to bring it in by stealth. I was hopeful that this government and the minister would maybe take a new approach. Listen to First Nations people and communities in the Territory who have innovative ideas and solutions to these issues. First Nations people, but in particular many of the organisations in the Northern Territory, have come forward with solutions for you, Minister, with practical solutions uh, from Arnhem Land, for example, the Arnhem Land Progress Association. Uh, with the particular card that it had initiated even prior to the Northern Territory intervention in 2007. 
This was uh, a card that was quite universal and supportive and was obviously something that the communities had established themselves without the shame and embarrassment of being stigmatised for having to use it. If a community genuinely wants to use this uh, cashless debit card, they should be properly consulted and provided with the necessary supports. I understand that that still is not occurring. Labor is certainly not opposed to income management in all circumstances, but we are opposed to the broad-based compulsory programs that ensnare and disempower all people. And we are opposed to this government's approach of punishing and deriding and further stigmatising people who do live in poverty in our country. Senator Hanson. In June of 2017, following a global search, Christine Holgate was appointed Managing Director and Group CEO of Australia Post, a massive $8 billion organisation with around 80,000 employees. She was described in a joint media release by the then Minister for Finance and Minister for Communication as, quote, a highly experienced chief executive, board director and business leader with a strong record of managing and leading large and complex organisations. Ms Holgate also has ex extensive experience working closely with governments in related sectors including finance, telecommunications, media and health care. In 2015, she was named CEO of the year by the CEO Institute." End quote. In accepting the Australia Post role, Ms Holgate took a pay cut from her previous position. Her motivation was clearly not financial. Three years later, the company's annual report showed she was given a scorecard rating for 2020 of 95 per cent of the Australia Post Board and was named in the Australian Financial Review's power list as the seventh most powerful leader in business and the highest ranking woman. Ranking woman. She was regarded as an outstanding leader and was delivering financial results that made Australia Post the envy of its major competitors around the world. At no stage during her tenure were any performance issues raised with her. Australia Post's financial results for FY20 showed record revenue of $7.5 billion, up 7 per cent, and profits up 30 per cent to $53.6 million for the year, their highest ever revenue growth for a year without acquiring a major asset. Australia Post's business transformation was accelerating under Christine Holgate's leadership at a time when similar organisations around the world were buckling under the pressure of the COVID pandemic. She was indeed a stellar example of corporate leadership admired and strongly supported by Australia Post employees and contractors. Her time as CEO, including leading a small team of executives negotiating a difficult but lucrative commitment under which several major banks would contribute around $220 million over time to fund banking services in the approximately 2,900 licensed post offices or LPOs. This dramatic deal dramatically improved the financial performance of the company and guaranteed sustainability for those LPOs. It was essentially a financial life-saving deal for those offices, their operators and staff. With the approval of the then chair of Australia Post, John Stanhope, and within Australia Post regulations, Ms Holgate rewarded four members of that executive team with a gift in the form of a watch. That was in 2018. On October 22, 2020, the following Senate estimates on that day, the new chair of Australia Post, Lucio de Bartolomeo, called Ms Holgate and told her he had received a call from the Prime Minister. She was told the Prime Minister had requested Ms Holgate be stood down while an investigation into the gifting of the watches took place. Remember, this is two years after the event had occurred. It is my understanding Ms Holgate took the chair, told the chair she did not wish to stand down given the effect it would have on the organisation as it entered its peak trading season, but that she would cooperate fully with any investigation. She also forwarded a photograph of a card signed and inscribed from her and the previous chair as evidence he had supported the rewards given to the executives.
This photograph was forwarded to the Australia Post chair, to other Australia Post board members, to Minister Fletcher's chief of staff and to the deputy secretary in communications early on the afternoon of October the 22nd. At around 2.38 p.m. that day, after the forwarding of the photograph, Minister Fletcher told Question Time the CEO would be investigated and would be stood down. A few minutes later, at approximately 2.42 p.m., the Prime Minister told Question Time that Ms Holgate, and I quote, has been instructed to stand aside, and if she doesn't wish to do that, she can go, end quote, and that, is, and that it was for all to see. And there it was for all to see. No explanation by the Prime Minister, not guilty to prove an innocent, no sense of justice or fair play, no respect for one of the country's most senior and successful business leaders, no support, just complete abandonment. A simple, here comes the bus and you're being thrown under it. At no point during the question time did either Minister Fletcher or the Prime Minister acknowledge the gifting occurred two years earlier. They didn't mention it had been approved by the previous chair. They didn't mention the gifts were in recognition for securing the largest ever investment into community post offices. They didn't mention they were made in accordance with Australia Post policy. They didn't tell the House the CEO had a strong working relationship with the Prime Minister, who she met monthly and who had recently praised her leadership through COVID. They just threw her under the bus publicly and savagely. When, what conversations had gone on behind the scenes between the Prime Minister, other ministers, staff and the Australian Post chair? Why was the Prime Minister unilaterally and publicly abandoning Ms Holgate and trashing her credibility and reputation? Later that evening, the Australian Post chair issued a media statement stating the CEO would, and I quote, stand aside, end quote, while the investigation took place. It is my understanding the CEO was not consulted on the words of this statement or its contents, nor indeed was she ever informed the statement had been made. I understand Australia Post policy is that for an individual to be stood down, the individual either has to pose a serious threat or health risk to the organisation or to an individual in that organisation. I'm also advised that for there to be a legal basis to step down an individual, the individual either has to pose a serious threat or agree in writing. None of those criteria applied to Ms Holgate. She did not present a serious threat. She had not agreed in writing other than a media statement that was released without her knowledge by the chair of Australia Post to step down, and she had not agreed verbally. And yet the Australia Post chair stated at Senate estimates on 9th of November, in response to several questions from Senator Green, that Ms Holgate agreed to stand down. No evidence has ever been provided to substantiate this, even though Ms Holgate's lawyers have made multiple requests and confirmed they have considerable evidence and witnesses that she did not agree. The Hansard shows that when asked by Senator Green for the legal basis on which Ms Holgate was stood aside, the chair replied she elected to stand aside. Mr De Bartolomeo's answers to Senator Green's questions also included his statement that we had discussions with Christine and ultimately she agreed she would stand aside while the investigation took place. Moving on to December 22, following the release of the independent report on the, re of the removal of Ms Holgate, I quote Robert Godlibson, writing in the Australian Business Review. Not surprisingly, the report was immediately ordered to be kept secret because not only did it completely exonerate Christine Holgate, but showed that the remarks of the Prime Minister to the Parliament were simply wrong. And in that context, it indirectly damned the two ministers responsible for Australia Post, neither alerted the Prime Minister that he was about to make a horrible mistake. Also deeply wounded by the report, says um, Gottliebson, um, is the chairman of Australia Post, Lucio Bartolomeo, and his Liberal Party-controlled Australia Post board. Gottliebson went on. The independent report prepared by lawyers Maddox revealed that under the Australia Post regulations, the chief executive was allowed to make executive rewards of up to $150,000 for performance without board approval. She awarded the four executives a total of $20,000, $130,000 below the maximum, in the form of four cardio watches that cost around $5,000 each. The executives had pulled off 
a banking deal that added $70 million to $100 million annually to the bottom line of Australia Post and secured the future of 3,000 small business post office branches around the country. The post officers were furious that she was ordered to stand down. The report says the former chairman approved the purchase of the watches and the board was aware a reward for outstanding performance was to be made. The report praised the work of Christine Holgate, a CEO, and was adamant that she did nothing wrong in purchasing the watches." End quote. Gottlieb's review of the report describes the Prime Minister's remarks to Parliament as something that, and I quote, will personally haunt our Prime Minister for some time to come. What I'd like to, start, to finish with is all over $20,000 worth of watches that Mr Holgate was fully authorised to present in keeping with normal commercial practice that rewarded one of the most financially advantageous deals in the history of Australia. The actions of the Prime Minister, his relevant ministers and the chair and board of Australia Post and their appalling treatment of Ms Holgate deserve nothing less than a Senate inquiry. Senator Seward. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Yesterday, the government announced a $25 a week increase to JobSeeker, which is mean-spirited, cruel and, in fact, insulting to job seekers. At the same time, they announced their JobSeeker, an insidious idea that will see people on income support who are already over-surveilled by this government um, with the issue, issuing of demerit points and payment suspensions, now they're having to worry about if someone is going to dob them in on the dob seeker line um, for not taking a job. Never mind that there are 1.5 million people on the job seeker and youth allowance payments and only 175,000 jobs. This is in the context that the job provider network what we call Job Active, which is meant to be finding people these jobs, is rife with bullying, harassment of people being ignored or treated very poorly by their job service providers. While the government is doing next to nothing about these systemic issues um, and with the job, seeker, uh, the job Active system, sorry, they have empowered employers with the means to intimidate, bully and harass job seekers. As I did last night, for many, as I said last night, when I was talking about the job active process, my office has for years been contacted by people who have been poorly treated by their providers and have had little uh, areas of recourse because the very people who are treating them so poorly have the power to cut their payments. The government won't acknowledge how broken the job provider system they are pouring billions of dollars into. They, they won't acknowledge just how broken it is. They won't acknowledge what is actually happening to people on the job uh, active provider system. So I, last night, uh, read out a number of uh, excerpts from people's lived experience, and I've promised that I will keep doing it, and here are some more. These are the lived experiences of people that are trying their very best to find work and are part of the job active process. This is from uh, one person. I was diagnosed with a degenerative muscular disease and need ongoing physio. Due to the loss of muscle tone, I've had to drag oh, this one is the one that I um, did also articulate last night. They've had to drag their uh, right leg upstairs and often can't climb them at all. The job provider network thought it would be a really great idea to enrol me in a forklifting course. Problem is that there were steep, narrow stairs to get on the forklift. Imagine my embarrassment when I couldn't climb on the forklift with everybody in the class watching. I was then told I couldn't complete the course. In response, my JSP uh, accused me of not trying hard enough and threatened to have my payment suspended. All they had to do—and this is another one—all they do is look on, at online job listing sites. I do this myself regularly. What I'd hoped they'd do is reach out to local employers on my behalf and negotiate to create a position that suits me. Instead, they suggest I apply for positions which I then have to point out that I'm not qualified for. Another one. I've had multiple people working on my case. It changes a lot, which is frustrating. And another one. The constant nagging is hell. It causes a lot of anxiety and zaps my limited energy. And another person. 
I used to have two casual jobs. I'm 100 per cent serious when I say they did not help me find these jobs. I did it all myself. They gave me some fuel vouchers at one point because of the long distance and paid for some work pants, but they did not help me find the jobs. Yet I was always nagged for my payslips and had to tell them shifts and hours, as well as reporting to Centrelink. Only now that I have learnt, only now that I have learnt, they needed these for their grant. And this is a message I received from someone who's working in an, a management position with a provider. From a DSP, which is um, the Disability Employment uh, System provider perspective. I see most of the criticisms of employment services come down to one thing, the excessive compliance system imposed on job seekers and providers by the government. It's a self-defeating system designed solely to punish the unemployed. It does nothing to actually support job seekers find and retain work. From a job seeker perspective, this involves having to deal with, multi, uh, with mutual obligations and the threat of losing payments through the targeted compliance framework. From a provider perspective, it represents an absolute waste of time having to satisfy bureaucratic, bureaucratic contractual requirements. The average employment consultant will spend more than half their time conducting exercises such as holding routine fortnight, fortnightly face-to-face -face appointments, updating job plans or applying compliance measures. This is not how we would operate if we were solely tasked with helping job seekers find work. This places a major constraint on innovation, consumer service uh, and uh, customer service and ability to provide individual service. The economics of the DES contract mean most providers operate in a fairly standard way. Common practice is an employment consultant with no formal qualifications or training earning between 50 and 65,000 and expected to work with a caseload of 40 to 50 clients. Employment targets are often around 10 per cent of active caseload per month, or four to five employment placements. 50 clients times two, fort two fortnightly appointments times 30 minutes equals 50 work hours per month, even before the employment consultant is able to do any employer marketing. Because the employment consultant is spending so much time on contractual requirements, most job seekers who find work do it by themselves. Many providers are upfront about that to ensure job seekers don't have an expectation that the employment consultant will find them a job. Actually do what they're being paid billions of dollars to do. Oh, that was my editorial just then. I'm not convinced we'd see much of a change in employment outcomes if all employment services in their current form were scrapped. Another person said, when a client finds a job on their own, they quite rightly feel that the employment service providers did nothing. Job seekers will complain about being chased for payslips to allow the employment service providers to earn employment outcome payments. This is again more compliance work once uh, which once again takes away available time to actually support job seekers. Another person said, I was studying at TAFE doing a certificate two in hospitality and in the middle of my exams I was told that if I didn't participate in a work for the doll activity at the same time my exams were, my payment would be cut off. I went from studying for my exams to making Hello. candles and soap for a company that would make profit off them at markets. There would be people upstairs also packing food for homeless communities while also probably going hungry themselves. I know I was. I had to live off lettuce and salad dressing for two weeks just to get by and, as a result, ended up injuring myself. I've been left with $8 for the rest of the fortnight for food. I've had others help me, but it's just constantly being broke and having mental health stress over the next week and just waiting until payday so all the stress so you can be stressed all over again. Another person. Most recently, within the past uh, few weeks, I've had to reverse market myself to employers, having my job consultant ring me and threaten to cut off my payment and add demerit points if I didn't submit some business names and phone numbers to her. I only have one demerit point, and that was because I was so tired from my depression that I accidentally slept through the phone call and my alarm waking me to make take that phone call. I worry about submitting phone numbers of employers to her because I never hear back from promising employers when I do. 
as, as I believe that the job providers are uh, doing harassing phone calls to the numbers I provide, trying to sell them a package deal of, you'll get X amount of money if you hire them, as if I'm a piece of furniture or meat to be sold to them. Another person. I'm nearly 61 years old and have been applying for work in between university degrees since, two, two, since two, 2012. My service provider asked me if I, work, if I work on a voluntary basis for a not-for-profit association. I replied that I work voluntarily for two community groups that I, have established, that I have established in my community. My provider told me to register at, at Centrelink as a volunteer with my uh, community groups, and then I don't need to come into their office anymore for meetings. I pointed out that this does not assist me in finding a paid job. They explained that I am probably too old to gain employment and that I can continue to live on JobSeeker until I qualify for the pension in six years' time. Another example of age discrimination. This system is broken. It needs total reform. Anyone? Senator Gallagher. Uh, thanks, Mr President. In the couple of minutes that is available to me, I just wanted to uh, uh, put on the record it's uh, a very sombre duty that during the 12 months at the end of December 2020, 170 people died in crashes involving heavy trucks. These include 104 deaths in crashes involving articulated trucks, 68 deaths involving very rigid trucks. And I want to put to the Senate um, this simple proposition. There is probably no other industry in Australia, certainly none that I'm aware of, that incurs this level of death and the injuries are not stated here today. But the level of death is through the roof. I don't know how as a, as a government or a state government or a territory government or a council that we can put up with the fact that we're seeing 170 people die at work, and that's where they're dying, at work, on the road, and we're not having uh, you know, an outpouring of uh, call for action. 170 workplace deaths in the 12 months to the end of 2020. It's a disgrace. The federal parliament should move on it, as should every other parliament in Australia. Order. Senator Gallagher, questions without notice. Senator Gallagher. Oh, oh sorry. sorry, Senator Birmingham. My apologies. Thanks, thanks, Mr. President. I seek leave to make a statement regarding a ministerial absence. Leave is granted. Thanks, Mr. President. I advise the Senate that Senator Reynolds will be absent from question time for the remainder of this week for personal reasons. In Senator Reynolds' absence, Senator Payne will represent the Minister for Defence, the Minister for Veterans Affairs, the Minister for Defence Personnel, and the Minister for Defence Industry. Senator Cash will represent the Minister for Home Affairs. Senator Wong. I seek leave to make a very short statement. Leave is granted. Uh, thank you. The opposition expresses its best wishes to Senator Reynolds for a speedy recovery. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Yesterday, the Minister for Defence claimed twice, for complete clarity, that she had met with the Australian Federal Police on two occasions, with the first meeting being on 1 April 2019 with Ms Higgins and her then Chief of Staff. The Minister was then forced to correct the record. This is the second time this week that the Minister for Defence has been forced to correct her statements during question time. Does the Prime Minister have full confidence in the Minister's account to the Parliament in relation to these matters? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, well, Mr President, uh, yes, the Prime Minister has full confidence in Senator Reynolds and in her uh, work in her portfolio and her handling uh, of these very sensitive matters, uh, including uh, her work to uh, ensure the parliament is informed uh, in relation to these matters, whilst being cognisant of the responsibilities, as Senator Reynolds has outlined, uh, to uh, treat carefully and with confidence information that was shared with her, uh, to respect Ms Brittany Higgins' right uh, to tell her story and to be mindful of consequences for any potential police investigation. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. What steps has the Prime Minister taken to ensure Minister Reynolds' explanation of her conduct in response to allegations of rape in her office are accurate? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Well, uh, as, uh, as the opposition, the parliament uh, and more broadly is known, uh, there are a number of review processes underway. Uh, that, uh, that includes work in relation 
uh, to, um, to ascertaining um, the handling of events in relation to this matter. Um, however, it is also important that uh, that work is cognisant uh, of any potential implications in relation to police investigations too. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Oh, thank you, Mr President. The Prime Minister has publicly rebuked Minister Reynolds for failing to tell him of allegations of rape in her office two years ago. Minister Reynolds has said it is not her story to tell. Who is correct, Minister Reynolds or the Prime Minister? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks Mr President. Uh, and I think Senator Reynolds has been clear in this place uh, that, uh, that in relation to the details of what, uh, what uh, Ms Brittany Higgins shared with uh, Senator Reynolds and her uh, former chief of staff, that they should, that they should absolutely Order. make sure that, uh, uh, that um, Ms Higgins' um, wishes and privacy are respected during that time, uh, and that, uh, and that Ms. Reynolds, uh, Senator Reynolds has been careful in relation to the manner in which she has shared uh, that information. And the Prime Minister has indicated that in relation to matters of serious crimes, he would expect to be uh, informed, and, uh, and I think his statements stand in that regard. Senator Smith. Thank you, Mr President. My question is also to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the Morrison government's economic recovery plan is helping to chart our way out of the COVID-19 pandemic? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Smith for his question. Indeed, Mr. President, uh, as uh, all Australians appreciate and people right around the world know, uh, in the last 12 months the world faced the largest economic shock since the Great Depression. But pleasingly, Australia's recovery, Australia's economic recovery, is working. We're seeing Australians getting back into jobs and seeing confidence building across the Australian economy. Just last week, we learned the unemployment rate had fallen yet again across Australia, from 6.6 per cent to 6.4 per cent in January. Indeed, more than 59,000 full-time jobs were created across the Australian economy in January. Around 93 per cent of those jobs lost at the height of the pandemic have come back. And that means hundreds of thousands of jobs have been created over the past few months, and pleasingly, the majority of those jobs have seen Australian women re-entering the workforce. We've seen the underemployment rate hit its lowest level in years, Mr. President. Not only are we seeing new jobs being created, but the economy is showing great resilience. Today, the wage price index increased by 0.6 per cent in the December quarter, beating market expectations. The outcome was driven by stronger growth in private sector wages, which increased by 0.7 per cent, the strongest quarterly outcome in private sector wages since 2014. We've seen business and consumer confidence get back to their pre-pandemic levels, resilience in the housing market and in motor vehicle sales. We've also seen resilience across the Australian economy in relation to government support programs, with more than two million people graduating off of JobKeeper in the December quarter and another half a million people graduating off of JobKeeper just last month. Fitch, the credit rating agency, has reaffirmed Australia's AAA credit rating, one of only nine countries in the world, Mr President, to have a AAA credit rating from the leading three credit ratings agencies. That's the testament to Australia's economic strength. There is a job to continue to do, but we are absolutely Order. seeing Senator significant Birmingham. progress. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister advise the Senate how the vaccine rollout will support confidence and help secure an Australian way out of the pandemic? Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, Fitch, in their uh, restatement of the credit rating, noted that the vaccine rollout should support domestic sentiment and said, and I quote, that our economy, Australia's economy, has weathered the pandemic well compared with peers and pointed out our successful virus containment and our effective fiscal and monetary response to the pandemic. The vaccine rollout commenced this week with the rollout of the Pfizer vaccine around the country. This is the significant step in our fight against the COVID-19 pandemic and the next stages of recovery. The vaccine rollout will help to reinforce confidence across our economy. We ask every Australian to get the vaccine, which is critical to protecting them from serious illness or potentially something even worse. People in priority groups who are most at risk and who need protection the most will and are receiving the vaccine first. 
Under our plan, some 240 aged care facilities across the country and 16 major public hospitals, 60,000 Australians living and working in aged care and disabilities care will Order. receive the Senator vaccine Birmingham. first, Time along with frontline workers. Expired. Senator Smith, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister outline to the Senate further measures that will underpin our continued strong economic recovery post the pandemic? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, as I said earlier, we have seen good news on the jobs front in January when we went through that last change in gear on JobKeeper and JobSeeker. We have always maintained that these were temporary measures designed to taper off as economic confidence recovered and momentum builds, and we are seeing that recovery underway. We recognise there are some challenges ahead, though. That is why we are making some of the permanent changes to our social security system, as announced yesterday. Uh, as at the 1st of April, 1.95 million Australians who are currently accessing working age payment will see a permanent $50 per fortnight increase in their rate of payment. It is, Mr President, the single biggest year-on-year -year increase to the rate of unemployment benefits since 1986, but comes at significant budgetary cost of around $9 billion. In addition, we are also permanently increasing the amount of money job seekers can earn before they lose a cent of payment to $150 per fortnight. This is a continuation of the carefully considered, balanced approach our government has taken through the pandemic Order, to supporting Senator Australians Birmingham. and the Australian economy. Before I come to you, Senator Keneally, could I draw to the attention of honourable senators the presence in the gallery of the Ambassador of Thailand to Australia, Her Excellency Ms Buzadi Santi Pitaks. On behalf of all senators, I wish you a warm welcome to the parliament and in particular to the Senate. Yeah. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Cash. The Australian Federal Police National Guidelines on Sensitive Investigations, together with the AFP's guidelines for ministerial briefings, outline how the AFP must manage sensitive matters and keep the Minister for Home Affairs informed. The guideline requires that the AFP SES officers must brief the minister, and I quote, as soon as possible about matters where there is anticipated media attention or political implications. Did the AFP inform the Minister for Home Affairs about Ms Higgins' alleged rape in the Minister for Defence Office, as required by these guidelines? If so, when? And if not, why not? The Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Keneally for the question. Uh, Senator Keneally, I can advise as follows. I can advise the Senate that AFP Commissioner Kershaw first advised Minister Dutton of Ms Higgins' allegations on Thursday, the 11th of February, 2021. This was the first time the minister was advised of Ms Higgins' allegations. The minister received further verbal updates from Commissioner Kershaw during last week and this week. I am advised that the minister's office was not aware of Ms Higgins' allegations prior to the minister's briefing from Commissioner Kershaw on the 11th of February, 2021. As senators would know, Mr President, the handling of allegations and investigation of criminal conduct, including briefing to ministers, is a matter for the Australian Federal Police. Nevertheless, the minister has sought and received assurances from the Commissioner of the AFP that the investigation will leave no stone unturned. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. The AFP de defines a sensitive investigation as likely to impact or be of significant interest to, quote, an elected member or associate or staff member of an elected member. Did the AFP declare the alleged rape of Ms Higgins in the Defence Minister's office as a sensitive matter consistent with the guidelines? And if not, why not? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And Senator Keneally, in relation to that question, I will need to take it on notice and revert back to you. Senator Keneally, a supplementary, final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Ms Higgins has said that Minister Cash's chief of staff told her, and I quote, don't worry, we will call Dutton. Did the Minister for Home Affairs or his staff discuss Ms Higgins' case with any other minister or ministerial staff member, including Minister Reynolds? Senator Cash. Uh, again, Senator Keneally, uh, I re uh, refer to the answer I gave you in my first question in relation to any additional information on behalf of Minister Dutton. I will need to take that on notice and revert to you. Senator McMahon. Thank you, Mr. President. 
My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Can the Minister update the Senate on the national COVID vaccine rollout, particularly to remote and Indigenous communities? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, Senator McMahon, for your question. This week is a historic week for all Australians. We are now into day three of the mass vaccine rollout across the country. We are prioritising the most vulnerable in our society to receive the vaccine first, Mr. President. Aged care residents uh, and border and quarantine frontline health workers are being offered the vaccine this week. Among the 240 facilities and 190 towns in regional and remote centres across the country to receive the vaccines this week, vaccinations are occurring in the Northern Territory, um, the territory you are so proud to represent, Senator McMahon. And I can indicate that, uh, as of this morning, 249 residents of aged care facilities in the Northern Territory have received a vaccination. The Royal Darwin Hospital will also be working to vaccinate frontline health care workers. The most vulnerable are part of phase 1A of the vaccine rollout. Phase 1B will include Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people over 55, adults aged over 70, health, other health care workers, younger adults with an underlying health condition, including those with a disability, and high-risk workers, including defence, police, fire emergency services and meat processing workers. Mr. President. Phase 2A includes Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people aged 15 to 54 years, adults aged 50 to 69 years and other critical high-risk workers. Mr. President. Phase 2B expands the remainder of the population over the age of 16. Senator McMahon, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Given that people on remote communities are extremely mobile and on any day a large proportion of the population may be away, can the minister detail how we are going to ensure that people receive their follow-up vaccination within the manufacturer's time frame? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thanks, Senator McMahon, for the supplementary question. The rollout of the COVID-19 vaccines into regional, rural and remote communities is a vital part of the Australian government's vaccine strategy to protect our rural and remote communities and manage the fight against virus in the regions. Both the Pfizer, BioNTech and AstraZeneca vaccines are, require two separate doses for a person to be fully, fully immunised. Pfizer, BioNTech, 21 days apart, and AstraZeneca, 12 weeks apart. Mr. President. The rural health workforce has been integral to managing the challenge of the COVID pandemic over the year, and our rural health workforce is vital to the success of our vaccination rollout. And we will again be relying on them, uh, and we know we can rely on them to follow up individuals and deliver for our remote communities. We commend the efforts of all the doctors, nurses, midwives, pharmacists and allied health workers Mr. President, in our rural and remote areas and thank them for their efforts. Senator McMahon, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister inform the Senate how the vaccination rollout complements the government's commitment to the health of Indigenous Australians? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Improving Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health remains a high priority for our government and a central component of the new national agreement on closing the gap. Mr. President. To drive progress towards cl our closing the gap Order. commitments, we are working in partnership with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health experts Order to refresh the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Plan. The Indigenous Health Australian uh, health care pro program is investing approximately $4 million Mr. President, over four years to improve the health Order. and well-being of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. The government Senator recognises Green. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians may be particularly vulnerable Mr. President, to the impacts and restrictions put in place as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, and we provided support to develop a culturally appropriate mental health and wellbeing resources to support First Australians Order. during the COVID-19 pandemic. Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Birmingham. The Buy Now, Pay Later industry announced today a voluntary code of practice. The industry has claimed this will impose minimum standards across all providers, 
but the code still allows purchases up to $2,000 to be made without any checking at all if a user has any income or debts, and it means $10,000 of purchases, for example, could be made without the platform understanding if it is affordable for the borrower. If a provider violates the code, the only penalty is to be named by the Finance Industry Association. Does the government believe this is adequate? The Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks Mr President, and, uh, and I thank the Senator for his question. Uh, my understanding is that uh, the Australian Securities and Investment Commission undertook a review into this sector and, uh, and determined that uh, a code should be voluntary. Uh, I am advised that, uh, that indeed an announcement of that was made by the sector today, uh, that, um, uh, that the sector has indicated um, it is uh, putting in place a code which I understand comes into effect from 5 October 2021, um, that, uh, that it's supported by regulatory powers that do enable ASIC to intervene uh, where it identifies significant consumer detriment and to ensure uh, that products are designed to suit target consumers. Uh, I understand uh, the code has attracted uh, support of more than 95 per cent of the market um, in relation to uh, buy now, pay later uh, sector um, and has, uh, has crucial points um, that, uh, that any late fees must be capped, um, that it imposes uh, some compulsory membership obligations in the sector, uh, that, um, uh, that it must follow the design and distribution obligations from the ASIC review uh, and that uh, providers must monitor vulnerable uh, customers. Um, I, don't, uh, I don't, Senator, have details in relation to the precise thresholds that, uh, that you have uh, identified, but in terms of any further safeguards applicable under the code or other measures uh, for individuals uh, in relation to those lower threshold of, um, uh, of loans uh, or purchases, uh, I shall uh, bring any further information back to the Chamber for you. Senator Griff, a supplementary question. Uh, Minister, by now, Pay later services do not require credit assessments, affordability checks, income verification, or to comply with lending obligations. Now, in comparison, so-called payday lenders are regulated and must undertake comprehensive credit assessments and comply with responsible lending obligations. Why does the government regulate one type of short-term, high-cost credit, but not the other? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, well, look, I, uh, I would. Uh, refer the senator to the findings of the ASIC review, uh, which, uh, which I think did look carefully at the differences in relation to uh, some of these sectors. Uh, there's obviously been uh, a rapid period uh, of growth uh, in relation to buy now, pay later arrangements with companies such as Afterpay uh, growing and creating a, a significant and popular arrangement uh, for consumers. Uh, the ASIC report highlighted that providers uh, are improving aspects of their business practices, uh, that, uh, that um, they are expecting membership of the Financial Complaints Authority as part of their operations, uh, that they're making information about their complaints and hardship processes more accessible to consumers, while others are now referring consumers to financial counselling services in the event consumers are facing financial difficulty. Uh, ASIC, I know, is continuing to collect data on this industry and monitor changes in it, uh, and will continue to do so in terms of the Order. consideration Senator of Birmingham. the different sectors. Senator Griff, a final supplementary question. Earlier this month, the UK government published a review of the buy now, pay later industry, and that review found the industry targets younger and less financially literate users, allowing them to access credit without checks and to hide debts from other lenders. Some users, of course, become trapped with unaffordable debts. That government chose to reclassify the services as credit providers and regulate them accordingly. When will this government do the same? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, well, I, I'm advised the UK government's uh, uh, review did acknowledge that buy now, pay later arrangements can also provide clear benefits to consumers, um, uh, whilst they have sought to identify and address some of the regulatory issues uh, in the UK consumer credit uh, obligation. Um, what we see is that young people, uh, in particular, uh, are using less credit, uh, particularly fewer uh, reduced use of credit cards since the growth of buy now, pay later uh, services. And so there is some product substitution in relation to uh, 
uh, financing options occurring in this regard. Uh, as I indicated before, ASIC will continue to review these, uh, these matters uh, and particularly the implementation of the industry code as announced today. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the minister please update the Senate on how the Morrison government is leading generational change in our vocational education and training system to create a world-class and uniquely Australian training system? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Brockman uh, for the question. And Senator Brockman, indeed, skills and training are at the centre of the Morrison government's Order. economic recovery plan for Australia as a Senator result Watt. of the COVID-19 pandemic. And indeed, as our Prime Minister has said himself, this will be a year of generational change in our skills and vocational education sector. And Mr President, as we emerge from COVID-19, the Morrison government will invest almost $7 billion, $7 billion to keep apprentices and trainees on the job. But not only that, to actually create opportunities for 100,000 new apprentices and trainees to come on into the system and, of course, to help our fellow Australians who are in need of upskilling or reskilling so that they can move back into the labour market. Mr President, we are creating and transforming vocational education and training in Australia. And of course, critical to this is the work that we're doing through the National Cabinet for a new skills agreement, a new skills funding agreement to provide more transparency, but also to better link the funding that the Australian taxpayer ultimately provides to actual skills needs across Australia. And this new funding agreement will build on the work that we've already done as a government in relation to ensuring we have a strong skills system. And of course, the first thing we had to do, Mr. President, when we were elected to office, is clean up the mess created by those opposite in relation to Labor's vet fee help system. Now, colleagues, the problem with Labor is their policies linger. And I have to uh, just uh, inform the Senate that to date, in relation to Labor's disastrous vet fee help, Mr. President, we have now spent or the taxpayer has spent over $2 billion, $2 billion colleagues, recrediting the victims of this disastrous policy. So the Morrison government cleaned up Labor's mess and we are ensuring we're putting skills and training Order, at the Senator forefront Cash. of the economic Senator Brockman, recovery. Senator a supplementary question. Well, thank you, Mr President. I certainly do have a supplementary question. Can the minister advise the Senate on how the Job Trainer Fund is demonstrating the capability of the Commonwealth and the states to partner and provide world-class training opportunities to Australians. Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, as part of our record investment as a government, uh, the almost $7 billion that we are investing in skills and training across Australia, uh, this of course includes our $1 billion job trainer fund. And this is, as you know, in partnership with the states and territories uh, across Australia to provide free or low-cost Australian uh, uh, low-cost training uh, in areas, and this was the key, in areas of skills demand. It's based on labour market modelling from the National Skills Commission, and it's providing now job trainer over 300,000 training places. As I said, in areas of skills demand across the economy. And uh, Senator Brockman, indeed, in our home state of Western Australia. Uh, we now have over 16,000 training places available. That's free or low-cost training places available in areas of demand, and that includes courses like cyber security, horticulture and disability support. Again, the $1 billion job, training, job trainer fund helping Australians upskill, reskill uh, and Senator ensure that Cash. they're equipped Senator to get a job. Jockman, a final supplementary question. Can the minister outline to the Senate how the government's use of employer incentives have kept apprentices and trainees on the job through the COVID-19 pandemic and how they will support a new generation of Australians to reskill and get high quality jobs? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, from the outset of COVID-19, the government understood that uh, one of our first economic priorities had to be to put in place the policy so that our employers could keep their apprentices and their trainees on the job where we needed them the most. And we've done that through our supporting apprentices and trainees wage subsidy. And that continues to run through until March this year. And in fact, Mr President, as at the 11th of February, the supporting apprentices measure has now assisted 
over 62,600 businesses, and I'm pleased to say, as the Minister for Small and Family Business, that that actually includes 98 per cent of that figure of small businesses, and it's helped them retain almost 120,000 apprentices and trainees. So that's 120,000 apprentices and trainees that have been kept on the job because of the economic response that the Morrison government put in place. And of course, we also have our $1.2 billion boosting apprenticeship commencements, which aims to create 100,000 new Time apprenticeships. The has expired. Senator McKim. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Immigration and the Minister for Home Affairs. Minister, can you confirm that earlier this year there was a significant disturbance or riot at the Christmas Island Detention Centre that involved up to 200 canisters of tear gas being fired into the compound? What was the nature of the disturbance and were there any injuries? What steps were taken to ensure the safety of the family from Biloela? who are detained nearby. Were the family, in particular the young children, impacted in any way, including psychologically? What measures has the government taken since to assess the impact on the family, in particular the children, and to ensure their wellbeing? The Minister representing the Ministers for Immigration and Home Affairs, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And I thank Senator McKim for the question. Uh, Senator McKim, I understand you are referring to uh, an incident that occurred in February of this year, February 2021, uh, whereby a male detainee was seen on the roof of our building at Villawood Detention Centre. I could, uh, in relation to then, uh, what you are referring to, I will need to take that on notice uh, and get you um, some further advice on that. And it, in relation to the Billawheeler family itself, uh, that was part of the question. Uh, again, Senator McKim, and I know we've talked through this before, and I think it is one of those issues that we will need to agree to disagree on uh, in relation to that. But you'd be aware that the full court of the federal court, uh, their judgment was recently delivered, uh, and certainly um, the full federal court, the department is now considering the implications of that decision, uh, as you know. Uh, but again, if I go back to the history, uh, of the Biloela family. Just to remind the chamber that both adults arrived in Australia, Senator McKim, as you know, uh, as illegal maritime arrivals, uh, meaning that they paid a people smuggler and arrived in Australia illegally by boat. And after arriving in Australia illegally by boat, uh, they Order. met and they had two children. Uh, since 2012, and again, Senator McKim, I know you are aware of these facts, but just to ensure that we are, are placing them again on the record, the families claim to engage Australia's protection obligations have been compre comprehensively assessed, as you know, and the family has consistently been found uh, not to be owed protection. Uh, but again, Senator McKim, in relation to the issue that you raised at the beginning of your question, uh, to the extent that I can, I will seek further information for you uh, and ensure that you are provided with that information. Senator McKim, a supplementary question. Uh, thanks, President. And just to assist uh, the minister, I believe it was about mid, early to mid-January on Christmas Island. Minister, how much money has your government spent needlessly detaining the family from Biloela, and how much have you spent on legal costs against that family to date? How can you possibly justify that expenditure? Senator Cash. Well, again, Senator McKinn, we're going to have to uh, agree to disagree. Uh, you and I have done this dance before, and I don't propose to do the dance again. But I do need to remind the chamber that a fundamental difference between the Morrison government, those on the coalition side of politics, uh, and in particular <coughs> Senator McKim, the Australian Greens and the Australian Labor Party, uh, is that we believe in sovereign borders. That is it. Full order. stop. Senator, and at Senator Cash, Senator McKim on a point of order. Um, order. Order on my left, Senator McKim on a point of order. Uh, thank you very much, uh, President. Point of order on um, relevance. I asked how much money the government has spent uh, detaining the family from Biloela and in legal costs against the family. And, and, I, I ask that you uh, remind and the Minister. Senator McKim, that was the first part of the question. The second part was much more widely written. It was how can you possibly justify? Uh, uh, and, and, and I think, with respect, that the Minister has a lot of discretion in answering such a wide question. Um, I, I regard that question as quite wide. The first part was quite specific, I grant you, but in this case I think the minister is being relevant to the second part of the question. 
Senator Cash. And that is exactly right. You, you did mention expense, Senator McKim. Uh, so I do need to remind you that uh, the border protection failures of those opposite, combined with the Australian Greens, order. cost Senator, the Australian Senator taxpayer. Cash. Senator Cash, Senator McKim, on a point of order. Uh, yes, it's again on relevance, President, and in, in regards to your first ruling, that the second part of my question was how can you possibly justify this expenditure? That is the expenditure that I referred to in the first part of my supplementary question. So I, I would put to you respectfully that in fact it's quite a tightly worded question, and the minister is not being relevant to it. Um, Senator McKim, the first part of your question I do regard as a, a, a factual question. The second part of the question asks the minister for an explanation, and, and your point of order goes to the content or the validity of that explanation. And I think that's a matter for debate after question time. Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President. As I was saying, Senator McKim, $17 billion, that is how I'm justifying it. $17 billion worth of taxpayers' money had to be outlaid to protect Australians from your border protection failures. 50,000 people arriving on 800 Order. boats, 1,200 lives Order. lost to sea, 8,000 children detained while Labor was in government. And in July 2013, let's just remind people, 10,201 people time for the in answer detention. Has expired. In Senator Cash, time for the answer has expired. There was too much noise approaching the end of that answer. Even I was having trouble hearing the minister. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you. As a final supplementary, could I ask the minister to clarify, was she, was she actually saying that she has spent $17 billion imprisoning and in legal action against the Biloela family? Could you first address that, please, Minister? Secondly, why are you ignoring the hundreds of thousands of Australians who have called for this innocent family's release? How much more money will you spend trying to deport them and lead, needlessly detaining them? And why will you not do the right thing and return them to where they are loved and supported in Biloela? Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And Senator McKim, I'm just going to have to completely reject uh, the premise of your question. In answer to your question, let me just remind you, Senator McKim, that on this side of the chamber, the Morrison government side of the chamber, uh, we believe in sovereign borders. We will determine who comes to this country and the circumstances in which they come. Order. When you refer to the Biloela family, the I need to remind you that the principle is this. Both adults arrived in Order. Australia Senator as Keneally. illegal maritime arrivals. Senator Meaning, Keneally, Senator McKim, Senator they McKim. paid a people smuggler and they arrived in Australia illegally Senator by boat. Keneally. You may, Senator McKim, think that is OK. Sorry, Senator McKim, on a point of order. Uh, in fact, the entirety of that family did not Sorry, arrive McKim. Senator McKim, what is your point of order? What is your point of order, Senator uh, McKim? The minister's misleading the Senate. Senator McKim, the content of answers is debated after question time. Can I ask senators for a little bit less disorder, please? Senator Cash. Well, well thank you, Mr President. And again, the fundamental difference, colleagues, is this. The Greens want to give the keys to our borders back to the people smugglers, and we say order. no. We say no. Order. We've taken Senator back Thorpe control on of our point borders. Of order. I have Senator Thorpe on a point of order. Order. Senator Keneally. Senator Thorpe on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and my point of order is uh, in relation to misleading the chamber on talking about sovereign borders. I'm afraid, Senator As Thorpe, a sovereign uh, Senator Thorpe, woman, Senator sovereignty Thorpe, belongs Thorpe, to us, and that family. Senator Thorpe, points of order must be about the standing orders. I'm not going to allow points of order to debate the content of answers, and I will take that very strictly. Senator Cash to continue. Thank you, Mr. President. The Morrison government, the coalition government, have taken back control of our borders from the people Order smugglers. Senator Cash, time for the answers expired. Senator Patrick. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. President. My, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development. Uh, it's a trifecta for Senator Cash. Um, Regional Express Airlines, which was the recipient of a multi million dollar support package from the Australian taxpayer throughout the COVID crisis, this week announced that it will axe five key routes across the country, including the Adelaide to Kangaroo Island route in my home state of South Australia. This comes a week before they launch their first Sydney to Melbourne flights. Has the federal government engaged Rex Airlines about these axed routes, including Adelaide to Kangaroo Island, and is the government considering extending its regional airlines assistance program which, the, which these routes are being subsidised with. 
the minister representing the Minister of Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And, uh, I thank Senator Patrick for the question. And, Senator Patrick, I can advise as follows. Uh, the government, uh, I can advise, is in daily discussions uh, with airlines to understand the needs of the sector and ensure our programs are supporting the communities that they fly to. Uh, you'd understand, though, that decisions on network configurations and scheduling are ultimately a commercial matter for the airlines themselves. Uh, and this includes, as you've uh, referred to in your question, Rex's decision to cease the Adelaide to Kangaroo Island route. Uh, the regional aviation network support does not compel airlines to fly two particular routes. However, we continue to monitor the future, uh, the need for future support, uh, whether it be through aviation measures or broader economic measures. Uh, you'd be aware that Rex is one of 15 operators receiving funding uh, to ensure critical aviation services, particularly in regional and remote Australia, uh, through the COVID-19 pandemic and the impact on the aviation sector, uh, to ensure essential workers can travel domestically, support health transport services uh, and distribute critical goods and uh, equipment. The regional aviation network support, as you'd be aware, currently runs until March. Uh, and I am advised uh, that, we, obviously, as a government, we continue to monitor the situation and continue further support if necessary. Uh, Qantas themselves, uh, in a media release, has stated we will be reviewing our network and consider whether we can offer services on any of the routes that Rex is threatening to pull out of. And I, I think, you know, from the government's perspective, we've always been of the opinion that Australia's aviation industry. Uh, does have a bright future ahead, uh, and I am confident that we will rebuild throughout 2021 and beyond. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Has the government engaged South Australia's tourism minister, that's Premier Stephen Marshall, about the impact this axing will have on tourism in Kangaroo Island, uh, which is still recovering from the horrific bushfires last year? and a loss of tourism dollars from COVID-19 shutdowns and border restrictions? And if not, will they at some stage in the future? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Patrick. Um, again, and I refer to uh, my answer to your first question. Uh, the government is in daily discussions with airlines uh, to understand the needs of the sector and ensure our programs are supporting the communities they fly to. Uh, the government also expects all state and territory governments to engage with airlines to ensure the required support for their local communities and regions are considered, particularly with inter- and intra-state routes. Uh, airlines, as you know, are receiving government assistance under different government programs uh, based on their specific circumstances. Uh, and as stated in my previous answer, order. Senator Patrick on a point of order. Just on relevance, uh, Mr. President, I, I was keenly interested in the engagement that might have taken place between the government and the South Australian Tourism Minister, Premier Marshall. You reminded the Minister of the question. She has 18 seconds remaining to answer. I shall listen carefully. Senator Cash. Uh, and thank you. And in relation to those discussions, I will take that on notice. But the government, as I've said, is in daily discussions themselves uh, with the airlines. And our expectation, obviously, is that state and territory governments are also engaging with airlines uh, to ensure that the required support for their local communities uh, and regions is Order, considered. Senator Cash. Senator Patrick, a final supplementary question. Mr. President, uh, what is the government's plan to ensure that the aviation sector remains safe? available and affordable to regional areas in Australia, and particularly uh, those reliant on tourism, such as Kangaroo Island? Senator Cash. Uh, well, Senator Patrick, I can advise that in June 2020, the government directed the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, the ACCC, uh, to monitor the prices, costs and profits of Australia's domestic airline industry and provide quarterly reports to inform government policy. The ACCC continues to monitor airline activity and has published two quarterly reports on airline competition in Australia in September and December 2020. Uh, the programs that the government itself has put in place uh, have been targeted specific to the needs of Australian communities and developed, as you know, in close consultation uh, with the sector. 
The focus of the Australian government's efforts uh, has been to keep essential services running, and this has enabled funding to flow through to the aviation sector, ensuring that the maximum number of jobs can be supported. And, uh, unfortunately, I don't have time, but I could take you through uh, the five-year plan we have for aviation. Order, Senator that Cash. Wait for another Senator day. Gallagher. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. In an article entitled, entitled PM intervenes in submarine debacle, the Australian Financial Review, Review has reported that, and I quote, two senior naval officers have been tasked by the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, to examine options for Australia's submarine fleet, fleet amid ongoing tensions with the French over the $90 billion future submarines program. Can the minister confirm that the Prime Minister is so concerned over the bungling of the future subs program by the Minister of Defence that he was left with no cho choice but to intervene. The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, no, I cannot confirm that because I certainly do not accept some of the statements made in the Senator's question, Mr. President. This government has taken strong action to ensure that our defence forces will have the capability they require for the future, in particular the naval capability they will require for the future. In seeking to deliver that naval capability, including future submarines, this government has also committed very significantly to ensure we build sovereign defence industry capability in this country as well. And the actions that we have taken stand in stark contrast, Mr. President, to the inaction of those asking the questions in this regard. Senator Keneally. As a government, Mr. President, we have taken serious action to make sure that we commission the building of new defence infrastructure, of new defence assets, of new naval assets in this country, including future frigates and including future submarines. And we've done so in contrast to those opposite who commissioned not one new Australian-built naval vessel. Our commitment is to make sure that these projects are delivered, Mr President, delivered according to the timelines that have been announced, delivered according to the commitments around Australian industry capability. And our focus will be on ensuring in that delivery that we secure the value for money. I, I, see, I hear Senator Wong say that you still haven't delivered on, like somehow they were going to be built yesterday. Well, they would have been built a lot sooner if those opposite had actually commissioned any Order. of them, if they'd actually made any types of decisions in that Order. regard. We have made the decisions to do them. We have Order. made the decisions to build these things, Senator Wong. Order. We have made the decisions that you failed to make. Order. We have made sure that we have made those decisions. We have signed those contracts. Order. There is indeed, on the future frigates, still being cut, Senator work Wong. happening work underway and under your lot you couldn't even make the decision to do it in the first place. We have the work commencing. Order, Senator, se order, Senator Wong. Senator Gallagher is on his feet. Senator Gallagher has the call. Order. Thanks, uh, Mr President. When did the Prime Minister make the decision to intervene and call in two senior Navy officers to examine the whole program? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, the Prime Minister stays very close in terms of monitoring the progress on delivering against these critical national defence infrastructure capabilities. He works to make sure that order Senator Wong on a point of order. Mr President, direct relevance. The Minister may have spent most of his first answer talking what happened almost a decade ago. This is a very, very specific question about when the Prime Minister made a decision to intervene, I'd ask you to draw this minister to the question. I've been listening to the minister for 11 seconds. I, I thought he was talking about the Prime Minister, so I'm going to actually— I, 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 Senator Wong, 11 seconds in, um, I haven't heard enough to determine that where he's going is not going to be directly relevant. I've allowed you to remind the, answer, to remind the minister of the question, and I shall listen to it. Senator Birmingham. Now, Mr President, as I was saying, the Prime Minister and Minister Reynolds and every member of the Cabinet are very focused on ensuring these projects are delivered to meet the naval requirements for the future. I don't, I don't accept all of the imputations in relation to Senator Gallagher's questions in the primary question or indeed uh, the fact that I'm going there's a report in the financial review I hear from Senator Order. Keneally. Well Senator of course Keneally. of course of course we'll Senator just Keneally run off of media reports shall we? 
No, order. what our Senator government's Birmingham. focused on doing. Senator Wong on a point of order. Point of order, direct relevance. When did the Prime Minister make the decision to intervene and call in the two, se two senior Navy officers to examine the whole program? That is the only question we have asked. I asked this minister to demonstrate some accountability to the parliament, some observation order, of the standing Senator orders and be Wong, directly relevant. The minister was referring to the quotation in the substantive question that was related to this, I believe. Um, it, is, it is a very tight, but I cannot... I, 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 cannot, I cannot instruct the minister how to answer the question. At that point, he directly said he did not agree with some of the imputations that this question was drawn from, I believe, that were in the quotation in the, in the substantive question. So as long as, the Prime Min as long as the minister is narrowly construed to that, I can't instruct him on the content of the answer. I will take some advice after. I, I'm happy to take some advice, Senator Wong, after this. And if I am incorrect, I will happily report so to the chamber. Senator Birmingham. No. Mr. President, I'm sorry to break it to Senator Wong, Senator Gallagher, or those opposite. But indeed, the Prime Minister and Minister Reynolds rely on a lot more than two senior defence officers in relation to the delivery of these critical pieces of defence infrastructure. So, Mr. President, we are working hand in glove with defence, with companies, Order. to get Senator the assets Birmingham, our Navy the needs. The answer has expired. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, President. When did the Minister for Defence first become aware that the Prime Minister was forced to intervene to fix this debacle? When? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. President, I completely reject that, that question and the underlying premise behind it. Because, Mr. President, the Prime Minister and Minister Reynolds are consistently engaged and working together in relation to the delivery of these projects, along with the members of the National Security Committee of the Cabinet, along with the relevant Defence Department officials and agencies. That's what's happening, Mr. President. Is a government that works as a cabinet government, a prime minister, and his ministers working together to make sure that we achieve the outcomes our government has set? And the outcomes our government has set to achieve is to deliver the naval infrastructure and capabilities that we need for the future. To deliver the frigates, the submarines, the offshore patrol vessels, the investment indeed in other technology and capability that our defence department requires. $90 billion worth of commitments that we have made compared to the big fat zero that we inherited when we came to office. Order. Senator Canavan. Thank you, uh, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Said Seselja. Can the minister advise the Senate on the importance of gas in Australia's COVID recovery, especially in rural and regional Australia? The Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Seselja. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I thank uh, my friend and colleague, Senator Canavan, for the question. A gas-fired recovery is a key part of the government's JobMaker plan, and it is central to a strong Australia as we recover from the coronavirus pandemic. Now, Australia's competitive advantage has always been based on cheap energy, and gas will be central to our ongoing economic recovery. We want to see Australian gas working for all Australians, especially uh, in our regions. And we're taking action to deliver more Australian gas to where it is needed at the right price. Now, this will be delivered through a comprehensive plan of 13 measures that will establish an open competitive hub model like the Henry Hub in the United States. Now, the three key action areas are unlocking supply, efficient transportation and empowering consumers. Now, we're progressing a range of regulatory reforms and assessing what critical national gas infrastructure is needed to create a competitive gas market that will drive down prices. We're investing $220 million to support development in the Beedaloo Basin. Senator Watt, We've ensured our Senator major Keneally, gas exporters offer more order. gas on the domestic Sorry, Senator Seselja, please resume your seat. Se sorry, Senator Canavan, this is not helping. Senator Canavan, this isn't helping. We're wasting question time. Senator Keneally, you've been particularly voluble this question time. I'm going to ask you to restrain yourself for the last 10 minutes. Senator Keneally, Senator Seselja to continue. Uh, th thank you, thank Senator you, Mr. Stirl, President. Count to 10. We've ensured Silently. that major. Senator Stirl. 
We have ensured that major gas exporters offer more gas on the domestic market more often and on more competitive terms, meaning lower prices. We are developing an industry code of conduct to address pricing principles, and all of our collective efforts are delivering results. Even before COVID-19, we saw reductions in the domestic spot price across eastern Australia, and these prices have continued to fall. Wholesale gas prices on the east coast during 2020 were around 40 per cent lower than prices in 2019 and these prices remain low. Lower gas prices are also driving down wholesale electricity prices. Those opposite can't even work out if they support gas, but thankfully for Australian households and businesses, Order. we Senator, are confused Selger, on the issue. Senator Canavan, a supplementary question. On my left, Senator Canavan. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister outline how Australia's manufacturing sector will benefit from a gas-fired recovery? Senator Seselja. Thank you very much, and I thank the senator. The gas is a critical enabler of Australia's economy. It supports our manufacturing sector that employs over 850,000 Australians and is an essential input in the production of a range of items, uh, such as plastics for PPE and fertiliser for food production. Ensuring a reliable, stable and affordable supply of gas to power Australian jobs and industries is one of the highest priorities of this Liberal and National Government. Those opposite don't have a plan to secure dispatchable capacity that the manufacturing industry will rely on into the future. And we know, well, we know, Senator McAllister, we know what your plans are. That's because their real plan is always higher taxes, more and higher taxes. We saw it at the last election with their $387 billion plan for more taxes. They've only got one plan. The Liberals and Nationals can deliver the secure, reliable and affordable energy that will underpin our economic recovery, create new jobs and Order, grow Senator our manufacturing Senator sector. Senator Canavan, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr President. Um, can the minister also Order. outline to the Senate how gas can help bring down energy prices for everyday Australians and any risks to delivering increased gas supply Senator, and Senator lower Watt. energy prices? Order, Senator Canavan. Senator Watt. We cannot slip to the point where I can't hear the question. What, remember my rule, Senator Watt. Count to ten after your name is called, silently at least. Um, Senator Seselja. Oh, well, thank you very much. I thank Senator Canavan for the question. I thank Senator Watt for the interjection as well, because, because he's talking about you know, he's forgotten what he stands for. And I'm asked whether there are risks. Well, there are a number of risks. Uh, the Leader of the Opposition, the Shadow Minister for Energy and, of course, the Shadow Minister for Queensland Resources. He is a risk. And, you, know, you talk about forgetting what you stand for. You can, imagine, you can imagine going back to activist Murray Watt, how he would be shaking his head now. He would, back when he was handing out free joints at university, he would be shaking his head, uh, he would be shaking his head that he now has to pretend to support the Queensland resources industry. I mean, does he actually support it or does he just have to pretend? I mean, it reminds me of George Costanza having to pretend to be an architect. At least his heart was in it, Murray. At least his heart was in it. We support the gas Order. industry, whether the Order. Labor Party does or not. On my right, we're not going to get into desk banging. Senator Chisholm. A very lame act to follow. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister Order. representing the Minister Sorry, for Health. I'll, I'll allow Senator Chisholm to start again because I can't hear it. On my right, Senator Keneally. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. I refer to disturbing reports today that two elderly Queensland aged care residents, aged 94 and 88, have been given four times the recommended dose of the COVID-19 vaccine by a doctor contracted through the federal government. Which one of those residents, with one of those residents being hospitalised as a result? How has this mistake been allowed to occur? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, thanks, Senator, Senator, for the question. It's a, it's, a very, it's a very important question, Mr. President. And just can I say at the outset, I think I might have said an incorrect number in my previous answer. It's, I said four Order. million instead of four billion, Order. so I would like to correct the record on that to start with. Mr. President, the, the, circumstance that occurred in, the circumstance that occurred in Queensland yesterday, Mr. President, should not have happened. 
It should not have happened. Uh, the government is just as concerned as anybody else in this chamber with respect to the circumstance that occurred in uh, Queensland yesterday. What, did, what occurred is, a, on my advice, Mr. President, there was a clinical incident that we're at a uh, scheduled vaccination clinic at the Holy Spirit Home in Castledean in Queensland, where the vaccination provider, where the vaccination provider dispensed more than the prescribed dose of the Pfizer vaccine to two residents, Mr. President. Uh, my understanding is that they are both currently in hospital, um, but fortunately, Mr. President, uh, they are both. Uh, well at this stage. They're both okay, which is quite important uh, for us to all understand, Mr President. Both, both, families, and both, Order. both families have been advised of the incident, uh, and the uh, Chief, Deputy Chief Medical Officer, Professor Michael Kidd, has been commissioned to co conduct a thorough investigation of the circumstances of this event, Mr President. Uh, once the circumstances are understood, the VOC will work with the provider to implement the appropriate safeguards to prevent these events occurring again. Mr. President, uh, the, the doses were both administered by a GP working on behalf of Healthcare Australia, who obviously are the contracted uh, contractor for Order, providing Senator the service Colbeck. in Queensland. Senator Chisholm, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. On 16 February 2021, in a joint re press release with the Minister for Health, Minister Colbeck said that, and I quote, the Australian government would be responsible for leading the implementation of the COVID-19 vaccination program in the aged care sector. Does this minister accept responsibility on behalf of the Morrison government for this mistake? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and uh, Senator is correct in the fact that we have contracted as a federal government, two companies to undertake the vaccination rollout in aged care facilities across the country, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, uh, and this is a very important rollout process, as I have indicated on a number of occasions over the last two weeks. Uh, the fact that we have now commenced uh, the vaccination rollout in aged care facilities to protect senior Australians is one of the most important things that we will do as a part of order. the COVID-19 recovery Senator process. Wong on a, Senator Wong on a point of order. With direct relevance, the minister has been asked whether or not he accepts responsibility on behalf of the government for this mistake. I'd ask you to remind him of the question. Senator Wong, again, my view, and I will take advice from the clerk on this, is if the minister is, re, re, is keeping his comments to a narrow construction of the question, and the question referred to the Commonwealth responsibility or the Australian responsibility for the rollout in the aged care program. I can't go to content of his answer. He's not free to talk about anything else, but I think that is directly relevant. And I, as I said earlier, I'll take some advice from the clerk about this, um, but I believe, I, I believe I'm being asked to direct him on content. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. And the government is being quite open and upfront about this whole process. In fact, the health minister came out this morning and conducted a press conference with the chief medical officer to inform people of the circumstance. We have been working with the Queensland chief health officer in relation to it, and we're doing everything we possibly can to ensure the integrity of the rollout program, because we do take responsibility for it across the nation to ensure senior Australians Order, are protected Senator from COVID-19. Senator Chisholm, a final supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. Lincoln Hopper, CEO of St. Vincent's Care Services, has said that the mistake has, and I quote, caused us to question whether some of the clinicians given the job of administering the vaccine have received the appropriate training. Why has the government neglected to ensure proper training in the rollout of the vaccine? Order. Senator. Order. Sen order. We will get to this last answer when there is some modicum of order across the chamber. Senator Ayres, Senator, Senator Canavan, Senator Ayres, Senator, Senator McKenzie, Senator Rennick, Senator Colbeck to answer the question. Thank you, Mr. President. And this, is, this is an important question. I acknowledge that this is a very important question. Mr. President, the vaccines were administered by a trained general practitioner, a doctor. 
Mr. President. The doctor has been stood down pending an investigation by the Deputy Chief Medical Officer, as I've indicated before, uh, and a full investigation is being undertaken by the Deputy, Deputy Chief Medical Officer in conjunction with the Queensland uh, Chief Health Officer, the local PHN, uh, and we uh, appreciate the cooperation of the Queensland show, Dr Jeanette Young, as a part of this process. Our determination, Mr President, is to ensure that this rollout occurs effectively, appropriately and safely for all Australians, uh, particularly those in aged care. Uh, there is a training program that was in Order, place Senator for Colbeck. those who were rolling out Time this program. The answer has expired. The Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Uh, I further a table for the Senate in further information in relation to Senate order for production of documents number 786, uh, outlining the information provided to the, C the Senate Economic References Committee on 7 and 8 December 2020. Thank you. Senator Hanson. Um, Mr President, um, pursuant to Standing Order 745, I ask the Minister representing the Treasurer for an explanation as to why an answer has not been provided to question on notice number 2391. The question relates to 12 recommendations made in the Callaghan report into petroleum rent resource rent tax and implementation details. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Minister. Thanks, Deputy President. I thank Senator uh, Hanson. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, I'm not aware that I had prior advice. I apologise if my office did, uh, but I've not had uh, an opportunity, certainly, to uh, ascertain the status of that answer. Uh, I shall check that with the Treasurer's office and, uh, and revert it to the earliest opportunity. Senator Hanson. I move that there be laid on the table by no later than 4 p.m. the 15th of March 2021. The answer to the question on notice, number 2391. On the 13th of April 2017, Michael Callaghan handed the final report of the Petroleum Resource Rent Tax PRRT, review to the government. Like many others, I want to know how many of the recommendations have been implemented. Consequently, on the 7th of December 2020, I asked the Treasurer to provide details of the legislative implementation of the 12 recommendations made by Callaghan nearly four years ago. I have had no reply to my written question on Notice 2391. The government can be likened to a meandering river which seeks the easiest path as it makes its way to the sea. We see that in the management of Australia's offshore oil and gas resources. The vast reserves in um, of oil and gas under the seabed off the coast of Western Australia has been sold too cheaply to foreign-owned oil and gas companies, and now the Investor State Dispute Settlement or ISDS provisions in free trade agreements make it costly to write policy which is against the interest of Australians. The government is willing to protect the financial interests of private media companies in respect of foreign-owned goods like Google and Facebook, but introducing a media code but the government will not stand up for Australians so we get a fair payment for our oil and gas from Chevron, ExxonMobil, Shell, BP, Conoco, Phillips, Y. In 2019-20, these foreign-owned oil and gas multinationals controlled most of the offshore oil and gas leases. They exported $48 billion of liquefied natural gas to Japan, China, South Korea, and other Asian countries. As owners of the gas, we received a payment of about $200 million in 2019-20, or one twenty-fifth of one per cent of the $48 billion in sales. The other 99.996 per cent of the $48 billion went to the companies to cover costs and generate profits. None of that 99 0.996% was paid as income tax because these transnational companies have $350 billion of tax credits. Let me repeat that. $350 billion of tax credits, courtesy of the PRRT law introduced by Labor, Labor in 1987. One twenty-fifth of one per cent in every dollar of gas export sales represents the lowest gas payment in the world to owners. Why doesn't the government want to get a better deal for Australia? 
Australia is the only large producer of gas in the world where the domestic price is higher than the, um, where the export price of gas is higher than the domestic price. This is the finding of the ACCC. So what is the government doing? It is encouraging expensive to extract onshore gas as if it is an alternative to cheap to extract offshore gas and oil. How can we have globally competitive electricity and manufacturing in Australia when our competitors have cheaper gas than we do? The government's gas-led strategy is a fiction until the government reforms the gas laws. The government has had years to put Australia in a competitive position but has so far refused to do so. The next election is the government's to lose. But that will not stop me advocating for the best interests of Australians everywhere. The best interests of Australia are served by the government acting too. Introducing a domestic gas reserve policy in Australia with its offshore, in its offshore water um, to 15 per cent of all gas um, that comes into Australia, changing the PWRT law so we get fair payment for our oil and gas, removing multinational oil and gas companies from the company tax system and putting them in a transaction-based tax system, and investing in regassing terminals in the eastern states to bring offshore cheap gas from the west or build a gas pipeline from west to east. One Nation is the party of energy security in this country. I've raised this many times on the floor of this parliament about the gas that we are losing to overseas. And the government is, has been, not only this government, the previous government as well as Labor, have only spoken about um, sovereignty and worried about sovereignty. As I pointed out as well, you have leases of the uh, west coast of Australia. They are actually 30 years. There is nothing that I've taken to the government that use it or lose it, which they have never done. So they let them, these multinationals, sit on these leases, do nothing about it. They don't have to work it, and they are waiting till they use up all the supplies around the world. And we're the silly buggers here, letting them have their leases until they run out of their gas in other parts of the world. Then they will come and tap into ours, and we do not get it. Western Australia is the only one. If it comes into the state, then they will actually get 15 per cent of that domestic gas supply. But companies now are building large pipelines of over 900 kilometres to put that pipeline that comes into the Northern Territory so they don't have to give 15 per cent domestic gas supply to Australia. And yet we are charging Australians more for the gas in this country than what they are um, being uh, charged to export it out of here. And if you think that $48 million, if you think that receiving $200 million in tax is good enough on a $48 billion gas export in this country. Well, you shouldn't be in government. You shouldn't be working for the people of this nation because you've done rotten deals over the years and you've sold out the Australian people. And if you look at what Norway has done, they've made a lot of money out of their resources and the people in that country are quite rich. So we're living on the bones of our backside here because the governments are giving away our gas to other countries to take it and use it. And that's why we've lost industries and manufacturing in this country, because the whole fact is the cost of energy, and you're quite prepared to actually make it uh, uh, a cost and you sustain these with renewable energies, but you don't look after Australians to use our own gas at a cheap price so we can actually drive industry and manufacturing. And that's why a lot of them are closing up. We're losing jobs in Australia because you allow the cheap imports to come into Australia destroys our industries and manufacturing, so, and they can't afford the cost of running their businesses, and they can't afford the cost of energy. So until you get your act together and rein this in, and $350 billion in tax credits, $350 billion, that's why Chevron said we'll never pay tax in this country, until you look at it on a turnover basis. And when you former resources um, minister, Canavan, when I spoke to him about it, he allowed a platform to go into the into the uh, off Western Australia, and all they did was ha have to hook it to the to the to the bottom, and that's it. Take whatever you wanted. There's no there's no um, accountability whatsoever, and um, I am just absolutely disgusted with this government. So I'd like to have this report. I want to know what's happened with those 12 recommendations. That is uh, from four years ago from the Callaghan report, and the people of Australia have a right to know.
Thank you, Senator Hanson. Could you just clarify for the Senate, please, the date that you are requiring the OPD? 4 p.m. Um, the 15th of March. Thank you, Senator Thank Hanson. You. Senator Patrick. Yes, I rise to take uh, note of the answer as well. Uh, this is becoming a regular feature of, uh, of this part of the order of the day. Uh, and the problem uh, we're encountering is that uh, the government uh, is allergic to scrutiny. The government is not answering questions on time. The government is not returning OPDs in the fashion in which it should. And this is, uh, this is quite important. I said in my first speech that I thought that the Senate does the job of legislating pretty well. It, uh, uh, bills are brought into the chamber, uh, we, uh, into the Senate. We uh, deal with them through the committee stages. We uh, come in to the chamber at uh, uh, second reading and make our explanations as to what we think about the legislation. We then uh, debate them at committees, uh, and you know, we often amend legislation. We often make it better. Sometimes we even reject it. We saw this week the government. Uh, uh, or, uh, sorry, uh, Senator Stirl refer something off to committee halfway, uh, halfway through the committee stage because the Senate got to a point in its deliberations where there was the need to perhaps to, to examine the legislation further. We do that very, very well. What we don't do well, in my view, is the scrutiny role, which is the much more in, important role, and of course for which these questions on, on notice and these OPDs. Um, are necessary. I uh, read again the, the words quoted in Odgers of uh, US President Woodrow Wilson describing the informing role of the Com Congress, stating, it is the proper duty of a representative, representative body to look diligently into every affair of government and to talk much about what it sees. It is meant to be the eyes and the voice and to embody the wisdom and will of its constituents. Unless Congress have and use every means of acquainting itself with the acts and the disposition of the administrative agents of the government, the country must be helpless to learn how it is being served. And of course, John Stuart Mills also um, uh, has contributed to this area, uh, and it's been quoted in the, in the High Court case of Egan and Willis, summarised uh, our task as follows, to watch and control the government to throw light on the publicity of its acts. Applied to the Senate, these principles make it clear our role is not just to review and pass legislation. Indeed, as President Wilson said, the informing function of Congress should be preferred even to its legislative fun function. That's particularly important in this place. In the House of Representatives, in the other place, uh, the government has a majority. So the scrutiny function of the House is such that uh, uh, it's, 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 it's um, impotent because of the numbers. I've actually had members from the other place say to me, why isn't it that the House can do OPDs? And the answer to that uh, question is, well, of course it can. It enjoys the same powers as the Senate by way of section 49 of our constitution, going back through um, uh, the uh, history of, uh, of the House of Commons. Ernst, Ernst, um, Ernst and May uh, uh, is the, uh, equivalent, the House of Commons equivalent of Odgers, Erskine May. And, uh, uh, it's a great read, and, and senators should have a read of some of the things that happened there in order to get scrutiny in order to get scrutiny happening. Um, one of the things that uh, I said in my opening speech, and I'll, I'll read from it again, questions on notice tabled in this chamber are not, often not returned within the 30 days required by the standing orders. The same is true for estimates questions, where answers to questions are often returned to committees at the 11th hour. It's dis disrespectful of the Senate and of the citizens from, uh, to whom uh, the questions are asked for, and it shouldn't be permitted. I also said of orders for production. All too often, orders for, for production of documents have been met with contempt. An order for production is made. The government gets, advances an argument for public interest immunity, however tenuous that argument might be. 
Invariably, the Senate does not accept the public interest immunity claim, and the government insists on its re uh, refusal to provide the document. And then the Senate does nothing except weaken itself. So Senator Hanson has has risen and um, and rightfully asserted her right as a senator to seek an explanation as to why uh, the government is ignoring the scrutiny requests of the Senate. It's extremely important, extremely important, that there is respect from the executive in relation to the Senate, and in relation particularly to the Senate's oversight role. Again, this stems from section 49 of the Constitution. We saw yesterday uh, in, in, in a debate relating to a, another OPD that had not been returned that uh, the government was relying on conf confidentiality in a contract, as though, as though someone in the Department of Defence can, take a con can make a contract and sign it and say it's confidential, and that somehow overrides the laws of this country. And of course, that is a nonsense. It can't. I know yesterday when, um, when, um, uh, when Senator Birmingham st stood and made explanation or part explanation in relation to uh, documents that haven't been provided to the Economics Committee, and I do acknowledge further information has been tabled today, and I thank the minister for that, um, that uh, the documents were too commercially sensitive for the Economics Committee. What a load of rubbish. What a load of rubbish. I've seen some of these documents, and uh, again, the committee is not, no, is not asking for these documents to be made public, but they are not in any way sensitive. In fact, their markings are such they don't seek to protect themselves anything other than saying commercial and confidence. The, the uh, commercial and trade secrets of a uh, uh, of a defence company are very similar often, uh, uh, often to other jurisdictions in that they can cause commercial harm. Yet the, uh, the minister makes a claim that somehow these commercial documents are so sensitive that the, uh, that the chamber can't see them. And Senator Gallagher uh, uh, rose uh, and talked about his experience on the Public Works Committee, where they look at this sort of stuff all of the time. So, to the government, you have to get your act together. You have to start answering questions on time. Information has temporal value. Getting an answer a year late or getting a response to an OPD uh, a year late, or in fact, as we know, responses to, uh, to uh, Senate reports. I know the, the president makes a report every so often about how many responses to committee reports that are overdue. Maybe I'll have to start looking through the standing orders to look at what can be done in relation to that. The Senate goes off and does a whole lot of work in relation to committees. They consume uh, the time of senators. They consume the time of all of those uh, people who make an effort to contribute to those committees. They often travel long distances. Uh, we have the secretariat working really hard behind the scenes to make, uh, uh, to make a good report that goes to government, and then the government ignores it. So, you know, Senator Hanson standing, rising to her feet, seeking an explanation, quite valid, and the government really does have to pick up its act in this regard. I said yesterday, and I'll say it again today, it appears that uh, scrutiny to the Prime Minister is as kryptonite is to Superman. It makes him go weak at the knees. We can see that in, uh, in respect of uh, uh, the Auditor-General, the Auditor-General having his, having his uh, audits cut from, uh, uh, from uh, 48 audits down to 36. Not acceptable. Does not the government understand the bang for buck you get by having a, uh, an empowered auditor uh, watching over uh, departments of government, making sure that everyone in government thinks, you know what, there's a chance we might get audited, and therefore we will make sure we absolutely do the right thing. 
And yet there's arguments going on about whether it should be 36 or whether it should be 48 audits. But when the reality is it should be 75 to 80 audits. It should be expanded. We should have a, um, a much bigger remit for the, for the Auditor General in terms of oversight. Because you know, one of the things we're running into regularly is the, uh, a, a non-response, a non-response to questions, a non-response to OPDs, non-response to, to committee reports. It is not good enough. And uh, um, to the Leader of the Government in the Senate, if I have to stand up every day and point out the fact that you are not permitting uh, the, the um, or, or that you are not taking uh, the Senate uh, seriously in respect of its scrutiny role, then I will. And uh, you know, if you want to use up all your legislation time uh, having us debate things like this, then so be it. You just you need to understand the importance of it. Get your staff to start looking around as to what has not been responded to and what has, and stop advancing public interest immunities on OPDs when they should never have been advanced. And I, I say that with authority, having had a number of OPDs that have been requested and not responded to by government or responded to with a PII, for which I have then gone off and got under FOI time and time again. Time and time again this has, ha this has occurred, whether it be a future frigate tender which was uh, the subject of an OPD and not returned on the basis of confidentiality or national security. Under FOI, I got the lot of it. Whether it's uh, a macroeconomic report into future submarines, which was claimed to be cabinet in confidence, which I now have, and I now have it because I got it under FOI. The government has to start taking seriously the role of the Senate in terms of scrutiny. It's no longer going to be the case that, uh, that we just let things slip by. Are we going back to my office? I'll be looking for every question that's late, and uh, tomorrow I'll be seeking explanations. So you are, you are warned. I've done my, uh, my, my duty, as, uh, as is uh, uh, recommended by the clerk in respect of making sure that we behave in a re responsible manner. I'm giving you the warning. I will look to the list of questions on notice and we'll, uh, I will see which ones have not been answered. And I'll be here seeking explanations on all of them. And if it takes me uh, the rest of tomorrow, then so be it. And I'll have a look to some of the OPDs. And I'll certainly have a look and I'll be seeking advice uh, from the clerk in relation to all of those Senate committee reports that simply have not been responded to. That annoying, pesky Senate, keeping the, uh, you know, keeping the, the, uh, the executive occupied because of its scrutiny role. That's kind of how uh, the feeling is. Well, it's got to change. It's got to change, uh, Minister, otherwise we're going to have interruptions like this all of the time. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Minister. Thanks, um, thanks Deputy President. Uh, Deputy President, uh, as I indicated uh, when Senator Hanson posed her question, I had not had uh, forewarning in relation to the particular question uh, and so did not have information to hand at the time. Uh, in that relation, uh, could I invite Deputy President at least um, uh, consideration of, uh, of any past rulings in relation to um, the Convention of, uh, of Notification, its intersection with uh, then uh, within Standing Order 745, um, the definition of, uh, of what is an appropriate explanation uh, that triggers um, opportunities under 745C uh, versus 745B, um, uh, where, uh, where if no explanation is provided, a motion such as that moved by Senator Hanson uh, can be uh, can be undertaken. I believe that I did provide uh, an explanation, um, albeit that uh, due to the absence of uh, uh, forewarning, I was unable to give detail to that explanation um, at the time. Uh, uh, and um, it may be useful in future to have clarity in relation to that and whether there have been any previous rulings on those matters. Uh, nonetheless, um, I can table for the Senate 
um, answer to uh, Senate question uh, from the Treasurer, uh, PQ 20-00128, uh, in relation to uh, the 12 recommendations made in the Callaghan report into the petroleum resource rent tax. Um, uh, in tabling that, it would render uh, the motion uh, moved by Senator Hanson um, unnecessary. However, the government won't oppose it if it's simpler for the Senate to still proceed with the motion. Uh, thank you, Minister. I understand that um, the motion as moved by Senator Hanson is consistent with previous practice, although I note your comments about not being given um, notice of the impending uh, notice, which is a custom thing that we do. So that's on the hand side. Uh, if no one else is seeking oh, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Deputy President. As Minister Hunt has just advised the other place, we have some further advice. Oh, I beg your pardon, Senator Colbeck. I just need to deal with this matter and then I'm I'm happy to come to you. So the question is that uh, the motion as moved by Senator Hanson for the production of the OPD uh, by March 15, 4 p.m. be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Senator Colbert. Thank you, Deputy President. As I was say, saying, uh, on, uh, as the Minister for Health and Aged Care has just advised the other place, we have some further advice from the DCMO, uh, which uh, relates to my answer to the last question in question time regarding the status of the training of the doctor involved. Um, Mr. Pre um, Deputy President, we had statement from the VAC, the Vaccine Operations Centre, that Healthcare Australia had confirmed the training the doctor had undertaken the training, uh, and we had some other advice from the DCMO. HCA has advised that the doctor and all the health professionals involved in the immunisation rollout have had their APRA, Australian Health Practitioner Regula Regulation Agency, registration checked as part of employment, that all health professionals involved have completed the online training provided through the Australian College of Nursing and the company has advised that it has copies of the successful certificate of completion of the course for each health prof professional involved in the vaccine rollout. The revised advice that we've just received is that on further investigation, HCA has now advised that the doctor had not completed the required training. This is in being investigated by, H by HCA and we are expecting a report later today. HCA has advised that all other HCA immunisers have completed the training. HCA has also advised that this doctor has not been involved in the vaccination rollout in any other facilities, Mr. Pre um, uh, Deputy President. Um, we provide this information because we feel it's important to be upfront with the Australian people. Uh, and there is, in, uh, there is, in fact, an investigation being undertaken into this matter by the DCMO, Michael Kidd. Minister, <coughs> Senator Gallagher. Are you yeah, sorry, I just leave? Um, seek leave to take note of the minister's. Is leave um, granted? Leave is answer. granted. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Yes, uh, thank you. I don't know whether I should see to my leader, but uh, look, thank you, and um, I acknowledge the update from Minister Hunt and Minister Colbeck in this in this uh, chamber following question time. I would say it is extremely concerning uh, to have inaccurate information provided publicly in media conferences earlier today uh, and to both houses of this parliament about the early stages of a vaccine rollout to extremely vulnerable Australians in residential aged care. Uh, and it's clear that the government either has taken the word of providers without doing its own checks, which is worrying, uh, the minister alluded to APRA. Um, it sounds uh, whether there's a question about whether there was restrictions on this doctor. Um, we would welcome that information to come back to this chamber. Um, what sort of checks has the government done when they've outsourced this? I mean, this is the Commonwealth taking responsibility for an area that they don't usually operate in, running immunisation programs that the states and territories are well across how they do it. You've taken responsibility for aged care. You're putting in place a vaccination program. And on the first day, almost, we have two <coughs> residents of residential aged care in hospital because their vaccination was botched by a doctor that hasn't been trained. I don't think this sends a message of um, assurance uh, to 
residents of aged care or indeed the broader Australian community about the vaccine. We need confidence in this vaccine rollout. We need people to believe that it's done, that it's done safely by trained professionals who have had all the ticks in their boxes um, and that the government has checked all this. And it seems from what we're learning now is that that's not the case. You are taking the word of private providers who no doubt have got very large fat contracts from this government taxpayer to deliver this service and it should be delivered safely and residents of aged care should have confidence that this government has their back on it. Um, you know, it's really, you know, it's, it might be trying to be portrayed as misinformation from a provider, but it goes to the heart of the safety and quality of this vaccine rollout. Um, and I think any further information needs to be brought back to this chamber at the earliest opportunity. And the government needs to work out how it's going to ensure that there is confidence in this process, that the information you're being provided. The minister was out um, very reasonably early this morning with this information, so it sat out there all day that this doctor was trained and that there was nothing really to worry about. Um, these updates, you know, are extremely, dis you know, concerning. I think, and the government needs to put in place better checks, and I have no doubt there will be more questions from the opposition on this. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Sorry. So the question is that uh, the Senate take note of the motion as moved by Senator Gallagher. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We'll now move to the um, motions to take note of answers. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Keneally. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Birmingham and Cash to the questions asked by Senator Gallagher and me. Deputy President, I rise to take note of these answers more in sorrow than in anger. Though I have to say, this has been a harrowing week for members of parliament, for parliamentary staff, for ministerial staff, for female journalists, for women across Australia. The idea that in this day and age, in this building, an alleged rape can occur in the Minister for Defence's office, on the Minister for Defence's couch, this is meant to be a safe building. This is meant to be a safe workplace. Every workplace should be a safe workplace. But with the Parliament of Australia, we should set a higher standard. There are points in the last 10 days where I can't believe that I or any other member are saying the words we're saying. An alleged rape of a young woman a ministerial staffer by another ministerial staffer on the couch of the defence minister's office. And what compounds this situation, this horror, for Ms Higgins, the victim here of this alleged rape, what compounds it for her and what compounds it for every other woman who has had an experience like this or has supported a friend or relative in the aftermath of an experience like this, because let's be blunt, these kinds of experiences are all too common. And what is so traumatic for Ms. Higgins, as well as for every woman who has had to relive or be triggered by this story being told over and over, is that Ms. Higgins did not feel she was supported. Ms Higgins, by her own words, felt pressured to choose between seeking justice from the police or keeping her job. And when we turn to how this matter has been handled since Ms Higgins so bravely stood up and told her story to the nation because she could find no other way to get healing and justice, what has been so extraordinary is that the Minister for Defence, and while I wish her all the best in her medical, current medical situation, I wish her her recovery, but her actions for the last 10 days 
She has misled this chamber on multiple occasions. She has said things that are not true about Ms. Higgins. Ms. Higgins has been forced to come back and go on the record, to put forward her version of events. And when we look at the conduct of ministerial offices and ministerial staff, we now have evidence that three, possibly four members of the Prime Minister's staff knew about this some two years ago. We now have a Prime Minister who says his staff didn't know about it until last week. We have a Prime Minister himself who seems to be the one person in this building who had no idea about an alleged rape in his Minister for Defence office. Today we found out that the Minister for Home Affairs, Peter Dutton, knew. We know that Minister Cash knew. We know, though we don't know exactly when, Minister Reynolds knew. My heart goes out to Ms. Higgins. And let me be clear, our pursuit of this matter is not just on behalf of Brittany Higgins, but it's on behalf of every woman who comes to work in this parliament or in any other workplace in Australia and deserves to have the confidence that she can be safe in doing her job and be supported if something occurs, to get healing and to get justice. And so the questions we ask and will continue to ask will be to that aim. Thank you, Senator Keneally. Senator Henderson, thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. I also rise to take, make a contribution to this take note debate. And I agree with Senator Keneally that this has been a very harrowing week for us as members of parliament and senators and members for parliamentary staff and, frankly, for all Australians to learn about the allegations of an alleged sexual assault in Parliament House. This is a very serious matter and this is a very distressing matter. These allegations are very distressing. And my heart also goes out to Brittany Higgins. She has been remarkably courageous. She has been remarkably strong and as I've done a few days ago, I again want to place on record my relief in some respects that she has decided to make a formal complaint to police. Because I think everyone in this building, everyone listening to this debate, Every woman and man across this country expects that when these very serious alleged crimes occur, justice must be done. That's what we want to see, justice. And I hope and trust and expect, as we all do, that the police will fully investigate this allegation as well we hope, as the allegations made by other women in relation to this alleged perpetrator. As the Prime Minister has made clear, the welfare of Ms Higgins and other women who have come forward is paramount. Absolutely paramount. And I want to reflect on Senator Birmingham's contribution to the Senate on Monday morning when he said and reiterated that Minister Reynolds has expressed to the Senate how deeply sorry she is that despite her genuine efforts and intentions of support, a Ms Higgins did feel unsupported at the time of her alleged sexual assault. In telling her story, Ms Higgins has prompted a national conversation about how we ensure women are safe and I also add how we ensure men are safe in this workplace that we are all a part of. And this needs to be more than a conversation. It needs, we need to make sure that the appropriate action is taken. And I'm very pleased, of course, that the minister, Senator Birmingham, is leading an independent review, a cross-party review at arm's length 
to look at how we can prevent such incidents in the future, uh, to do a better job in how they are handled and how anyone in Ms Higgins' situation can be better supported. And we've got universal support for that aspiration. I, I, I do want to place on record my concern about the attack and some of the focus on Senator Reynolds. She's currently in hospital. She has spoken about her medical issues and she is, I hope, going to be very well very quickly. But I think there has been, by the Labor Party, an unwarranted focus on Senator Reynolds where there has been more focus on the gotcha moment than on justice. All of us want to see justice. We want the politics taken out of this. Now that there is a formal police investigation underway, uh, I say let's let the police do their job. To the extent that there are unanswered questions, please allow the police to do their job so that in no way can this investigation be compromised. The police will have the full scope to ask all relevant questions and to interview all relevant people in relation to these allegations. So I say again to Brittany and to other women and men who may have suffered this type of terrible alleged crime, uh, we can do better, we will do better and we want to see justice done. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Deputy President. And, um, I rise to also take note of questions asked uh, to Senator Birmingham today. And I would just, uh, following on from Senator Henderson's um, comments, make a couple of, of comments on those. Um, Senator Henderson accuses of us of, of focusing unreasonably on uh, Minister Reynolds, Senator Reynolds. Um, and I would uh, just say to Senator Henderson, who's left the room, that um, our job as an opposition is to hold the government to account. Um, there have been a serious allegation of a crime occurring in the Defence Minister's office. Um, there are a number of questions about her conduct as a minister, what she did, what she knew, how she followed up, who she told, what actions she took, uh, for which she is accountable to this chamber. Um, now, this is not anything personal about Senator Reynolds. And of course, we all wish her well, uh, and we're all um, sorry to hear that of, of her medical condition um, earlier today. But that does not mean that we do not ask questions, uh, reasonable questions, about the minister's conduct, uh, and expect to have those questions answered. And what we've seen this week and last week, uh, three, um, five question times, I think, that Minister Reynolds has faced questions, is. Every question as it relates to her conduct, what she did, what she knew, how she followed up, how she provided duty of care uh, to this staff member in her office, um, were not answered. Uh, we are not going into the ins and outs of what is alleged to have occurred and by whom, um, and anything that the police may be uh, seeking um, to investigate as part of their inquiries. We have not gone near any of that. We understand that that is an area for police investigation and we as senators are not here to perform that role. But we are here to hold the minister to account. She is the Defence Minister of Australia. She is a senior cabinet minister in this government. And these are legitimate questions about her conduct, her suitability, her capability. And that they are entirely reasonable questions to ask. Now we have been blocked and I don't know whether the uh, Minister Reynolds is operating under instructions from another office not to answer questions and to block and stall with the hope that this will go away and eventually the caravan will move on to another issue um, because that appears to be some of this strategy. The other strategy could be to provide conflicting information that makes it all very confusing about what's happened so nobody really answers and we keep going around in a bit of a circle. Um, you know, we have an expectation that this minister should have probably come into this chamber 
as early as last Tuesday morning and made a full statement about what she knew and what she did to this chamber. And that could have avoided uh, some of the questions or some of the blocking of, um, of answers that has been going on in question time. But no statement has been provided to this chamber, no statement from the Prime Minister. Can you think of another crime or allegations of a crime occurring in a senior minister's office being dealt with this way if it wasn't about an alleged rape between two Liberal staffers? I can't think of it, one, where that would be the case and where it was a no-go, no nobody can ask questions. Um, you know, everything should be pushed away until the police investigate and we move on to another story. Well, we're not going to because we think there are legitimate questions about this minister's conduct, about what she knew and what she did, and whether this allegations of this crime occurring were pushed aside in the context of a political campaign to be um, dealt with at a later time or quite possibly not dealt with at all. This has been going on for two years, and we do not have clear answers from this minister about her conduct and her role in what appears on the surface to be a cover-up of a very serious um, allegations of a crime occurring in this building under this government. They are legitimate questions to ask. We don't seek to attack Minister Reynolds personally, and we haven't. But we will hold this government to account. We will hold this minister to account. There are questions that remain unanswered. And if Ms. Minister Reynolds is unable to answer them, then Ms. Minister Birmingham should. And I think, as, as the big boss in town, that the Prime Minister should also front up and provide answers to these chambers. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Senator Macdonald. Thank you, Madam uh, Deputy Chair, uh, President. Today, I'm reflecting on how proud I felt joining the Senate 18 months ago, joining this august body, this body whose role it is, uh, quite rightly, to provide balance uh, in government, to be a house of review, and for the opposition's role in that process of holding the government to account. And yet today, in front of my colleagues, in front of the, the children here, I feel ashamed. I feel ashamed in my heart and my stomach at the politicisation politi of such matters with real humans at the heart of it, the lack of respect at the heart of it because there is, appropriately, a place for the opposition to ask questions. But this ongoing caravan, this circus performance, this confected outrage would go on and on. So many in this place, others who have had experience of such sexual attacks of rape who are both here and in the other place and right around Australia, have this matter compounded. I'm sorry, would you like to speak up or would you like to speak while I'm speaking? Um, Senator Davey, I remind you, Senator Macdonald, sorry, I remind you to direct your remarks to the chair and I will manage uh, the Senate if it becomes disorderly. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, because I did pay the respect of listening quietly whilst other people speak, and I would ask for that same respect. Because yes, and respect. You're entitled to that. Order. Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Thank you. Because respect is at the heart of this matter. So many in this place and the other. So many around Australia who have experienced matters such as this, who are reliving it, who are re-triggered by the continued and compounded actions of the opposition. People in this community who listen to what happens in this chamber have moved from watching the appropriate questions of the opposition, have moved from a creeping sense of horror 
at the politicisation and the continued abuse of not just this woman but of others and the absence of respect. It is not the role of the opposition to act like investigator and judge and jury. And it surprises me because the opposition has made quite a deal of calling for an increased number of women to come to politics and into this place. And yet it is our role to provide something different, something additional in coming into this place, and a sense of compassion, a sense of the human element is so incredibly important, and that has tragically been lost, as I said, in this ongoing uh, compounding of the abuse of not just this woman but any other person who has suffered uh, a sexual assault. And I do. I feel deeply ashamed to sit here and be a part of this performance. We all agree that every workplace should be a place of safety, that every person should have the confidence to come forward to report any such allegations and incidents. And yet I think we have done irreparable damage because every person who has suffered at the cans of such an attack must now be wondering, is this going to happen to me? Am I going to be paraded through the streets for some political benefit? Because this is now a matter for the appropriate people to investigate, for the police to investigate. There is a deep determination, I'm sure, from all who work in this place to ensure that we do change, we do improve, we do build a culture where there is uh, an independence of, uh, of a reporting process and the Prime Minister. Thank and you, Senator MacDonald. Thank you. Your time has expired. Senator McCarthy. Madam Deputy President, what we want to see here in the Senate and what all Australians need to feel is confidence, Madam Deputy President, confidence that we have leadership that is all of those things that provide stability, security, safety, hope for the future and, in particular, transparency and accountability when things go wrong. And things do go wrong. They do go wrong, Madam Deputy President. Whether it's in a personal scenario or a professional scenario, things do go wrong. But here in the Senate, when things go wrong, as uncomfortable as it may be, we all have a responsibility to ask the questions. We have a responsibility to focus on process. We have a responsibility to keep asking the questions that forever remain hidden from being answered. That is our job as senators here. That is our job as opposition senators. That is our job as crossbench senators to keep transparency and accountability to those in power. The people in power are our coalition colleagues, both here in the Senate and in the House. And like it or dislike it, the reality is that that power has to remain checked. Something terribly horrible went wrong right here in this parliament. After hours, when a young girl had no support, when only now has she taken the courage to speak up. So we keep asking the questions about the process. We keep asking the questions that need to be asked 
in order to hopefully come out on the other side with a better place of safety for all people who work, not only in this building, but for all Australians to see that there are intolerable acts against others that should never be accepted. Never be accepted. So sometimes it is hard to ask those questions, but they are never coming from a personal point of wanting to damage someone. They are coming from a sense of responsibility of our roles as senators to keep those in power accountable. Just as we ourselves are accountable to our constituents in the roles that we conduct ourselves in back in our own jurisdictions and here in this place. There is no doubting the sensitivities involved on every level here. But the obfuscation from the Prime Minister down in answering important questions both in the House and from ministers in here are legitimate concerns that we will continue to keep raising. We are unafraid and unashamed to keep asking these questions. You may wish to pose a picture that portrays us as heartless, but that is not the case because you know as much as we do that the discomfort you feel has to be made bare because all Australians expect answers and we've not seen answers in these past fortnight. We've not seen answers. And Labor will continue to pursue in the interest of justice and fairness and to eventually reach a position of suitability, safety for all Australians, whether they work in Parliament House, whether they work in businesses across the country, whether they live in their homes. If it is up to senators here on this side to ask the hard questions, let me reassure you we will continue to do so. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Keneally to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator McKim. Thank you, Deputy President. I move that the Senate take note of the response from Senator Cash to the question I asked in question time. The Nutter Salingham family, otherwise known as the Biloela family, has made a life here in Australia. This country is their home, and they are much loved members of the Biloela community. It is absolutely outrageous the way the government has treated this family and the way the government has wasted so much time and taxpayers' money persecuting this family and being cruel to an innocent family. It was around three years ago that this family was ripped from their home and their community in Biloela without warning, under the cover of darkness, in a pre-dawn raid. And to describe uh, that episode as extremely traumatic, especially for the two young children, would be a gross understatement. I've seen the video of that terrible event and what that family was put through that night, particularly the two young children, was disgusting and abhorrent. Now, they've all been in immigration detention now for nearly three years and on Christmas Island for about two and a half years. Over this time, the government has deprived them arbitrarily of their liberty, has spent over $6 million of public funds on their detention and on legal fees, fighting to deport them to Sri Lanka, where they have justified fear for their lives. And the government's fought this through the Federal Circuit Court, the Federal High Court, and the High Court. And I want to make the point that the minister could, with just a simple stroke of his pen, immediately release this family from detention and allow them to get on with their lives 
in the Biloela community, where they contributed to that community and where they have been embraced so warmly. And I want to shout out to the Biloela community here, who from day one has stood up for this family and fought for this family to be returned to where they belong in Biloela. But it's not just the Biloela community that's fought for their release. Australians more broadly have been rightly horrified at their treatment by the government, with nearly a quarter of a million people signing a petition calling for their release. And when I asked Minister Cash why, the, why she is ignoring the hundreds of thousands of Australians who have called for the innocent family's release, she responded she didn't accept the premise of the question. Well, Minister, check out the petition. Check out the petition. Nearly a quarter of a million Australians have signed it. Trying to deport a family, including their two Australian-born children, in the dead of night is sadly typical of this government's heartlessness and indicative of Australia's cruel and inhumane immigration and immigration detention regimes. And I've been to Manus Island five times and I see Senator Dunningham shaking his head. I know the cruelty. I've seen it firsthand. And if anyone wants to deny the cruelty, I challenge them now. Get over to Papua New Guinea, get over to Nauru and look at these Order, poor Senator people. Dunningham. Look them in the eyes, Senator Dunningham, and you go and do that and look them in the eyes and then you can come back in here and try and convince us that you understand the, the damage that you have caused to them, the deaths that you people are personally responsible for, <coughs> the hundreds of lives that you people have destroyed through your cruel and unnecessary policy of indefinite immigration detention, including your cruel policy of indefinite offshore detention. You have ruined lives. You have broken Australia's international obligation. You are responsible for people's deaths. You have collectively, and I say this to the LNP and the ALP, got blood on your hands. People should not be in immigration detention in this country for any more than seven days without a court order. <clears throat> now, I thank Senator Cash for seeking further advice on the riot that occurred on Christmas Island in January, and I look forward to her coming back into this chamber and sharing further advice with order. her colleagues. Senator McKim, the question is the motion moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator Fioravanti Wells. Thank you, Mr. President. On behalf of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, I give notice of my intention at the giving of notices on the next day of sitting to withdraw notices of motion proposing the disallowance of seven leg legislative instruments as set out in the list circulated in the chamber. Thank you, Senator Fioravanti Wells. Are there any other notices of motion? There being none, I shall proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? There being none, I will call the clerk. I think Senator Smith. Oh, sorry, Senator Smith. I the leave of absence, if I may. Please, by leave, you can do it Great. now. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for Senator Reynolds. Um, is leave granted? It is granted, Senator Smith. Thank you. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator Reynolds for 24th and 25th February 2021 for medical reasons. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. I'll call the clerk. Postponement notification has been received in relation to general business notice of motion 1029, standing in the name of Senator Roberts, to the 25th of February. Thank you. I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business, if there's no other matters, and I'll commence with government business motion matter number one. Senator Dunningham. Uh, thanks, um, Mr President. I ask that govern, uh, government business notice of motion number one, proposing the approval of the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profit Commission Amendment 2021, measures number one, regulations 2021, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Dunningham. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Number two, Senator Dunningham. Thanks, Mr. <coughs> President. I ask that government business notice of motion number two relating to the cessation of the Senate order concerning extensions of time for committees to report be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? 
There being none, Senator Dunningham. I move the motion. Question is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Uh, number three, Senator Dunningham. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. I ask that government business notice of motion number three be taken as formal. I move that the following bill be introduced a bill for an act to amend the Work Health and Safety Act 2011 and for related purposes. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Dunningham. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. Bill for an act to amend the Work Health and Safety Act 2011 and for related purposes. Senator Dunningham. I table the explanatory memorandum relating to the bill and move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. In accordance with Standing Order 111, further consideration of this bill is now adjourned to 11 May 2021. I shall now proceed to general business and commence with Senator Kitching, number 1028. Thank you, Mr President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1028 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being Sorry. none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator, can I jump to Senator 1031 in the name of Senator Davey and others? Senator, Senator Smith. Thank you very much, Mr President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1031 relating to manufacturing in regional Australia be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There is. Um, are you in a position to deal with 1032, Senator Smith? But I think there was a circulated amendment to that oh, as my well. Sir, apologies, yes, I do. Um, thank you, Mr President. Uh, before asking that the motion be taken as formal, I indicate that Senator Keneally will also be co-sponsoring this motion with Senator Canavan. I also seek leave to amend the motion. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Smith. I amend the motion as circulated in the chamber and ask that the amended motion be taken as formal. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? Yes. There is. I'll now come to I'll go to 1030. Senator Rice, in your name. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that General Business Notice of Motion number 1030 regarding ending native forest logging be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Rice. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. We make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. Native forestry is here to stay, and our government backs it. It's an inconvenient truth for the Greens, but so too did the federal court, which found the Tasmanian Regional Order. Forestry Agreement to be valid and supports our view that they are the best way to manage our native forest industry. It's important to note uh, the Greens' hypocrisy when it comes to Senator Rice herself that said in this place we should celebrate the plantation based industry and the Greens party platform is to move to 100 per cent plantation source timber. While the way this motion is worded is clumsy in asking for a plan to transition workers out of plantation timber industry, the Greens can't have it both ways. The question is that motion number 1030 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells.
lock the doors. The question is that motion number 1030 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Seawitt teller for the ayes, Senator Urquhart teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 10, noes 32. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senators, we have another couple of matters to deal with. Um, could we go, Senator C? To, oh, sorry, Senator Rice. Clarify the intent of the motion that it should have said leave, into leave, the. Leave is not granted, Senator Rice. Into um, the sen Senator Rice, please resume your seat. Senator Seawitt, could I come to your matter number 1033? Senator Seward. Mr President, I ask that general business notice of motion number 1033 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Seward. I move the motion. Senator Dunham. Just a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thanks, Mr President. The government's $9 billion commitment is the largest increase to payments since 1986 and will provide additional support to job seekers, young people, students and, uh, and uh, parenting payment recipients. The government is ensuring that our social safety net remains targeted and sustainable, while at the same time investing in a number of initiatives that are key to our economic recovery plan to get Australians back into work as we emerge from the coronavirus pandemic. The question is that motion number 1033 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is that motion number 1033 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart, tell the ayes. Senator Smith, tell the noes. The result of the division is ayes 31, noes 30. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. I ask senators to remain in the chamber. We have at least one division. Could we move to matter number 1034 in the name of Senator Gallagher? Senator Gallagher. of motion number 1034 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being Here's taken as formal? There being none, aye. Senator Gallagher. Thank you. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is that motion number 1034 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart, tell the ayes. Senator Dean Smith, tell the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 33, noes 29. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senator Dunningham. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, I seek leave to move general business notices of motion numbers 1031 and 1032 together and for the motions to be determined without amendment or debate. Is leave granted? No. Senator Dunningham. Uh, I move that so much of standing orders be suspended as would prevent general business notices of motion numbers 1031 and 1032 being moved together immediately and determined without amendment or debate. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is the motion moved by Senator Dunningham to suspend standing orders be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Smith, teller for the ayes, and Senator Patrick, teller for the noes. Um, could I ask senators who can't take a seat to try and stand back near the television screen, Senators McKenzie and Cash? Senator McKenzie and Cash, could you, um, to help the whip, could you stand back near the TV screen or so he could see? Sorry. The result of the division is ayes 60, noes 2. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senator Dunningham. Uh, do people wish me to put them separately or is together okay? Yes, Senator Faruqi.
Mr. President, I seek leave to table a short statement on motion 1031. Leave is granted. And Mr. President, I request that motion 1031, the two parts, be put separately. A and, a B. and B. Yep. Senator Roberts. I seek leave also to table a, a brief statement on motion 1031. Thank you. Leave is granted. I will put then 1031A, clause A. Those in support of that say aye. I'll just get you to sign it. Contrary, no. Ayes have it. I will put B, 1031 clause B. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is that clause B of motion number 1031 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Smith teller for the ayes and Senator Seawitt teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 50, noes 9. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that motion number 1032 in the name of Senator Canavan and many others be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The last matter, my apologies, Senator Antich. I misread my, my sheet. I will now come to you. Senator Antich. I uh, withdraw general business notice of motion 1025 standing in my name for today relating to the establishment of a select committee. Thank you, Senator Antich. That concludes, as far as I'm aware, the discovery of formal business. Thank you, Senators. I'll let people uh, gather their, get to their seats so that we can move on to the MPI.
I inform senators that at 8.30 a.m. today, 27 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate the following letter was received from Senator Stirl. Pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. Instead of a plan for secure Australian job, secure jobs for Australians, the Morrison government is trying to make it easier for employers to cut workers' pay and conditions. Is the proposal supported? It is. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate, and with the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. I call Senator Polly. Thank you very much, Mr. President. The, the motion that we'll be debating is instead of a plan for secure jobs for Australians, the Morrison government is trying to make it easier for employers to cut workers' pay and conditions. And we know, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, that that's the, that's the uh, agenda of this government. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, when they were ready to uh, acknowledge the hard work of frontline workers, uh, people that were working in retail, people working in hospitals, working for health and in aged care, they were quick to, to make sure that they had the photo opportunities to be with those workers. <laughs> and of course, we should acknowledge each and all of those sectors that were involved, whether it was transport, whether it was retail, whether it was health, was it, uh, whether it was emergency services, aged care workers, they actually did keep Australia uh, safe and they kept the economy um, moving. But this government, with its, uh, its agenda, is quite clearly not supporting those same very workers. If you look at the attack on uh, Australian workers and uh, the um, unsecure hours uh, that people in retail, people who work in aged care, they find it extremely difficult if they don't have secure ongoing work to enable them to take out a mortgage, to pay their rent and to be able to uh, meet the essential uh, requirements of looking after themselves and their family. What we've seen in this country before the pandemic, and it's still a huge issue now, is the cut to Australian workers' pays and the agenda to uh, erode the conditions of people's employment. Now, there is a huge issue with casualisation of the Australian workforce and the uncertainty, with 13 million Australians being directly impacted. And we will uh, ensure that this latest industrial relations reform bill is opposed. We, along with the union movement, will do what we need to do to make sure the Australian people are informed about this attack on their pay and their conditions. We know that there's been a huge issue with the stagnation of Australian workers' pay that they get to take home. We know, in line with their DNA of making sure that employees have advantage over the employees, we know that they would prefer that there was no union membership and that they could reduce access to worksite by unions. That that is not going to be accepted by the Australian people. If you take somebody who's working in aged care and they have split shifts, as we saw during this pandemic with uh, the spread of COVID-19, so many people who work in aged care, and let's be realistic, whether we're talking about retail or we're talking about aged care, they're predominantly women, that they have to have a second job. Sometimes they even have a third job to make ends meet. We know that this uh, government is not supportive of increasing superannuation. We know that there's a huge disparity between what men retire with um, in superannuation and what women do. So the attack now on to cut wages and to ensure that there's continued casualisation of the workforce, it is predominantly going to impact on families and women. because. They are the ones that work in uh, the lower paid positions, and that's why 
I will continue to say every single opportunity that I can, and I know my colleagues would, that you need to be a member of your union. You need to have a voice because so many times you find that women don't have that same support. They may not have the confidence that others have had in being able to take their issues to their employer. When they don't get the extra shifts or they're penalised because they weren't available because perhaps they had to take uh, their children to the doctor or um, have other family commitments that they couldn't take up that offer of um, employment. But to not have an ongoing secure job where you know that you're going to get those 30 hours a week so you can budget your family budget around that time and to then the next week have it cut down to eight hours Senator is just Polly, not good enough. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, I find it pretty galling today uh, that the Australian Labor Party think that they can come into this chamber and lecture this government, the Morrison coalition government, on jobs. Um, because let's turn our minds back, Mr Acting Deputy President, to a very dark time in my own state's history, and that was the time when we had a Labor government in Tasmania. Indeed, we had a Labor Green minority government for four years in Tasmania. When I first came to this place, Mr Acting Deputy President, I spoke in my maiden speech about those dark, dark days under the Labor Green minority government. when. Jobs were being cut left, right and centre. People were leaving our state left, right and centre because they weren't able to work locally. This was a period of complete economic disaster and fiscal mismanagement in Tasmania. Thousands of jobs were lost, Senator McKim, over that four-year period, and Tasmania had the highest unemployment rate in the country. There were cuts to nurses. There were cuts to the police force. There were cuts to teachers, Senator McKim, and other essential Senator public Chandler, service please positions. Senator Chandler, resume your seat. Interjections are disorderly, and I do remind senators to address their comments to the chair, not across the chamber at other senators. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. As I was saying, Back in those dark days of Labor Green government in Tasmania, poor economic management saw business confidence slump, further weakening employment rates. Investment was at an all-time low. The job situation under Labor and the Greens in Tasmania became so bad that people were leaving our state in droves to seek employment on the mainland. They knew there was no hope to look locally for employment, so they packed their bags, booked a one-way ticket on the spirit of Tasmania and left. We lost so many skilled Tasmanians and so many young people during this period. And that is what I spoke about in my maiden speech, Mr Acting Deputy President, as being one of my drivers in seeking election to this place, to see that another generation of Tasmanians would not have to leave our island for job opportunities, that they would be able to have those opportunities locally and enjoy everything that is just so good about Tasmania's way of life. And it baffles me that Labor comes into this place and tries to lecture us about jobs and lecture us about our record creating jobs in Australia and in Tasmania when they don't have a foot to stand on. Mr Acting Deputy President, this government has a keen focus on creating jobs for Australians. We don't just talk the talk, we walk the walk, because since the coalition was elected in gov to government in 2013, up until the global pandemic that we've seen over the last 12 months, in excess of 1.5 million jobs have been created, had been created around the country. And this speaks volumes to the initiatives and conditions that we as a government put in place to stimulate economic growth, create jobs and make Australia more prosperous. And during the pandemic, the Morrison Coalition government stepped in to provide unprecedented 
levels of support for businesses and the people they employ from the dire economic consequences of the pandemic. We understood the immense challenge facing the country and we acted to mitigate the effects on jobs, businesses and the people of Australia. Mr Acting Deputy President, I've said many times uh, in the last 12 months, and I will say it again today, when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, I was incredibly worried, particularly for my own state of Tasmania, that we would go back to those dark days where more people were leaving our island than were coming to it. And I worried about the economic challenges that we would be facing. And I worried about how we would deal with them and what Australia would look like coming out the other end of it. But because of the policies of this government, we are coming out the other end of it, Mr Acting Deputy President. And, and Australia, I think economically, is on the right track for recovery. And what were those policies? An additional $1.2 billion was allocated in the budget to create 100,000 new apprenticeships and traineeships. The job maker hiring credit is encouraging businesses to hire younger Australians, recognising that young job seekers often suffer the longest term impacts of economic downturn. And investment in road and other public infrastructure projects are creating more jobs around the country and providing better public amenities for Australians. But our quest to continue to create more jobs for Australians doesn't stop there with those fantastic policies, because we as a government recognised when the COVID-19 pandemic hit that the way the Australian workforce operates, the way that employees engage with their employers was going to be different on the other side of this economic downturn and that there would need to be greater flexibility so that we were able to rebuild our workforce following the COVID-19 pandemic. And that's what our IR reform package um, will facilitate, Mr Acting Deputy President. These, these reforms address known problems with our industrial relations system and the Fair Work Act, and they will not only support wages growth and help regrow the jobs lost to the pandemic, but tackle broader issues like underemployment, job security, underpayment of wages and the failure of Labor's enterprise bargaining system to drive wage and productivity growth. This package of reforms will give businesses the confidence to get back to growing and creating jobs, as well as the tools to help employers and employees to work together in a post-COVID-19 Australia. As I said, Mr Acting Deputy President, we recognised early on that this would be an issue as we came out of the economic downturn, and that's why we have acted with these reforms to ensure that businesses and their workers are able to engage and negotiate as our workforce gets back to work following the economic downturn. These vital reforms to employment law build on the various economic supports provided by the government during the pandemic, some of which I listed earlier in my contribution, and they are driven by one simple goal, breaking down barriers to job growth so we can get Australians back to work. The reforms were developed after extensive consultation with uh, employer and employee groups who sat down with the government for many, many hours to find innovative solutions to support struggling businesses as well as protect and enhance the rights of workers. This, these reforms, Mr Acting Deputy President, are important for all Australians as they aspire to grow their careers and seek out the opportunities that will allow them to contribute um, economically, whether it's buying their first home, supporting their family, planning for their retirement. We are committed to creating jobs and strengthening the economy so that more Australians can do this. And this has been a strength of successive federal coalition and state Liberal governments because we understand the importance of having a job the sense of accomplishment that comes with that, the dignity that comes with that, 
and the ability to provide for yourself and your family. And this is why jobs has been a key focus of this government, especially during and following the high point of the pandemic. As I said earlier, Mr Acting Deputy President, I know only too well what can happen to jobs when they are left to the devices of Labor and the Greens. What happened in Tasmania under the previous Labor Green government was devastating for our state, as I said, to the point where Tasmanians were leaving in droves. So many, so many Tasmanians I know, my friends, my family, all left our island state for work opportunities on the mainland because they couldn't find those opportunities at home. Some have since returned to the island and many have not, and I think that that is a real loss for our state, which needs skilled young Tasmanians to drive our state forward. But that is not going to happen at the hands of Labor and the Greens. Senator McKim. Is it? Fantastic, is it? Senator McKim. Well, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. What an absolute load of tripe we were just subjected to by Senator Chandler. Absolute tripe. I'll make one point. Make one point. You know the most important measure of the Labor Green government in Tasmania? Carbon emissions. Carbon emissions in Tasmania sank so that during that period Tasmania became a net sequestrer of carbon emissions, helping the world address the greatest public policy challenge of our time. Now, I thank uh, the Labor Party for uh, bringing um, this matter of public port importance on. And I want to start by saying this. It is no surprise that this government is trying to introduce legislation that would make work less secure and make it easier for workers uh, for employers to cut pay and cut conditions, because that is exactly the outcome that the neoliberal ideologues on that side of the chamber seek to achieve. That neoliberal ideology celebrates the power of the market and the freedom of people to act in those markets without restriction. But what this ideology really boils down to for most Australians is you're on your own. You're on your own. If you can't negotiate secure work for yourself or better pay and conditions, well, that's just how the market values you. They would have it. And people, they would have it, will just have to live with it. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog system, a system where you either sink or you swim. And if you're sinking, you'll get no help whatsoever from government. It is pure, debased, Darwinian economics. That's why, after 30 or 40 years of privatisation, of deregulation and adherence to trickle-down economics, workers today are, listen to this, no, listen to this, workers today are taking home the lowest share of domestic income on record in Australia, and why, on the other side of the coin, the greatest share of domestic income on record is going where? It's going to corporate profits. Now, if you want to argue with those facts, be my guest, but those are the facts. And those facts are celebrated by the LNP, particularly those with a pedigree in one of the various free market so-called think tanks that promulgate this nonsense on behalf of their corporate backers like Gina Reinhart. And that's also what the neoliberal ideology boils, boils down to. The brute power of the big corporates to corrupt our democratic institutions with a clear modus operandi to corrode whatever work per workplace protections and whatever social safety nets have been put in place and hard won over the centuries by working people in this country. Neoliberalism is about the corrosion of democracy itself so the wealthy can get even wealthier. And if you think that's an overstatement, have a listen to the 32nd President of the United States, Franklin D. Roosevelt, in an address to Congress in 1938, outlining what he described as two simple truths about the concentra concentration of economic power. Firstly, he said, democracy is not safe if the people tolerated the growth of private power to a point where it becomes stronger than the democratic state itself. That is in its essence is fascism. Well, hear, hear, uh, uh, late President uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt, that is 
in fact, in its essence, fascism. The second point he made in that address to Congress is this. He said democracy is not safe if its business system does not provide employment and produce and distribute goods in such a way as to sustain an acceptable standard of living." End quote. In other words, the safety of our democracy depends on curbing corporate power and influence and ensuring the equitable distribution of wealth, including through fair wages and fair working conditions. And those things, fair wages and fair working conditions and full employment, they are everything that neoliberalism stands against. And that is why, be it through tax cuts or winding back responsible lending laws or attacking workers' rights, what this government stands for is more power for its mates and more money for its mates. Colleagues, the social contract is starting to fracture underneath us and we collectively will pay a very, very heavy price as more and more people start to realise that uh, neoliberalism and trickle-down economics is letting them down, and it's cooking the planet Senator at the same time. Your time has elapsed. Senator Steele. Thank you, Madam. Uh, madam. <laughs> it has been late. It's a late, it's been late nights. Mr. Acting Deputy President, thank you very much. I am so excited to get up here and make my contribution to this debate. Um, and I just want to say, listening to Senator Chandler, I've got to tell you, it's, it's quite comical, really. You know, when you get 20 odd year olds coming into this building, they haven't had any life experience, but they want to talk about how much they love workers and all about jobs. And I just say, I came in here when I was the young age of 44, 45, and I can talk from life experience. So you talk about this farce that that mob over there have got about creating opportunities. What a magnificent job they're doing for working people, young people. Well, I've got to tell you, Mr. Acting Deputy President, I've had the privilege the last oh, few months running around the nation talking to more and more truck drivers as the weeks go by. And I'm going to start telling you some home truths. You want to know how good things are out there? It's about time this mob over there actually took their fingers out of their ears and started listening to what goes on in Australia. Now, I wrote off to the Fair Work Commissioner, I know the Fair Work Ombudsman, and I said, since your, in, uh, your inception since 2009, how many uh, cases have you run against uh, employers for underpayment of wages or sham contracting? And I have to give it to Ms Parker, she wrote back to me, and, and, and I, I admire the uh, Fair, Fair Work Ombudsman, I just think they're grossly under-resourced. Under and I think that they are grossly hands behind their back. They haven't got the uh, opportunity. You know, the rules are bent towards this bob over there and their, their, their donors. But I, she said to me, there's 20, 20 cases going or been against uh, underpayment of wages for truck drivers. Well, I'll tell you what now. You and I can sit down there. We can have a cart. We can have a, 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 a nice stubby of Carlton Dry. And I reckon I could come up with about 50 companies on that one stubby. And you, Mr Acting Deputy President, with your experience, you'd probably have another 50 companies just from South Australia alone. Because I've got to tell you, this nation it is corrupt and wrought the underpayment of wages in the trucking industry alone. This mob over there, they rub their hands together because some high-profile chef's been touched up because he's done something wrong or Bunnings has done something wrong or even they, they, they even said Morris Blackburn and there you go for him. What about the hard working men and women in the transport industry? And I've got to tell you some of the shams and some of the scams that are going through Mr Acting Deputy President, it will be no surprise to you. One of the greatest scams in this nation is called kilometre rates. Now, this goes back to your time in your previous life, Mr Acting Deputy President, when you were negotiating these enterprise bargaining agreements and rates before we got to the EBA system and the fights that we had with the, uh, with the uh, industry bodies about what is the average speed and all this sort of stuff. But I've got to tell you, so if you go to an employer, and there are some very good employers out there that pay a kilometre rate and it's negotiated and it's above the award kilometre rate, and then they'll do the right thing and they'll pay hourly while the guys and girls are loading and unloading or whatever they're doing, fine, no worries. The majority of employers in the road transport industry, predominantly in the interstate line haul sector, are absolutely ripping off their drivers because they come up with this nonsense. And I'll talk the eastern seaboard because this mob over there probably haven't been past Jerobomba or where it is, but that's how close they've got to the west before the real truck it starts. And I've got to tell you now, between Melbourne and Sydney, they say, oh, that's 880 k or whatever it is. And they'll pay them 880 kilometres. Not taking into account that they've probably spent five hours, six hours running around Melbourne doing the loading or Sydney doing the loading. They don't take into account someone's got to actually wash the bucket of nuts and bolts. Someone's got to put the fuel in. Oh, they don't pay for that. That's all part of the kilometre, right? They, they, you just do that for love. Change a tyre halfway along between Melbourne and Sydney or Sydney and Brisbane or Adelaide and 
wherever it might be. Oh, you don't get paid for changing the tyres. That's all part of your kilometre rate. So don't expect to get paid for all the add-ons. This goes on day in, day out in this nation. And I will challenge anyone, anyone to tell me that I'm wrong, because I know I'm not wrong. I know because the drivers tell me this. So this side over here sprouting how wonderful they are and, oh, we love jobs, we love workers. You wouldn't know work if you fell over them, half of you. You wouldn't have a clue what a worker goes through. You're all privileged. So don't sit here on $200 odd thousand dollars a year and tell us how wonderful it is out there. And I'll tell you another thing. You're asleep at the wheel. Senator Bragg from New South Wales, you want a debate, mate, I'll give you a debate. I'll debate you day in, Order. day out. Don't you dare step into my space if you're not formed, mate. If you're not informed, because this is my area, I know it damn well. Mr. Acting Deputy President, I apologise. It happens when you get spivs that interrupt on something they know nothing about. I'll tell you another scam. I'll now tell you another one. And you've only got to go to seek.com, because I've got it. One of the worst offenders in Queensland, QLS Logistics, absolutely advertising on seek. We want to come and drive our trucks, be prepared to work six days a week. You know, you can work 10, 12, 14 hours a day, no worries, as long as you've got an ABN. An ABN, sham contracting. So we'll pay you as a subcontractor, all right? You know why? Because we're not going to pay you. <laughs> Penalty rates, superannuation. We're not going to pay your holiday pay. We're not going to pay your sick leave. We're not going to give you rostered days off. This is what's going on. I report it to Fair Work Australia. And I'll give it to a fair, the Fair Work Ombudsman. I'll give it to the Ombudsman. They come back to me. Like I said, they're under resource. I've got examples here of some of the shams here, and, and I'll just share some of them with you on underpayments. Why, if anyone wants to interrupt and uh, uh, challenge me, feel free. This is from the Fair Work Ombudsman. Underpayments in the transport uh, area. Just one company, $132,000. Another one. This is a baby one, $35,000. Uh, another one, $60,000, $200. Another one. Oh, 251,000. These are just employers. Single employers. 250. How do you. Oh, I nearly said the fun word. How do you actually rip off your truck drivers to $251,000? Uh, don't go away. $43,000. Oh, here's another one. $286,000 under payments. These are fair work on Budsman. Not Stills making it up. This is what's going on out there, ladies and gentlemen. And I've got to tell you another thing. Everyone thinks it's all rainbows and unicorns out there in the trucking industry. It is far from rainbows and unicorns. And guess what? Wouldn't you mob go into a spin if your cucumbers weren't on the shelves at Coles next to the bread for your watercress and cucumber sandwiches? Wouldn't you spin out then? Wouldn't you spin out if your latte or your chai or whatever you drink's not in the store at Coles or Woolies because the poor truckies haven't got it there? Praise is another it. I'll send the brag, put it in writing. I'd love to hear from you even more. I'd love to hear from you. In fact, I challenge you, mate. I'll tell you, I've already thrown the challenge at you. <coughs> Prove me I'm wrong. And we'll take it outside. We'll Order. take 38 steps to the right here where Order. no one's protected by parliamentary privilege. <laughs> I know, mate, because I'm the one doing it, because I'm the one talking to truckies. And I'll give you another one while you all think it's roses, rainbows and unicorns out there. Toll fast. Now, toll. Mr Acting Deputy President. How many companies were they before they all become told? You and I used to be organisers, and you rose to the dizzy heights of state secretary, and I ended up getting the side shift over to be a senator. Just joking. How many times have we seen arguments? The big companies. These are the ones that win it. Tolls. Now I'm told reliably by my good mate Richie Olson, there is a massive blue going around Australia. Toll fast have about 500 owned drivers. Couriers got their own vehicles, one ton, two ton, little things like that, running around. One of their biggest clients is. Um, What's the name of it? Office, office Works. Now, when the toll group had that uh, problem with the, you know, with the uh, internet, they got raided and all that sort of stuff. There are drivers, 500 owner drivers around the nation, who have been not paid six months, six months late, haven't got their their pay. Now, I know for a fact around Australia, the union is blue in this with toll. The biggest, the second or the biggest transport company, one of the two biggest transport companies in Australia. How the heck can they look anyone in the eye knowing that they have not paid their, their people for six months? How does anyone do that? You wouldn't get away with that in the, old, in, the, in the Wild West. And this is what's going on. They're fighting a major transport company of government contracts, all sorts of stuff, for their underpayments, wrong classifications. So if the big boys can do it, and normally I don't have a problem with the big boys because we have the opportunity to get it sorted out. But if the big boys are doing it, how the hell do the little ones not think that they can get away with it. And what irks me even more, 
and as I talk to transport operators and I talk to the good trucking companies all through Australia, and there's many good trucking companies, they're being screwed the living daylights out of the top of the supply chain. This is where the pain all comes down. <laughs> these corporate captains and these magnificent corporate citizens, and I'm not just going to Coles and Woolies, and I'm telling you what, I'm throwing the mining companies in there too, they're all as bad as each other, the Blue Scope Steels, the whole lot of them, the whole damn lot of them, because they exonerate themselves from any employer and any employee relationship, they just contract it out, and I'll tell you what, are you worried about Uber? Wait till that gets into the trucking industry, and Amazon, when they've said they are prepared to lose money for 10 years to disrupt what's going on here in Australia. So while you're out there and you've got your talking notes and you've got your prepared speeches, and you know, I don't have a prepared speech, and you've got what the minister's told you to say, get up there and talk about these wonderful things that you're doing, cast your mind back. Walk outside to what I've said. Ask people in the street, how's it going for them? Now, I'm the first one to put my hand up and say we need to support young people getting into industry and all that. You don't even put money into training into the transport industry. This is one industry where we have kids. We cannot attract kids. And when you hear of all the horror stories and when you hear that they get treated like they get treated, there's no toilets and poor facilities, no wonder no one wants to go into it. Senator Can I have an extension of time, Mr Acting Deputy President? I've got another half hour. Senator Bragg. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, look, I rise this afternoon to address this matter of public importance. And I think it is important in all things to put these changes that we are proposing to this parliament into a, into a framework, because you need to know why you're doing something before you do it. Uh, and as I said in my first speech to this place, where I reflected upon the words of another, another Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, who said after the coal strike of 1902, now I believe in rich people who act squarely and in labour unions which are managed with wisdom and justice. But when either employee or employer, labouring man or capitalist goes wrong, I have to clinch him. And that's all there is to it. Now that, that is exactly our agenda here. I mean, we're not coming into this place to try and pursue an agenda to try and uh, aid any type of organised organisation, whether it be a corporation or whether it be a union. We know who we represent in here. We represent the people, and in my case, the people of New South Wales. And so there is no question that industrial relations has been an area where there's been far too much ideology and not enough problem solving. And there are people that come into this, this place who are not sure who they represent. They're not sure whether they represent the people, or whether they represent a union, or whether they represent a super fund in some cases. Um, and so this is a very important point of clarity for us. Why would we pursue these changes to the labour laws? And the answer is because we believe there is a need to create more investment and ultimately more job opportunities for the Australian people that we all represent in this place. And so to step through a few of these changes that the Attorney General is proposing, uh, the first of which is nailing down a definition of what a casual worker is. Now, after the Rosado case, this has been a, an area of great conjecture. People would be aware that effectively Australian companies are now sitting on liabilities of about $40 billion uh, after that, that court case uh, because it's backdated effectively. Uh, and so this legislation designed, is designed to put in place a situation where after 12 months of uh, reasonably consistent casual employment, uh, a worker can convert to a permanent part-time role. That is an option for that person under this legislation. Now, if we don't legislate this, all those liabilities are going to sit there on the books, in some cases accounted for, in other, case, in other cases not accounted for, of Australian businesses. And the class actions are already starting. So that is an important, important piece of certainty for Australian workers and Australian businesses. Uh, then, of course, uh, try, trying to have longer-term agreements, uh, as the bill proposes, I think is a very worthwhile idea. I mean, we are competing for new investment for major projects. We always have been. I mean, this is a country that has competed for the best brains and foreign investment since the first fleet, and that is that is the status today. I mean, I've been reflecting upon the the geopolitical changes in Hong Kong, uh, and I think. You know, a lot of the debate around China is quite unsophisticated. Uh, my view would be that 
Uh, Hong Kong will still be an important gateway to China, but it will not be the same regional centre for finance and technology. Because why on earth would you put people, foreign, why would you put your executives uh, in danger of the national security law as you, as you would be in Hong Kong? So I think uh, there's a lot of money that will come out of Hong Kong uh, that will create new jobs. Now, those jobs could be in Sydney, or they could be in Singapore, or they could be in Tokyo. And I think it's incumbent upon this parliament to find ways to improve our competitive position so we can attract that marginal investment, we can attract that mobile capital, and we can have those additional workers in Australia. Now, um, we're also looking to improve the operation of the, of the boot test so that there is a real worker test. Uh, a real scenario, not a hypothetical, because of course this Fair Work Commission has created an art form of uh, you know, slowing down and jamming up and gumming up the works uh, and effectively running the enterprise bargaining system into the ground in this country to the point where award reliance is higher than it was years ago. I mean, The whole point of enterprise bargaining is, is that workplaces can decide what's important for them, above and beyond the basic award rates. But with enterprise bargaining basically dead, uh, it is incumbent upon this parliament to try and reboot that. So, all in all, uh, we're committed to more investment and more jobs. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. In serving the people of Queensland and Australia, I note that Labor is fixated on the problems, not the solution. The facts are that the government listened to One Nation's legitimate concerns for both employers and employees, and it booted out the boot. One Nation achieved that. One Nation is doing more for Western Australian workers and employers than is Labor. That is in part due thanks to our Western Australian team, Robin Scott and ex Frio Sparky, who works hard for the people of the mining and pastoral region in WA, and to Colin Tinknell, the One Nation WA state leader who proudly represents the South West region. Workers should be concerned that Labor and some union bosses have abandoned workers. Casual workers are being abused and the needs of small business, Australia's largest employer of workers, small business, have been all but ignored by everyone except One Nation. I have personally stood up to put a stop to these abuses for casual workers that the unions Labor Party and politicians like Joel Fitzgibbon knowingly ignored for years. Recently, the CFMEU Mining Division agreed with me that their union has ignored casuals for many years. And I applaud that, that person in the CFMEU for having the courage to do that. And lawyers for the ETU and for the CFMEU confirmed that in their opinion, and I agree with them, the IR system needs to be free from lawyers. For Labor to just say that it is going to be easier for employers to cut wages and conditions is not enough. Labor needs to step up and to show everyday Australians what Australia's IR problems are and what they would do better. Labor, like Joel Fitzgibbon, is all talk and no action. One Nation wants genuine industrial relations reform for the benefit of employees and employers and especially small business and their employees. And the best way to do that is to listen and to contribute to a better system. We've been listening widely and hearing the concerns from industry, union bosses, employer and employee groups, welfare groups, casual and injured workers, and to small business. I care and I will fight to protect workers' legal and moral entitlements, just as I am doing in Queensland and am doing in the Hunter Valley, even though it's not in my state. One Nation stands for the workers that Labor and Joel Fitzgibbon continues to ignore. Deputy President, Acting Deputy President, uh, and it's great, great to stand up here today and, and respond to Senator Stirl's um, idea that we're planning to cut pay because there is no greater example of how pay is cut in this country than superannuation. It takes nine and a half per cent of someone's wage, rips it out of their pocket, sends it to some big city somewhere where some unaccountable person who doesn't have to repay it when they're 60, doesn't have to repay it back to the person, there's no capital guarantee with superannuation, has to actually... So if you want a pay cut, and we're going to go to 12 per cent here, so that's another 2.5 per cent that could go to someone, into someone's pocket, they're going to miss out on that because it's not going to go into the worker's pocket. 
It's going to go to some blowhard in some ivory palace somewhere. And you know, I've got a lot of time for Senator Stirl. We struck a real chord there a uh, year before last when we were down in Wangaratta and he said when he grew up, he grew up in his father's lap driving a truck, driving the wheel. Because that's how I grew up. I grew up on a farm, you know, and I can remember as a young child sitting in my father's lap, sitting behind the wheel of a big truck as well. And at the end of the day, what we share in common is the spirit of the battlers. Is the spirit of the battlers. And I'll tell you what, this is the problem with superannuation. They don't get to see that. The battlers don't get to see any superannuation. It goes to the blowhards in the ivory towers. And I don't know why blue-collar labour workers support superannuation. I don't know why they wanted to go to these ivory towers. So if you want to support workers' conditions, let them have control of their hard-earned wages. Let them have control of their hard-earned wages. But it doesn't end there. It doesn't end there. Labor have got this crazy scheme now where they're going to increase portability, or what they call portability. So they're going to rip out 25 per cent of casuals loading. They're going to say, don't you worry about that. Don't, don't go into your pocket. No, 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 no. Let us look after it for you. Let us look after it for you. And here we go again. It's the same old theme of collectivism, the same old theme of command and control. No, no, you don't know what you're doing with your money. We know best. We know best. And this is typical Labor, through and through, command and control. Don't let the casuals have their money. And of course, this is estimated to cost it about $8,000 a year when this money gets ripped out of their pockets. They're going to actually reduce the loading for casuals. Now, a lot of people on casual Labor actually want to be on casual Labor. They might be the secondary uh, breadwinner in the family and they want to work around the primary breadwinner. So they may only just want to work Saturday or Sunday. They might like the flexibility of coming and going and not being locked into a fixed contract. They might be students who you know, occasionally get a bit of extra work on the weekend or they get a bit of extra work over the holidays. Uh, but they don't want to be forced into necessarily permanent work and they sure as hell don't want to lose their loading. They don't want to lose their loading. But of course, Labor can't help themselves. They have to take that money and look after it for themselves because that's, why, that's the way they get to clip the ticket and that's the way they get to exert more command and control over the worker, want to deny the worker individual freedoms. And of course, then the greatest threat, the greatest threat to working conditions in this country is the cost of energy, is the cost of energy. Because what Labor want to do is go to unreliable, unrecyclable energy. That's right, unrecyclable energy. I mean, this is the crazy thing. They call this energy renewable energy. You can't renew lithium batteries. You can't renew solar panels. You can't renew windmills, mate. You know, these lithium batteries are 1% ore body. Lithium's a 1% ore body. You know, you've got to mine 100 tonnes of the stuff just to get to the ore. And that's before you bring in stripping ratios. You know, you got to, you know, sometimes stripping ratios of 10 to 1. How much dirt are we going to have to dig up in this country to get one battery? It's exorbitant. It's exorbitant. And that is going to drive the price of energy up. And of course, Labor think it's great they're going to have more people in energy creation. But this is just goes to show how they don't understand business. You don't want to increase the number of workers involved in the input of a business, in the input costs. You actually want to increase the output. We on this side of the chamber want more people in manufacturing producing outputs, not producing inputs. And of course, we've seen that up in Queensland, where the Queensland Labor government have been subsidising foreign companies to uh, basically produce energy at the expense of our own coal-powered fire stations, which meant they went into a loss last year for the first time ever. Senator Rennick, your time has elapsed. Senator Steelejohn. Everyone should have a home and a good job and a good school and good health care and food in the fridge and a warm place to sleep. Everyone should have the essentials of life that you need to live a good life. The reality for so many people in our community for so long is that these essentials have been out of reach. That struggle is the daily background noise to existence. Now, I am 26 years old, and in 1994, the year that I was born, 
the New Start payment rose for the final time in the 26-year period. And for the 26 years I've been on this planet, it has stayed exactly where it was, at the same time as more money than can be conceived of has flown into the pockets of big corporations and the companies that donate to the major parties in this place. And for those 26 years, the community have been campaigning with the Greens to increase what was New Start, what is now called Job Seeker, so that it is above the poverty line, so that people can have access to those essentials, so the struggle can be a little bit less. And the government, the Morrison government, has announced a $3.50 a day increase. That is not an increase, it is an insult. It is an insult to all those who campaigned for so long to raise the rate. It is an insult to every person who gave their time to tell their Member of Parliament about the need for an increase, and it will not be accepted, not by the Greens. We will continue to campaign for a rate of job seeker which is above the poverty line, that alleviates the struggle that is people's existence far too often. We will keep campaigning on it and we will be clear that this is our goal. We will not mince our words. We will continue to work with community for a real increase to job seeker. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. And, uh, I do realise, though, that uh, Senator Steele John came in and made a contribution. In fact, though, the MPI today was around employers and ensuring workers have their fair pay and entitlements and conditions. And Labor, though, would have you believe that this is a government that isn't looking after workers, when in fact the only side proposing to cut wages and cost jobs is in fact sitting on the opposite side of the chamber, the Labor Party. We recently heard opposition leader Anthony Albanese announced his undercooked and disappointing attempt at an industrial relations policy. It has nothing to help employers and employees work together. Nothing to grow jobs, nothing to address underpayments or fix a broken enterprise bargaining system. But you know what it does contain? It contains either a $20 billion a year business tax or, on the other side, a cut in casual pay equal to, on average, $153 a week. Yep, that's right. The Attorney-General's Department has estimated that just one element of the plan proposed by those opposite, extending paid annual leave, sick leave and long service leave entitlements to casual employees and independent contractors, would cost up to $20.3 billion per year. A $20 billion per year business tax. <clears throat> now we've heard over the course of the last week that those opposites suggest quickly that this isn't the plan. But then we saw the ACTU suggest that Labor's policy would actually be to cut casuals' pay to extend these new entitlements. The Attorney General's Department has estimated this would cost a casual employee, on average, $153 a week. So which side of this chamber has a desire to cut pay? It's not this one. And as we've shown through the pandemic, the government is constructive and pragmatic when it comes to industri industrial relations policy. We've focused on measures that are designed to regrow jobs, to boost wages and to enhance productivity. And doing so in the same cooperative spirit the country has so successfully embraced in our approach to the pandemic. We've done this through extensive consultation with unions and industry, aiming to bring people together and not divide them. What the country doesn't need is more attempts by Anthony Albanese and the Labor Party to turn workplaces into battlegrounds, pitching employers and against employees for their own political purposes. We had hoped that 2021 might see 
The opposition adopt a more mature approach to industrial relations, but sadly, their continued bluff and attitude and outright lies about what our government's proposing show that they remain hopelessly fixated, as always, not on solving problems, but playing politics. The government's willingness to consult widely was evidenced last week when it announced the removal of the temporary section 189 amendment. By refusing to back the bill, Anthony Albanese has shown he's only concerned about protecting one job, his own. The government's IR package addresses known problems within our industrial relations system and Labor's Fair Work Act. The reforms will not only support wages growth and help grow the jobs lost to the pandemic, they tackle broader issues like underemployment, job security, underpayment of wages and the failure of Labor's enterprise bargaining system to drive wages and productivity growth. In fact, it's a Liberal government that you know, is, is working to deliver these outcomes. And in continuing to oppose the government's IR bill, here's what the Labor Party is against. Tougher civil and new criminal penalties to stamp out wage theft. A quicker way to recover underpayments when they occur. A quicker enterprise approval process through the Fair Work Commission to help deliver pay rises more quickly. But of course, it's old Labor saying, let's block everything and change nothing. So what else do they want to block? The opportunity for more hours of work for almost 30 per cent of part-time employees in the retail sector and around 40 per cent of part-time employees in the accommodation and food services sector. So much for Labor being on your side. Definitely not if you're a part-time worker Senator, or a casual. Senator, your time has elapsed. Senator McCarthy. Mr Acting Deputy President, I rise to speak on this very important matter that concerns Australian workers' pay and conditions. This government has no plan for secure jobs. Instead, it's making it easier for employers to cut workers' pay and conditions. One of the many lessons from the COVID pandemic has been how insecure work has threatened our nation's health and the economy. When casual workers don't receive sick pay, they lack the financial means to stay home when sick, even with a highly contagious disease like COVID in the community. We know this because we have seen it happen. Aged care workers, childcare workers, security guards facing financial insecurity if they take a sick day. We have also seen casual workers having to work multiple jobs to ensure that they get enough hours. This is bad not just for the health and hip pocket of those workers and their families, but also for society and for our economy as a whole. We need to learn the lessons of this pandemic. The government's approach actually entrenches insecure work. Insecure work comes in many forms. I've heard from many workers their frustrations at being rolled over from one contract to the next, in some cases for years on end. It makes it hard for people to plan ahead. It makes it hard for people to start a family. It makes it hard for them just to survive. I see this in the Northern Territory with families and with governments and the CDP program, the Community Development Program. The current design of the CDP does not address the real employment challenges facing remote communities, including lack of demand for labour, lack of required skills to take up available jobs and the health effects of poverty. The government's broken and discriminatory community development program is no substitute for a plan for job creation and economic development. But the Morrison government has no plan for jobs certainly not in regards to those over 33,000 people on CDP. The problems with insecure work in Australia has only gotten worse over time. Our industrial relations system has not kept pace. The Coalition's industrial relations omnibus bill makes work less secure and cuts pay. Public health experts have labelled it an immediate threat to public health. They cited modelling that paid leave including for flu and other infectious diseases, 
can reduce workplace infections by at least 25 per cent. 25 per cent. The ACTU has said the bill fails the government's own test and that workers will be worse off. The government's changes will make jobs less secure. They will make it easier for employers to casualise permanent jobs and allow employers to pay workers less than the award safety net. That is completely the opposite of what this country needs. The bill creates a path for employers to cut pay due to the impact of COVID-19 on their business and wipes out back pay claims for misclassified casuals. The existing better off overall test would be suspended, allowing enterprise agreements to avoid minimum standards of modern awards, making enterprise agreements a mechanism for lowering wages and standards. Acting Madam Deputy President, working people have already sacrificed so much during this pandemic and they are hurting. And the government's bill will hurt them even more. As the CPSU says, the coalition government's proposed changes will accelerate the incidence of insecure work, undermine genuine collective bargaining and suppress wages growth. Impacts will be felt across the entire workforce, casual and permanent workers alike. As if workers haven't suffered enough battling to make ends meet during COVID, this new legislative offensive is so pro-business workers, or so pro-business, workers could be hired on a casual basis in virtually any position that employers deem to be casual. This is because the Morrison government's IR changes includes a new definition of casual employee that effectively overturns two recent federal court decisions. The matters of Workpack versus Skin and Workpack versus Rosetto found employees were not in fact casuals, <clears throat> but rather permanent workers, principally because they were given rosters up to a year in advance. In the Northern Territory, the tourism industry relies heavily on casual workers for human resources and casual workers rely heavily on the tourism sector for work. Northern Territory government investment through tourism vouchers, Roadhouse to Recovery grants and the Visitor Experience Enhancement Program, as well as the federal government's JobKeeper scheme has helped the local tourism sector survive but it's also created a false positive, which will soon run out. Scott Morrison is leaving the tourism sector behind and putting jobs at risk by ignoring industry pleas for support beyond the end of JobKeeper. As the months of government inaction continue, tourism workers and businesses are understandably becoming increasingly anxious about whether they will still have a job after the 28th of March. A survey by the Australian Federation of Travel Agents shows that if JobKeeper is not extended, three out of every 10 travel agencies will close immediately across Australia. We've seen travel agencies close during the pandemic. Do we really need to see more? And travel agents are not alone with many international facing tourism businesses likely to be among the last to recover from the economic impacts of COVID-19. In December, almost 2,000 territory businesses were still receiving JobKeeper, with payments worth $29.3 million to the Northern Territory economy. The Morrison government keeps saying it needs more data before it will make a decision. But acting Madam Deputy President, mean people's livelihoods are at risk. The President of the Australian Federation of Travel Agents, Mr Darren Rudd, has warned that once JobKeeper ends, eight out of ten people still working in travel will be out of a job, 30 per cent of businesses will close and 52 per cent will be at risk if support is not extended again beyond the 28th of March. So the Prime Minister is not on the side of travel agents and tourism workers. 
He's leaving them to God alone while he focuses on photo ops and announcements and never delivers. Just have a look at the rush that he made to Kakadu just over two years ago. We're still waiting. Australians in insecure work or looking for work are anguished by the uncertainty and they cannot plan for their future. Labor is calling on the government to provide Australians looking for work with certainty about what support will be available to them after March. Australian workers deserve this. Territory workers deserve this. Labor has a secure jobs plan and it involves job security explicitly inserted into the Fair Work Act, rights for the gig economy workers, casual work properly defined in law, more secure public sector jobs and so much more. Because as we know, the Morrison government does not care about Australian workers. Uh, thank you, Senator McCarthy. No further speakers on the MPI? Then I shall now proceed to the consideration of documents. So the documents listed on page four. Australian Meat and Livestock Industry Act 1997. Oh, sorry. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to take note of the document Livestock Mortalities During Export by Sea. Reports for the period 1 July to 31 December 2020. These latest numbers help to confirm that in 2020, despite it being the year in which so much of the global economy and global trade was disrupted, the brutality of the live export trade still went on. Nothing, it seems, will stop the Australian government from continuing to export sheep and cattle for profit. Alarmingly, the mortality rate for cattle on board the ships remains about the same as what it, was, um, what it has been for the last five years. And this is despite the government saying again and again how much the live export trade is improving and how they can make this cruel industry acceptable for, from an animal welfare perspective. But it seems nothing really is changing. The government registered more than 1,200 mortalities of Australian cattle on voyages during 2020, which is, of course, the year of COVID-19. Nothing is changing for these animals who continue to suffer on these ships of misery. Um, the news isn't much better for sheep either, with more than 1,700 mortalities of sheep on board recorded last year. Thousands of animals are dying as they are exported in horrible conditions when there is absolutely no need to do so. That's bad enough on its own, but I do have to make the point as well, though, that considering onboard mortalities is a pretty outdated way of measuring animal welfare experiences on board live export ship, ships. Um, so long as there is a live export industry, there should be routine reportable measures against animal welfare indicators on top of the death tally, tally that the, these measures the community should be able to see transparently and parliament should be able to scrutinize. And these should include measures such as experiences of heat stress, stocking densities, and pen conditions that show us what is really going on on these ships. Without such animal welfare indicators transparently presented and in a timely manner, it is impossible to know the conditions that these animals are being put under on these ships. Because we know what happens on these ships. They are miserable, cruel places. Such transparency would further expose what is an industry that is rotten to the core and incapable of making li live export at all compatible with animal welfare. We have to shut it down. 
Uh, Senator Faruqi, are you seeking leave to continue, continue your remarks? Sure. Um, I seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. We'll now proceed to the tabling and consideration of committee reports and government responses. Uh, Senator <laughs> Government Whip. Pursuant to order and at the request of the chairs of the respective committees, I present reports on the examination of annual reports tabled by 31st of October 2020. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Madam Assistant. What it, acting <laughs> Deputy <laughs> President. Sorry, I always get my assembly and um, Senate terms mixed up. Um, I present. I present the second interim report of the Select Committee on COVID-19 on public interest immunity claims, and I move that the consideration of the recommendations made in the report be a business of the Senate order of the day for 15th of March 2021. And I think I have to go on to say I indicate to senators that after the question on this motion is put, I will move, then move a motion to take note of the report to enable other senators to speak. So those in favour of that motion say aye. Aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Thank Senator you. Gallagher. I move that the Senate take note of the report. Okay. Are you going to speak to it now? Speak brief. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, this report should never have needed to be written, but the Senate Select Committee on COVID-19 has to update the Senate on how the government, through its inappropriate use of public interest immunity claims, has willfully obstructed access to information crucial to the committee's inquiry. The Senate must act to reassert its preeminent role in holding the executive to account and reject this government's secretive agenda designed to protect the executive. If we fail to stand up for the Senate's power of inquiry, then it will become a toothless tiger that gets spoon-fed only the information that the government wants to feed it. That is not how our system is meant to operate. As senators will remember, the COVID-19 committee was established on 8 April last year to scrutinise the government's response to COVID-19 at a time when it was unclear when the Senate would sit due to the pandemic. At the time, the former leader of the government, Senator Cormann, said, and I quote, we welcome the scrutiny. We do believe there is a need for scrutiny. We understand and appreciate that in these extraordinary times, the government has been required to make very significant decisions and it's appropriate that those judgments that we make are scrutinised and challenged to help us make even better decisions as we go along." End of quote. Yet despite this, the committee finds that in practice the government's approach in responding to requests for information has been at best lazy and at worst a deliberate abuse of the public interest immunity process. And I say this in the context that not all information requested by committees should always be released. In fact, the committee has accepted two claims of public interest immunity because it was reasonable to do so. And that is why we have in place clear guidance through the 2009 Cormann motion that information can only be withheld from the Senate through a properly made PII claim. Yet we have seen a consistent refusal from the government to provide information to the committee or to follow the process that they insisted on when they were last in opposition. We have seen public servants, who clearly know the answers to questions, refuse to answer before being reminded of their obligations to the Senate, and then re they refer the matter to the Minister for Consideration. This is where I think the government hopes it ends, as nothing seems to happen once these claims get referred to ministers. It's fallen to the committee uh, and the committee chair, myself, to write to ministers reminding them about the referral and asking for a response. This process alone has taken months to complete hardly a shining example of transparency and scrutiny at work. We have then seen claim after claim of public interest immunity come in, usually without addressing in any satisfactory way the public harm that would be caused by the release of the information being sought. So for the Senate's information, the information being denied to it includes whether a US law enforcement agency could access data collected by the COVID Safe app. Uh, when the Chief Medical Officer first briefed Cabinet and the date on which the National Cabinet first agreed to a suppression strategy, not an elimination strategy, the modelling underpinning the government's health response to COVID-19, the economic modelling underpinning the government's response, including on the design of JobKeeper and the rate of JobSeeker, a presentation by the Productivity Commission to National Cabinet, when the former Minister for Aged Care, now Minister for Aged Care Services, first briefed the Cabinet about 
the pandemic and if he briefed them at all on the Royal Commission report or during the outbreak in residential aged care in Victoria, and also the Department of Social Security's advice on the reintroduction of the liquid assets test. The reasons for withholding this information include a reference to legal professional privilege, a reason the Senate has never accepted as sufficient grounds in and of itself to refuse information to the parliament, claims relying only on general statements about the sanctity of cabinet information, which again is not a ground uh, the Senate has accepted to refuse and to fail and fails to comply with the common order. Claims that providing the information would somehow reveal cabinet deliberations, which are clearly not true because the committee never asked what was discussed. We merely sought information such as the date when things happened or modelling that would assist with the understanding of the government's response. And at no stage in any of these claims did ministers address the public harm that could be caused specifically by the release of such information. Causing political harm to a minister or a government is not a legitimate reason to withhold information that the Senate has requested, but it appears to me that this is the government's main motivation. The refusal to provide the committee with key information obstructs the committee in undertaking its scrutiny responsibilities. And frankly, if it wasn't such a flagrant abuse of the PII process, it would be a joke. I mean, why on earth is the government refusing to answer when the chief medical officer first briefed Cabinet? Is it because he didn't do it until later into the pandemic? Why is the Minister for Aged Care Services refusing to answer when he first briefed the Cabinet on the unfolding crisis in residential aged care? Is it because that never happened? Why can't the government front up and explain when they agreed on a suppression strategy for the pandemic? Why can't the Senate have access to presentations given by the Productivity Commission or Treasury to National Cabinet? It seems the staff of state and territory governments are allowed access, but the Australian Senate isn't. How can um, we question decisions if we're denied access to modelling or expert advice that informed those decisions after they were taken? How can we scrutinise the timeliness of the response when the government won't even give us the dates of key decisions or ministerial briefings? The government should respect the role of the Senate and its committee. But the government, through an arrogant abuse of public interest immunity, has treated and, unless there are consequences, will continue to treat this place with contempt. The current approach from the government is not exclusive to the COVID-19 committee either. I see it used by public servants and ministers all the time to hide from scrutiny, particularly during estimates. And there are other ways outside the PII claims that the government routinely denies public access to information, rejecting freedom of information requests, giving late or evasive answers to questions on notice and refusing to comply with orders for the production of documents. There is no shortage of examples where this government unreasonably denies, usually on political grounds, access to information. Now, I would say to the Senate, as the current generation of senators, we must stand up for the powers and purpose of the Senate. This Senate will outlive all of us, and it falls to us to stand up and protect what is a clearly a conscious attempt by a secretive government to whittle away the powers of this Senate, which have been clearly established over decades. We cannot allow the Senate to only receive information that's politically convenient for the government to provide. To accept the government's approach, as outlined in this report, of withholding key information from public view would erode and undermine the Senate's power of inquiry. As chair of this select committee, I don't want to see that happen, and nor will my fellow committee members allow it, and nor should any senator in this place. I commend the report to the Senate. Uh, st just before I come to you, Senator Patterson, um, Senator Gallagher, uh, are you sorry? Are you speaking on this report? Oh yes, Senator Patterson. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise to make a brief contribution in response to that of the Chair of the COVID-19 Senate Select Committee in my capacity as the Deputy Chair of the COVID-19 Senate Select Committee. I have very much enjoyed working with the Chair and all members of the committee. And it is not uncommon, and I certainly don't object to a Senate committee taking issue with the use of public interest immunity claims uh, by governments. But I think it's important to place these particular uh, disputes between the committee and the government over a handful of public interest immunity claims in the wider context of the work of the committee. I think it's important for the record, and government senators have, have made additional comments in this uh, report, uh, to note that since the committee was established, I agree on, on a bipartisan basis, uh, as Senator Gallagher noted, uh, that 39 public hearings have been held, 
uh, that the Health Department has appeared ten times before the committee, that the Treasury has appeared eight times before the committee, that the committee has sent out, as of a few days ago, 2,273 questions on notice both to the government and other witnesses before the inquiry, and that government agencies and departments have answered almost 2,000 uh, questions on notice to the committee. And all of this was done in the midst of the most unprecedented global pandemic in our lifetimes and associated economic crisis. So I think it's a bit unreasonable for the chair to characterise uh, the government as being uncooperative or secretive. Um, that actually shows a high degree of cooperation and a high degree of respect for the Senate. It's not unusual that there have been a handful of issues of disagreement uh, on PII claims, but let's put that, those handful, literally a handful of disagreements between the committee and the government in the context of actually an amazing degree of cooperation and bipartisanship, which has been upheld throughout this process. Thank you. On the same question, Senator Ferranti Wells? No, on the delegated legislation. Um, I will just one moment. Uh, I think uh, Senator Walsh on this on the question of so Senator Gallagher has indicated that she's seeking leave to continue her rem remarks on the uh, Select Committee on COVID nineteen second interim report is leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator Ferenczi Wills. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I present Delegated Legislation Monitor 4 of 2021 of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, mm. and I move that the Senate take note of the report, and I speak to that report. I rise to speak to the tabling of the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation Committee's Delegated Legislation Monitor 4 of 2021. I would like to once again draw the Chamber's attention to the Committee's comments regarding legislative instruments made by the Australian Securities and Investment Commission. These instruments address a range of subject matters within ASIC's portfolio by providing for exemptions from and modifications to certain provisions of the Corporations Act 20, 2001 and other Acts of Parliament. At the outset, I take this opportunity to express the committee's concern that it has taken over four months to reach a resolution in relation to the committee's systemic scrutiny concerns about these instruments. However, as I have previously advised the chamber, excessive delays in resolving committee scrutiny concerns are not limited to any one portfolio. It is for this reason that yesterday I moved a motion jointly with the Deputy Chair in relation to the importance of constructive and timely engagement with the committee. I will further reflect on the terms of this motion shortly. The instruments in question alter the operation of primary legislation made by this parliament and were intended to remain in force for substantial periods of time, the majority up to 10 years. This contravenes the committee's long-standing expectation that instruments which modify or exempt persons or entities from the operation of primary legislation should cease to operate no more than three years after they commence. The committee considers that a shorter sunsetting period is essential to ensure that there is a minimum degree of regular parliamentary oversight of, these, of such instruments. The committee also considers that these instruments raise systemic concerns about the application of ASIC's exemption and modification powers and the application of similar powers across government more broadly. For this reason, the committee continues to apply its approach to instruments which modify the operation of primary legislation consistently across all portfolios. The fact that a legislative instrument is made by an independent agency does not in any way diminish the need for the parliament to effectively exercise control over its delegated legislative power. Noting this, on 4 February, the committee wrote to the Treasurer to request that the five ASIC instruments be amended to ensure that, in effect, they cease to operate three years after commencement. However, the committee did not receive a response to this request until the evening of 18 February. It is concerning that this lack of timely engagement prevented the committee from advising the Senate about its views on the instruments in its delegated legislation monitor tabled last week. 
Despite the delay in providing the response, the Treasurer's response did recognise the importance of Treasury instruments being consistent with the Committee's scrutiny principles and reiterated that he shares the Committee's concerns in relation to the importance of parliamentary oversight of legislative instruments. The Treasurer's comments in this response also incorporated three further ASIC instruments which the Committee had raised separately with the Treasurer and which had also been the subject of notices of motion to disallow. In responding to the committee's systemic scrutiny concerns about the eight ASIC instruments, the Treasurer undertook to engage in further good faith discussions with the committee following the tabling of the committee's final report of its inquiry into the exemption of delegated legislation from parliamentary oversight. These discussions would address the ASIC instruments of current interest to the committee, in addition to other legislative instruments in the Treasury portfolio more broadly. Can I um, say that this is very important given the fact that Treasury, uh, uh, the Treasury portfolio has a very large number of legislative uh, instruments. Indeed, I, I believe it has the largest. The committee considers that the approach developed as a result of this engagement may serve as a model for addressing the committee's scrutiny concerns about instruments which modify the operation of primary legislation in other portfolios in the future. In addition, in response to the committee's scrutiny concerns, ASIC has amended the ASIC Corporation's Litigation Funding Schemes Instrument 2020 to provide that it will cease five years after commencement. The committee considers that this amendment is a positive indication that the Treasurer and ASIC will continue to engage with the committee to resolve its systemic concerns about the application of ASIC's modification and exemption powers more broadly. In light of the Treasurer's undertaking to engage with the committee to resolve the committee's scrutiny concerns in relation to legislative instruments across the Treasury portfolio and the amendment of the litigation funding schemes instrument, the committee has concluded its examination of six of the eight instruments. However, the committee has not received a substantive response in relation to the specific scrutiny concerns raised with the Treasurer in relation to two remaining instruments, the asset credit notice requirements for unlicensed carried over instruments lenders instrument 2020 and the asset credit, credit electronic pre-contractual disclosure instrument 2020. While some aspects of the committee's scrutiny concerns about these two instruments have been addressed by the Treasurer in most recent correspondence, the committee considers that the remaining scrutiny concerns must be resolved before it concludes its examination of the instruments. The Treasurer's response to these ongoing scrutiny concerns will assist the committee in determining whether to withdraw the disallowance notices currently in place on the two instruments. Finally, I welcome the Senate's agreement yesterday to a motion which I moved jointly with the Deputy Chair, Senator Carr, that re-emphasised the importance of the work of this committee. In the motion, the Senate reiterated that one of its essential functions is to scrutinise the lawmaking power that the Parliament has delegated to the executive and endorsed the position that the Senate must hold the executive to account in this regard. Importantly, the Senate affirmed the central part that the committee has played since 1932 in supporting the Senate in this fundamental role. It also recognised that to effectively fulfil its mandate, the committee relies on the constructive and timely engagement of ministers and agencies on the technical scrutiny concerns raised by the committee. The, the Senate therefore called on all ministers and agencies to respond to the committee's request for information in relation to its technical scrutiny concerns within the time frame set by the committee and to implement undertakings made to the committee in a timely manner. I thank the Senate for re-endorsing the importance of the committee's role and take this opportunity to draw the terms of the motion to the attention of all ministers, shadow ministers and agencies. With these comments, I commend the committee's delegated legislation monitor four of 2021 to the Senate. The motion is, is that scrutiny digest four of 2021 be noted. All those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. We will move to Senator Patterson. Thank you. I present the report of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security on its review of declared error provisions, and I move that the Senate take note of the report. Um, Madam Acting Deputy President, I am pleased to present the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security's report into the review of declared errors provisions sections 119.2 and 119.3 of the Criminal Code. 
This is the first report that I present as chair of the Intelligence and Security Committee, and as such, I'd like to acknowledge the former chair of the committee, Mr. Andrew Hasty, MP, for his significant contribution to the committee and national security policy over the last two parliaments, uh, and for his role in chairing the inquiry into these provisions last year. I look forward to continuing to work in collaboration with all members of the committee on important national security and intelligence matters in the bipartisan spirit that has been the consistent feature of its work. This is the report of the review of the operation, effectiveness and implications of the declared areas as required under subparagraph 29.1 of the Intelligence Services Act 2001. In brief terms, section 1192 of the Criminal Code makes it an offence for Australian citizen to enter or remain in an area in a foreign country that is declared by the Minister for Foreign Affairs under section 1193 of the Criminal Code. There are certain exemptions where a declared area offence does not apply if the person enters an area for one or more legitimate purposes specified in section 1192. A declaration by the Foreign Minister ceases to have effect after three years, and the committee may review a declaration and report to Parliament at any time a declaration is in effect. There have only been two declarations made under the provisions to date. The Al Raqqa province in Syria declared on 4 December 2014, and Mos Mosul district in Iraq declared on 2 March 2015 and redeclared on 2 March 2018. Both declarations have since been revoked by the Minister for Foreign Affairs, and there are currently no declared areas under section 1193 of the Criminal Code. In fulfilling its obligation under the Intelligence Services Act to review the declared area provisions, the committee has considered the current and evolving international security threat environment, the purpose of and the necessity of the provisions, the operation and effectiveness of the provisions, including their usage to date and their deterrent effect, the intersection of the provision with human rights and civil liberties, and proposed additional exceptions for legitimate travel to declared areas. In making its recommendations, the committee also considered current and future uncertain geopolitical environment, which has been exacerbated by the COVID-19 global pandemic. The committee found that it would not be prudent to repeal the declared areas provisions during a period of great uncertainty. As such, the committee recommended that the declared area provisions of the Criminal Code be extended for a further three years to a new sunset date of 7 September 2024, that the Criminal Code be amended to provide that the PJCIS may review the operation and effectiveness of declared area provisions prior to the new sunset date, and that within 18 months of this report, the committee receive a briefing from government agencies on the use, proportionality and effectiveness of the declared area provisions. In addition, the committee also believes there is merit in implementing a regulation to allow Australian citizens to apply for permission to tra travel to a declared area in special circumstances. Therefore, rather than extending exceptions under the current provisions of the Criminal Code, the government could consider applications based on merit and a relative, uh, relevant security threat assessment. The committee recommended that the Criminal Code be amended to allow Australian citizens to request an exemption from the Minister for Foreign Affairs to travel to a declare area for reasons not listed under section 1192, and importantly, that the Minister's decision would not be subject to a merit review. I commend the report to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Patterson. The question is, is that the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security report revealed declared areas provisions be noted. Those that, are, that opinion say aye. But those again say no. The ayes have it. Sen uh, Senator Smith, are there any more um, committee reports and government responses to be tabled? Oh, sorry. Senator Ciccone. You're right. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. On behalf of the Chair of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Bills, uh, Senator Polly, I present Scrutiny oh. Digest No. 4 of 2021. Uh, so, thank you. Yeah. Yes. Um, I also have a further one as well, too. Okay. Good. On behalf of the Chair of the Economics References Committee, Senator Gallagher, I present a statement relating to an order for the production of document concerning to the committee's inquiry into Australia's sovereign naval shipbuilding <coughs> capability. Thank you. Senator Smith. Thank you, Madam Deputy, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, on behalf of the Joint Committee of Public Accounts and Audit, I present six executive minutes relating to reports number 476, 479, 480, 481, and 482. Thank you. Thank you. There are no speakers. 
Are there any ministerial statements? Minister. Uh, I table a response to questions taken on notice during question time on Monday the 22nd and Tuesday the 23rd of February 2021, asked by Senator Waters and Ms Callister relating to allegations of sexual assault and seek leave to have these documents uh, incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister. I table documents relating to the order of production of documents concerning future submarines. Thank you. Committee memberships. Are there any changes to committees? The president has received a letter requesting a change in the membership of a committee. Minister. I take leave to move a motion to vary the membership of committees. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister. I move that the resolution of appointment of the Select Committee on Autism be amended to provide that a Senator Griff cease to be a member of that committee and b a new deputy chair who is a non-government member of the committee be elected by the committee. Those are the, um, the, the motion is um, that the, the motion be agreed to. All, of, all those of that opinion say aye. All of those against no. The ayes have it. Tongue time. To messages from the House of Representatives. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Higher Education Support Amendment Freedom of Speech Bill 2020 for concurrence. Minister. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I move that this bill may now proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is, is that the bill be read a first time? All of those of that opinion say aye. Against? No. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Higher Education Support Act 2003 and for related purposes. Minister. I move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. The question is, is that the bill be now read a second time? Those of that opinion. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister. The debate now be adjourned. The question is, is that the debate now be adjourned? Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. I move that the resumption of the debate be in order of the day for a later hour. We will now move. The question, oh, the question is that the debate be in order of the day for a later hour. All of those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. The president has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Education Legislation Amendment 2021 Measures No. 1 Bill 2021 for concurrence. Minister. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that this bill may, may proceed without formalities and be read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to education and research and for related purposes. Minister. I move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. In accordance with Standing Order 111, further consideration of this bill is now adjourned to 11 May 2021. Okay, Clark. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives informing the Senate of changes in the membership of the following joint committees, Parliamentary Joint Committee on Law Enforcement, Joint Standing Committee on Treaties and Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade. Clark. Uh, business of the Senate Notice of Motion Number 1, standing in the name of Senator Rice, reference to Rural and Regional Affairs Transport References Committee relating to carbon pollution from transport. Senator Rice. 
Thanks, Acting Deputy President. So do I need to move the motion? Is it I'm yes. Yes. Okay. So, look, I move that business of the Senate notice of motion number one, um, which is a referral to the Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport References Committee regarding carbon pollution from transport, um, be be moved. <laughs> Did you want to speak to it? Yes, I do. Yes. yes. Please so, look, proceed. Thank you. I'm proposing this inquiry because what is missing from this place, um, other than in Greens' contributions in multiple debates, is serious consideration of the most existential issue facing humanity today, both here in Australia and around the world. Basically, if global humanity doesn't do what's necessary to tackle our climate crisis, then we are cactus. Almost 20 per cent of the carbon pollution from Australia comes from transport. And we have to tackle our transport pollution if we are serious about tackling our carbon pollution. But at the moment, there is not a way forward that is being proposed by this government or this parliament. A few weeks ago, we saw the Liberal Party's release of their future fuels strategy discussion paper. And in a way, it actually it summed up the Liberal Party's approach to electric vehicles, to transport emissions and indeed to the climate crisis. It was late, it was devoid of meaningful content, and basically it was just pathetic. So before I go on with the specifics of what this inquiry would encompass, which I envisage actually would enable us to lay out what we could and should be doing in the transport sector to slash our carbon pollution to zero as soon as possible, I want to lay out the problem of our climate crisis, because it does not seem to have sunk into most people in this place what a huge problem we are facing. I mean, barely over a year ago, we saw Australia burn. We had more than 12.6 million hectares burnt in the 2019-20 summer fires. 20 per cent of the mainland forests of Australia burnt, including forests that have never been burnt before in, in, at all, in, in thousands and thousands of years. There were over three billion animals that were killed. And the smoke alone from the fires was linked to more than 4,000 hospital admissions and 445 deaths. And that's in, in addition to the tragic 30-odd um, people who actually were killed in the fires. This has occurred with global warming of just over one degree. So, frankly, I am terrified to think of what we face with three or more degrees of warming by the turn of the century. And that turn of the century, I just want you to think about that. That's in 79 years' time. That's in, within the lifetime of the children and the grandchildren that we love and hold dear today. We are facing an existential crisis of more than three degrees of global warming. And tragically, it's not just fires. The climate crisis means multiple species facing extinction, as their homes that they live in will disappearing as climate change causes our environment to become hotter and drier and fires being more intense and more frequent. We know the extreme weather. It's not just fires, it's floods. And we've already been seeing insurance costs in Queensland absolutely skyrocket and become incredibly difficult. People can't, can't get insurance for their property. We're seeing the bleaching of the Great Barrier Reef and so many other precious life forms in our, in our oceans. And we're seeing the rising sea levels, the rising tide and the threats to shorefront properties, infrastructure and people's whole towns. I mean, strong, at the moment, we're at about 1.2 degrees of warming. There is strong evidence that at 1.5 degrees of warming, at or around that, both the West Antarctic and the Greenland ice, ships, ice sheets will have reached their tipping point, i.e. melting will be locked in because of the level of heat that's in the atmosphere. I mean, can we just stop and think about what that means? The melting of the Greenland and the West Antarctic ice sheets means eight metres of sea level rise. Eight metres. And current science is saying on the way to that eight metres, we are looking at somewhere between two to three metres of sea level rise 
by the turn of the century, again, in the lifetime of children alive today. And I'll just give you one example of what that means. I mean, the Fisherman's Bend development project that's currently underway in Melbourne, it's touted as the largest urban renewal development in the country, and it's projected, they say, by 2050 to be home to approximately 80,000 residents and provide employment for up to 80,000 people. The only problem is that that's by 2050. By 2100, the vast majority of it will be underwater because it is all less than two, two metres above sea level, as will a huge area of our coastal cities, including places like my childhood home in Altona in Melbourne. So sadly, I mean, this is the problem we are facing, and sadly, our current Liberal government has failed Australia. There have been years of opportunity when we could have acted at much lower cost than what we are facing now. And future generations are going to pay the price for the greed, the hypocrisy and the selfishness of the fossil fuel barons and their lackeys in the Liberal Party. And the Labor Party is not much better. I mean, they haven't even got a target for carbon reduction by 2030. They're saying zero carbon by 2050, but 2050 is too late. The science is in. We need to be reaching zero carbon well before then. Delaying action is the new denial. So we need to act on our climate crisis, and that is the underlying reason for this referral. As I've said, transport is 20 per cent of our carbon pollution. And whereas we are well underway in the shift to renewable energy in the electricity sector, um, that's not the case with transport. I mean, with electricity, there was the article in The Guardian today that was basically saying the amount of solar and the amount of wind that's coming online is it's happening faster than was expected. It's, it's providing power at a cheaper rate than it's expected, causing electricity prices to come down, and it's going to mean early clo earlier closure of the coal-fired power stations than was previously expected. It's also inevitable that with that reduction in price of renewable electricity, it's going to outcompete gas in price within a couple of years. So things are happening when it comes to stationary energy, but when it comes to transport, we are lagging. And it's absolutely essential that we sort out how we can shift to zero carbon transport absolutely as soon as possible. I mean, currently we are just missing out on so many opportunities. And the most obvious one is the Liberal Party's failure to act on electric vehicles. I mean, this was a real opportunity for Australia. We could have had really exciting opportunities in embracing new technologies. We could have built our science and research sector up in supporting the shift to electric vehicles. We could have supported manufacturing opportunities here in Australia for components, for batteries, or maybe even entire vehicles. Now, wouldn't that be amazing, you know, building entire vehicles here in Australia? And we could have made driving around this continent cleaner, greener, cheaper for everybody. But instead, we had our Prime Minister running an election campaign against electric vehicles during the election, camp during the election campaign. And of course, we know the claims that you know, tradies couldn't possibly drive an electric vehicle and that nobody was going to be able to tow anything. But of course, I mean, after the election was over, I asked the Department of the Environment of any substance of the claims that were made during the election campaign, and of course, there weren't any. So we are broken down at the side of the road when it comes to electric vehicles, when other countries are just zooming past us, racing along. I mean, the Conservative UK government, it has now got a commitment and it is ensuring that all new vehicles sold after 2030, that's in nine years' time, are going to be electric vehicles in the UK. And, and that radical environment group, General Motors, has announced that all of its vehicles are going to be electric from 2035. And around the world, many other countries, they're offering clear incentives and support for consumers, enabling them to drive clean, green electric vehicles. But in Australia, we've got the Liberal Party and our Liberal National Government sitting on our hands, on their hands. And as a result, we're becoming a dumping ground for manufacturers who know that they can take their dirty, polluting and inefficient vehicles, bring them to Australia because the Liberal Party will not protect Australians or the environment. And we need to be improving our vehicle emission standards because Australia is lagging years behind the rest of the world, leaving us with dirty, polluting cars that are damaging our health. And what's more is that the Liberal Party's failure at a Commonwealth level has led to greater problems at a state level. 
We've seen toll road companies lobbying the state governments to impose taxes on electric vehicles. I mean, there is, to be clear, there is a debate that needs to be had about road charging. And we know that congestion charging could, develop, could deliver real benefits, and we need to have that discussion here about road pricing. But dirty deals being done behind closed doors with no community consultation must not be how we determine national transport policy. I mean, we are very glad to see the opposition mounting to these short-sighted taxes in Victoria and South Australia. And in the meantime, I'm glad that the Senate's agreed to send my bill off to the Economics Committee to examine the bill, the Coag Reform Fund Amendment No Electric Vehicle Taxes Bill. And it's a very straightforward bill that would ensure that those jurisdictions that impose unfair taxes on electric vehicles, they lose the revenue that they'd get from those taxes. I mean, there's a real opportunity for national leadership here. And if the Liberal Party is going to try and hold things up on electric vehicles, then it must not be an excuse for the state governments to make things even worse and impose additional barriers on electric vehicles. But beyond electric vehicles, the Liberal Party's failure to act on climate has huge implications for the transport sector. There was a recent report by Climate Works entitled Moving to Zero, Accelerating the Transition to Zero Emissions Transport. And that spelled out why this was so important. They said, transport is the fastest growing and the third largest source of emissions in Australia, behind electricity and the stationary energy sectors. Australia's road vehicle fleet is one of the most energy and emissions intensive in the world. The nation's per capita aviation emissions are the world's highest. An opportunity exists for Australia to turn these trends around and to become a global leader in zero emissions transport. So that report that highlights the need to act and there, that there is an opportunity to make a meaningful difference. And crucially, you know, they say it's not a moonshot, that the strategies to inform Australia's transport networks are known, with many ready to be implemented this decade. Widespread rapid adoption of well-established solutions, along with mature and demonstrated technologies can achieve much of what is needed this decade. Substantial investment in research, development and commercialisation can close the gap to zero emissions across the transport sector. And that report provides clear recommendations for action across the country of how we can do what we need to do to address the climate crisis. Hence this referral to the Rural Regional Affairs and Transport Committee, because I think this Senate needs to be looking at reports like this, it needs to be looking at the research, and it needs to be saying, what can we be doing in the transport sector to reach zero carbon transport as quickly as possible? And laying out, as per the terms of reference, um, some of the things that will be addressed in this inquiry and what need to be done. So we would end up with recommendations. I expect that the government needs to provide a clear plan. There's a clear, necessary role for government because it's government inaction that's causing problems. And it's not just about electric vehicles for, for passengers. We need to work out what we're going to do with heavy vehicles, with freight with aviation and shipping. How do we shift them to zero carbon as well? It's possible. Other countries around the world are tackling it. We are sitting on our hands and not taking the action that is needed. There is massive benefit as well in actually shifting people um, as much as they, giving people the opportunity and the choice to shift out of their private vehicles to public transport. And it's so straightforward to make public transport zero carbon. Electric trains, electric trams, electric buses. Now, I'm sure we can. Not, a, not a, a difficult thing to imagine of electric ferries. And there are big benefits for healthy and livable cities too if you get that mode shift, getting pe give people the choice to get out of their private vehicles into public transport. And we need to get serious about walking and cycling as transport modes as well. I mean, a healthy, balanced, zero carbon passenger transport mix in our cities would be around a third of trips being undertaken by private electric cars powered by 100 per cent renewable energy, a third being zero carbon public transport, and a third walking and cycling. And then for the regions, it's again, if you've got electric vehicles and you've got zero carbon public transport, you know, fast trains, fast buses to connect the regions to each, to the, each other region, to connect them to the cities, if you've got high-speed rail between Melbourne, Canberra, Sydney, Brisbane, 
we can reach zero carbon transport. So, look, I call upon the Senate to support this important referral to lay out the evidence base of what can and must be done so that we can be reaching zero carbon in transport just as we can across the whole um, sector of the Australian economy. Thank you. Is, uh, Senator Roberts. I'd like to speak to the motion. Proceed. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Let's have a bit of fun with some facts. Neither H2O water nor CO2 carbon dioxide are pollutants. Neither water nor carbon dioxide is a pollutant. The two products from burning hydrocarbon fuels, coal, oil, natural gas, are water and carbon dioxide. We have carbon in every cell of our bodies. The term organic refers to something that contains carbon. Earth, the thing that makes our planet so livable, the thing that makes our planet so unique, is the fact that we have more carbon concentrated on our planet than is the case in the universe, across the universe. Carbon is essential for life. But the Greens don't understand that carbon is not carbon dioxide. They tell us that we need to cut our carbon dioxide from the use of coal, oil and natural gas, but then talk about carbon. Carbon dioxide is a gas. Carbon is a solid in every cell of your bodies. Every cell of your bodies. So let's deal with some facts. Let's have a bit of fun. Carbon dioxide is just 0.04 per cent of Earth's air. That is four one hundredths of a percent. Four one hundredths of one percent. Now it's scientifically classified as a trace gas because there's so little of it. There's barely a trace of it. Now some people are going to say, oh, but cyanide can kill you with just a trace. That's true. That's a chemical effect. But the carbon dioxide claimed effect of carbon dioxide from the Greens and global warming and climate catastrophe and the greatest existential threat to it that we face now is a physical effect. And a trace gas has no physical effect that can be recorded. And that, as I'll show you in a minute. Next point, carbon dioxide is non-toxic and not noxious. It's highly beneficial to and essential for all plants on this planet. Everything green that's natural relies upon carbon dioxide. And it benefits when the carbon dioxide levels are far higher than now. Carbon dioxide is colourless, odourless and tasteless. Nature produces, and this is from the United Nations Climate Body, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, nature produces 97 per cent of the carbon dioxide produced annually on our planet. That means that nature produces 32 times more than the entire human production of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide does not discolour the air. Carbon dioxide does not impair the quality of water or soil. None of what I'm talking about is new. I've compiled it, but none of it's new. Carbon dioxide does not create light, does not create heat, does not create noise, does not create radioactivity. It doesn't distort our senses. It does not degrade the environment, nor impair its usefulness, nor render our environment offensive. Carbon dioxide does not harm ecosystems, and in fact is essential for all ecosystems. Carbon dioxide does not harm plants and animals, nor humans. In fact, we put it in our kids' soft drink. We put it in our champagne. We put it in our beer. We put it in soda water. We carbonate it by putting carbon dioxide in there. It's essential for all plants and animals. Carbon dioxide does not cause discomfort, doesn't cause instability, wooziness, disorder of any kind. It does not accumulate. It does not upset nature's balance. It's essential for nature and life on this planet. It remains in the air for only a short time before nature cycles it into plants, animal tissue, 
the oceans and natural accumulations. It does not contaminate apart from nature's extremely high and concentrated vol volumes of carbon dioxide from some volcanoes, and then only locally and briefly under rare natural conditions when in concentrations and amounts far higher than anything humans can produce. Carbon dioxide is not a foreign substance. In the past, on this planet, under the current atmosphere, there have been times when carbon dioxide levels were 130, to 130 times higher than the concentration in the Earth today. In fact, in the last 200 years, scientists have measured carbon dioxide levels up to 40 per cent higher than they are today. But the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change from the UN, ignores those, those measurements, which were taken in some cases by Nobel Science Prize winners. Science Prize winners. And all they do instead is take one reading over, from one place over the last 70 years. As you can see from the list I've just read, carbon dioxide is not pollution. And the Greens are talking about doing an inquiry into carbon, yet they say that it's the carbon dioxide that's causing this climate change that is supposedly going on. So let's look at something else then. So carbon dioxide is not a pollutant. So the second stage then, let's have a look at this climate change crisis that the Greens are talking about. Well, I am unique in this, in this Senate for holding the CSIRO accountable. All of the other senators have not done their job. And Senator Macdonald is the person who's pointed that out to me, Senator Ian Macdonald in the Senate in 2016. He pointed out that no one in this parliament has ever debated the science until I arrived. We still haven't had the debate because I've challenged the Greens. More than 525 days have they gone without responding to my challenge for a debate. Larissa Waters, Senator Waters, has gone more than 10 years, 10 and a quarter years now, without responding to my challenge for a debate. They won't debate me because they haven't got the science. So let's listen to the people who the Greens rely on for their science. So in my cross-examination of the CSIRO, and I've had three presentations and several, several sessions with Senate estimates, in their first presentation to me, under my cross-examination, the CSIRO admitted that they have never said that carbon dioxide from human activity is a threat, is a danger. Never. We don't need any of these policies, that means. So let's go to the next, uh, next session we had with the CSIRO, and each of these sessions were two and a half, three hours long. The CSIRO said that today's temperatures are not unprecedented. That means the current blip that ended back in 1995, we've had stasis of temperature since then, no warming since the last 26 years. The current temperatures are not unprecedented. Third point, the CSIRO admitted that they and other bodies around the world rely for their predictions on unvalidated, erroneous computer models. That says two things. First of all, the models are wrong, they're erroneous, and they're unvalidated, yet they're making projections on using those. The second thing it says is it confirms they don't have the evidence, because if they had the evidence, they would have presented it. Instead, they come up with some lame models, which have already failed. The fourth thing that I mentioned about the so-called science is that when they failed to provide me with the empirical evidence proving that carbon dioxide from human activity affects the climate and needs to be cut, I gave them a very simple test. Show me anything unprecedented in Earth's climate over the last 10,000 years. They failed that. So then I gave them the absolute simplest goal. And that was to simply provide me with scientific evidence, empirical evidence, showing that there has been a change, a statistically significant change in any factor in Earth's climate. And they failed that. They can't even point to a change in climate because we all know that climate varies quite naturally, most of it cyclically, but sometimes combination of cycles make sure that it looks like it's, it's entirely random. So that's the point. Not only that, 
There are scientists who I've communicated with directly, including members who were lead authors for the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Dr. John Christie, for example, a lead author until he left that institute, because the United Nations climate body, because of the corruption. He was disgusted, sickened by it. These and many other scientists have confirmed to me that nowhere in the world has anyone ever presented any empirical scientific evidence showing that carbon dioxide from human activity affects climate and needs to be cut. Nowhere. Anywhere. Not NASA's Goddard Institute of Space Studies. Not NASA. Not the UK Met Office. Not the Bureau of Meteorology. Not CSIRO. Not any university. Not any academic. Not any science paper. Not any journal. Check for yourself. Tell me if I'm wrong. The third thing I want to say is that the Greens' lunatic policies are based not on science. You'll notice that Senator Rice, in her comments, never once mentioned any proof of causation. Never once. Instead of substitutes for science, they use emotion, stories, fantasies, dreams, promises. That's all they have. Policy needs to be based on specific, quantified cause and effect. This much carbon dioxide is growing because of humans, and this much is the impact. Never has that been presented anywhere in the world. The CSIRO has failed three times with me, and never has it been done by anyone. So once we have that measured effect, which no one has produced so far, then and only then can we shape a policy. Then and only then can we measure the progress along the road of implementing that policy. Without that, it's fundamentally flawed. And then, if we had the connection specified, quantified, then we can cost it to see the benefits of Senator Rice's dreams and fantasies versus the impact on our human species of this climate uh, madness that people are going on with. As a result of this madness, both the Liberal Nationals and the Labor Party have driven our, our electricity prices from being the lowest in the world to the highest in the world, all on unicorn farts, rainbows, nothing else, nothing substantial, claims of carbon pollution. And then we have this telling factor. The number one factor that has driven the last 170 years rapid improvement in human standards of living has been the relentless decrease in prices of energy. From 1850 until about the mid-90s. And since then, in Australia, we have gone the other way. We've started to increase prices. And we've now doubled and tripled prices in some areas for electricity, and nothing has changed. Coal-fired coal power stations have become more efficient, and yet we have an increase in price because of the artificial regulations, the artificial impediments on the most productive and efficient source of electricity generation, the subsidies for the dreams of solar and wind, which are inherently high and will never catch up with coal or hydro or nuclear. So we have had a relentless increase in, in, in uh, prices of electricity over the last 170 years until 25 years ago. That relentless decrease in price of electricity and energy meant an increase in productivity and an increase in wealth. That's what's led to humans now living longer, safer, easier, more comfortably, more healthily, and with far many choices than anyone could ever have imagined. This Green's lunacy, this calling carbon dioxide carbon, calling a gas a solid, is driving a decarbonisation that is, in effect, deindustrialisation. Deindustrialisation. Look around us. This is what will disappear, all the material benefits we've had over the last 150 years. Opinion and emotion is not science. There is no need to have this reference to the committee because there is no science underpinning the Greens' call for this reference. We need to get back to the facts, get back to straight logic, stop dreaming, 
and think about the many people who are benefiting from the wonderful hydrocarbon fuels, natural gas, coal and oil, and look after the people of this planet. Thank you. Senator Dodson. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, I uh, speak in uh, a few words in relation to this motion. Uh, Labor will not be supporting this referral as written. Uh, Labor believes this is an important issue and proposed sensible changes to the Greens which would have allowed us to support a referral to the Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport Reference Committee. Uh, as always, though, the Greens were more interested in trying to make a political point than they were with finding solutions to the challenge, challenges facing Australia. Labor firmly believes in the future of electric, electric vehicles and the need to progress our economy to net zero emissions by 2050. As the only party of government with a serious interest in addressing climate change, Labor will continue to be open to engaging across the parliament regarding these important issues and we encourage other parties to take the same approach. Thank you. So the question is that, uh, well, Minister. <laughs> Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, uh, Australia has a track record of meeting and beating our international commitments. We've beaten our 2020 targets by 459 million tonnes, and we're back on track to beat our 2030 target. But climate change is a global problem and it requires global action. And that's why Australia is committed to the Paris Agreement and to investing in the new and emerging technologies that will make net zero emissions achievable. The government has a comprehensive suite of policies to reduce emissions from the transport sector. The government is committing to, committed to enabling consumer choice when it comes to new vehicle and fuel technologies. We are already backing electric vehicles, hydrogen fuel, cells, um, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, hybrids and biofuels through a range of initiatives including the, the $74.5 million future fuels package in the 2020-21 budget and the $2 billion climate solutions fund. So the question is that business of the Senate 1 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. Aye. I believe the noes have it. The noes have it. Uh, Senator Rice. Can you just please note for the Hansard record that the Greens would have voted for this motion or have voted for this motion? So noted. Clark. Government business orders of the day. Number one, Treasury Laws Amendment, News Media and Digital Platforms Mandatory Bargaining Code, Bill 2021, in committee. The question is that, that the bill stand as printed. The committee is considering the Treasury Laws Amendment, News Media and Digital Platforms Mandatory Bargaining Code, Bill 2021. The question is that the bill as amendment, amended be agreed to. Uh, those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I believe the ayes have it. The question now is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I believe the ayes have it. The committee has considered the Treasury Laws Amendment to News Media and Digital Platforms Mandatory Bargaining Code Bill 2021 and agreed to it with amendments. Minister. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I believe the ayes have it. Minister. I move that this bill now be read a third time. The question is the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I believe the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Competition and Consumer Act 2010 in relation to digital platforms and for related purposes. 
Uh, government business orders of the day number two, Treasury Laws Amendment reuniting more superannuation bill 2020, second reading debate. Senator Dodson. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. <clears throat> I rise to speak on the Treasury Laws Amendment uh, reuniting more superannuation uh, bill 2020 on behalf of the opposition. At the outset, I can confirm that the opposition will be supporting this bill. Labor has a proud track record of, on superannuation and will continue to fight for a stronger and fairer superannuation system. Our superannuation system sits alongside the Pharmaceutical Benefit Scheme, Medicare and the National Disability Insurance Scheme as a significant national achievement. Unfortunately, too many Australians still retire without adequate retirement savings. This is why our superannuation scheme needs to be strengthened and protected and not undermined. Every Australian deserves dignity in retirement. As originally drafted, this bill contained a single schedule that amends the Retirement Savings Act account, uh, Act, Acts account uh, 1997 the Superannuation Industry Supervision Act 1993 and the Superannuation Unclaimed Money and Lost Members Act 1999 to facilitate the closure of eligible rollover funds by the 30th of June 2021. This measure addresses Recommendation 5 of the 2019 Productivity Commission inquiry into superannuation, which recommended that the the Australian Tax Office be responsible for holding lost superannuation accounts and that the Australian Prudential Regulation Authority oversee the winding up of eligible rollover funds. These changes build on the, protection, on the Protecting Your Super 2019 legislation, which saw low balances and inactive accounts transferred by trustees to the Australian Tax Office but not eligible rollover funds. Since the implementation of protecting your super legislation, uh, fund trustees are required to transfer inactive uh, or low balance accounts to the Australian Tax Office. Eligible rollover funds were designed to look after unclaimed superannuation, but essentially they are now re redundant. This legislation provides a timetable to wrap up the remaining ERFs by the 30th of June 2021, with funds transferred to the Australian Tax Office. This will allow the Australian Tax Commissioner to reunite superannuation accounts they receive from eligible rollover funds with the members' active accounts. The Australian Tax Office has successfully reunited more than 2.1 million lost of, lost of forgotten superannuation accounts. This is a great success rate that OZ fund over, uh, over a 10-year period. Labor will continue to support measures that target duplication accounts and stronger, uh, fairer superannuation schemes and systems. The opposition will be supporting the government's amendments circulated on sheet SH137. As outlined in the supplementary memorandum circulated with the amendments, the amendments delay the operation of the charges proposed, by, by, uh, proposed to, made, to be made by Schedule 1 of the bill to provide trustees with eligible rollover funds additional time to exit the market. In addition, the government amendments insert Schedule 2 to the bill to provide that a superannuation provider may pay to the Commissioner an amount it holds on behalf of a member former members or non-member spouses, if it is uh, reasonably believed that the paying of the amount to the Commissioner is in the best interest of the member, former member or non-member spouse, and for a reunification by the Commissioner on those accounts with the, with the member, former member or non-member spouses activities superannuation account. Australia has a superannuation scheme that is the envy of many countries around the world. It, is, it was established by a Labor government to ensure that people could live in retirement with a measure of dignity. Labor has a, has a, this is not a history 
that are shared with those on the opposite side of the chamber. For decades now, the coalition and opposition and the government have worked to undermine and dismantle a system that has been helping to bring security and dignity to Australians in retirement, reduce the burden on the social security system and build our national prosperity. There are those opposite who would halt the rise of the superannuation guarantee, or worse still, abolish it altogether. Before the last election, Mr Morrison promised that he would leave superannuation alone. A very straightforward promise, one would have thought. But now he appears to have changed his mind and he has a plan to cut workers', comp workers superannuation. Labor will fight this unfair plan. It is unfair that the Prime Minister and every other Minister of Parliament pulls, pulls in 15.4 per cent superannuation on their earnings, but the Prime Minister and government senators and members uh, reckon 9.5 per cent is enough for ordinary workers. Mr Morrison engaged a bunch of consultants to try and back in his plan to cut workers' superannuation, and they said 9.5 per cent might be enough under certain circumstances. But on further examination, the, the certain circumstances are wages, our wages are growing by 4 per cent every year well into the future. When wages have not grown by 4 per cent for the last decade, this is simply fanciful. The Prime Minister will accrue more superannuation in two years than the average Australian retires on. It is absolutely critical that the Prime Minister keep his promise to leave superannuation alone. Whilst Mr Morrison might not be backing workers to 12 per cent, Labor is backing workers with 100 per cent commitment to the legislated superannuation guarantee rise. The Labor leader, Mr Albanese, and the Shadow Minister for Finance, Mr Jones, reaffirmed Labor's commitment last week. We call on the government to make the same commitment. Freezing or repealing the legislation increases will not lead to pay increases and will not change super tax benefits for high income earners. The original timetable has already been delayed twice. This has cost workers retiring today between $60,000 and $100,000 in their superannuation balance. The Reserve Bank has identified low productivity growth, globalisation, underemployment and a decline in bargaining power all are drags on wage growth. Wages are weak not because of superannuation guarantees but because the government has no credibility, no credible economic plan to raise them. We agree that workers need a pay rise. We do not think they should be paid for it with super cuts. The last thing the Liberals and Nationals froze, the last time the Liberals and Nationals froze the superannuation guarantee, what happened? Did we see an explosion in wages growth? No, we did not. Wages growth did not pick up. In fact, instead, we uh, got record low uh, wage uh, growth instead. The Liberal Party has formed when it comes to undermining superannuation, and those opposite have opposed every increase. Whilst this bill makes uh, sensible changes that we support, we all know what lies around the corner. Government senators continue to have free reign to advocate measures that will undermine the strength of our superannuation scheme and undermine a decent retirement for millions of Australians. It is time for the government to keep its commitment and unequivocally reaffirm the promise of the Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, before the last election when he said he would leave superannuation alone. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Senator Bragg. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, I rise to address the bill before the chamber, which is the Treasury Laws Amendment reuniting more superannuation bill 2020. Uh, and I think it's very hard to avoid uh, considering the context of this bill. Now, we are talking about here a government program for private pensions, which is what superannuation is. 
Uh, and I think the history of the scheme is highly relevant to this bill. I mean, this is one of the, the many major flaws with this scheme, which um, originally, I mean, in modern, modern times, uh, you know, the Whitlam government had a review into working out what sort of super scheme they should have. Uh, they didn't proceed with anything. Um, and then the Keating government put in place the super guarantee arrangements in 92. Now, of course, in doing so, the Keating government um, gave the keys to the city, to the unions and the banks. Um, and the unions and the banks have run this scheme for their own interests, not in the interests of members, for the past 30 years. And there are more lurks and rorts in this scheme than you can think of. Um, I mean, it's, it is, it's impossible to think of another industry in Australia where the door opens and money just falls in. And what that has done is created a culture where there is you know, very much a view within the superannuation sector that this is not our money, um, so we'll, we'll waste it, we'll charge high fees on it, uh, because people are disconnected by law to their own money. And it's only been during this pandemic when we've had changes like the early release scheme where you've seen for the first time people thinking, OK, this actually is my money, and I'm going to do something with it. And the data that came out of the early release scheme where almost $40 billion came from superannuation uh, showed that 60 per cent of that money went into people's personal balance sheets to improve their personal position, paying down debts, paying down mortgages. And so the flaw at the centre of this system has been paternalism uh, and separation from the Australian people with opaque, bizarre schemes designed by people to feather their own nests. And um, the macro stats here, I think, are, are, are essential and critical. Um, who could imagine an intergenerational retirement scheme, an intergenerational policy with no framework, no objective? Nothing. Nothing. No one knows what the hell this thing is for. Um, it is um, perhaps to reduce pension outlays. It is perhaps to um, increase standards of living in retirement. It is perhaps designed to reduce our reliance on foreign capital. And if it was any of those things, it's, it's a big red fail on all, the, all those fronts. Because this system costs the budget more than it saves. I mean, can you imagine? We're going to have a national savings scheme, which is designed to save the budget money, which costs the budget more money than it saves, not just now, but every year until 2050 and beyond. There is no projection that exists from any actuary, private sector or public sector, that shows that this scheme will ever become positive to budget, that it will ever improve the nation's balance sheet. Um, so it is a scheme which is way off the path, uh, and that is, a, that is a major problem. So uh, this particular issue of the reuniting more superannuation bill is a very good initiative, and it's one of a number of initiatives that Senator Hume um, has uh, initiated in this place and has already achieved a number of important changes so that people have more of their money. But I would have to say that um, in a system which is, which is replete with lurks and rorts, this would have to be amongst the best. Uh, in terms of a scheme that helps vested interests, not workers. Uh, so these are, these are eligible rollover funds, are what they're called, and that's where people, that's where the workers' money is sent. Um, when it's deliberately sent in there because the, the funds don't want to find the worker. So the average fee is 1.63 per cent, according to Rainmaker. 1.63 per cent. Extraordinary. Uh, when you think uh, you can go down to Vanguard and you can get um, an Aussie shares fund, an index fund, for 10 or 15 basis points. So 10, 15 basis points. And these people, these people want to charge the workers 1.63 per cent. I mean, it is criminal that this has been a feature of the scheme. And I give great credit to the government and Senator Hume for putting forward this initiative now. But it is ridiculous that it has taken us 30 years to get to the point where we decided to clean these things up. So I, I think that the macro problem we have here is you have a scheme with no objective, no framework and no capacity to ever deliver anything for the Australian budget. 
In fact, the only thing it delivers is more, more, more cost to the budget. Uh, it is also regrettable that this scheme has no real prospect of ever reducing the reliance people have on pensions, because even, even the intergenerational report shows that by 2050, 70 per cent of Australians are still on the pension. And even if you went to 12 per cent super, right? even if you did that, you'd still have 70 per cent of people on the pension. Because if you want to have you know, more than 50 per cent of people to be self-funded in retirement, you need to look at contribution rates of 20 per cent or more, which is just not realistic. Fantastic. Here we go. On the point of order, yes. For reverence and anticipation. As senators shall not digress from the subject matter of any question under discussion or anticipate the discussion of any subject which appears on the notice paper. Uh, Senator Bragg has continually referred to things of no relevance to this legislation, made false and misleading statements to the chamber, and does so on a regular um, on a regular basis. Uh, I, I do not consider uh, Senator Bragg's uh, comments to uh, be lacking relevance. Uh, Senator still has time to uh, uh, respond. Senator Bragg. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. So, in terms of this bill, uh, thanks for that. That was good. Um, appreciate that. It, like it, it, it's a bill that's designed to try and improve the system. Uh, so, I think that's good, and I look forward to your support and Labor's support for this bill. Uh, it's, going to clean, it's going to clean up this mess that was put in place by Paul Keating 30 years ago when he gave, when he gave, he gave this scheme to the, to the banks and the unions to run in their own interests, not in, not, not in the interests of workers. Not in the interests of workers. You don't care about the workers. Don't pretend you care about workers. It makes me sick. So, so, this, so this is the bill that is going to improve the operation of this superannuation scheme. So accounts under six k, six thousand dollars, will have to go to the ATO. The ATO will then, through the tax file number matching system, will then relocate that money back to that individual worker. So ultimately, this is going to have people paying fewer fees because there'll be fewer multiple accounts, uh, and that is a that is a good thing. Uh, but most of all, in this case of these eligible rollover funds which, because of this legislation, will become a thing of the past, we won't see people paying 1.63 per cent on average. And it's shameful you would defend that, you know, really shameful. And you know, I could go through the, I'll, go, I'll go through the fees. 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 Order. I'll go through the fees. I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you. I know you're desperate, desperate to hear. I'm going to tell you. Senator Bragg, if you could direct, okay. direct AMP the eligible rollover fund, 1.4 per cent. Australian eligible rollover fund, 1.7 per cent. Australia's unclaimed super fund, 50 basis points. SMF eligible rollover fund, 2.48 per cent. Wow. Super safeguard fund, 2.84 per cent. Super trace eligible rollover fund. 2.47 per cent. I mean, that's the average of 1.63 per cent. So, those are very, those are shamefully high fees. And it doesn't matter whether they're union funds or whether they're bank funds, the industry funds, retail funds. It doesn't matter. We're not here to run other people's agendas. We're here for the Australian people. So, it is regrettable that again, the interjections from the Labor Party show they're not interested in fixing this system. They're only interested in sectional interests, which is which is very disappointing and unbecoming. But at the end of the day, it shouldn't matter to anyone what type of fund it is. These fees are ridiculous, and they'll be a thing of the past thanks to this legislation, which I look forward to seeing Labor support. Uh, and ultimately, this is another step on the journey to getting this system to a place where it actually does work. Because I accept that there are a range of views about superannuation, and I hear the interjections uh, that come from Labor all the time. Look, there are a range of views about this. There are some people in this place that would like to abolish super. There are some people who would like to see a 20 per cent super guarantee. I am on the record as saying I think the idea is good, but it should be recalibrated so it works harder for the workers. I don't think we should be sitting here in here running a protection racket 
for the banks and the unions who have charged super high fees for 30 years and have delivered nothing. They have delivered nothing. The system costs more than it saves. It gets no one off the pension, and you defend it for reasons that are known only to you. But I think this is a good idea, a good idea to try and make the system work as well as it could. There's a lot more we should do. I commend Senator Hume and her excellent work and advocacy to the chamber and this bill. Thank you. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. And I rise to speak on the Treasury Laws Amendment reuniting more superannuation bill of 2020. From the outset, let me say that Labor supports this bill and the government's amendments. The bill responds to recommendations of the Productivity Commission's 2018 report Superannuation Assessing Efficiency and Competitiveness and builds on changes contained in the 2019 Protecting Your Super legislation. This bill is part of a suite of initiatives that supports the Australian Tax Office to reunite multiple inactive or low balance accounts with members' active accounts. The bill finalises arrangements for the transfer of the money in these accounts from eligible rollover funds to the ATO. The eligible rollover funds were designed to look after unclaimed superannuation and their role is essentially now redundant. APRA will oversee the wind-up of the funds. Under arrangements already in place, the ATO has been able to reunite over two million lost or multiple accounts with their owners, and the bill before the Senate will enable even more members to be reunited with their superannuation savings. Now, Labor has a very proud record on superannuation. Uh, back in 1972, just 32 per cent of workers were covered by superannuation arrangements, and this represented 36 per cent of male workers, but just 15 per cent of female workers. It is the vision and determination of progressive Labor governments and Labor unions that delivered what is now a world-class universal superannuation system. Uh, and that is why we are calling on the Prime Minister to rule out the freezing or repealing of the legislation that will deliver the super guarantee increase. Because this government simply cannot be trusted when it comes to superannuation. John Howard froze super and said wages would rise, and they didn't. Tony Abbott froze super and said wages would rise, and they didn't. Scott Morrison wants to freeze super and says wages will rise. They won't. The Liberals can't be trusted with your superannuation. They came into government in 2013 and they froze super. Did wages rise? No. Wage growth has been the slowest on record under this government. It is a liberal lie. It is a liberal lie that freezing your super will lift your wages. It is a liberal lie that is designed to suppress wages and to suppress super. And it is a liberal lie that will leave workers worse off in their retirement. Superannuation is a proud legacy of the Australian Labor Party, uh, and we will always fight for Australian superannuation. We will always fight for a dignified retirement for all Australians, and we will fight the attacks on superannuation by those on the other side. And it was actually Gough Whitlam who first advanced the case for a national superannuation scheme to improve equity and broaden superannuation coverage. He set up a National Superannuation Committee of Inquiry, uh, but unfortunately, by the time the committee reported, a Conservative government was in power and it rejected a national superannuation scheme. And since then, the attacks from the other side have continued day after day, year after year, because these people on these benches do not want Australians to be able to retire with their own funds and to retire in dignity. It was the Hawke Labor government and the Australian union movement that reignited the push for a national superannuation scheme. Uh, it was Bob Hawke who began discussions with the ACTU on broadening ac access to superannuation as part of the accord. Then, with the support of the Labor government, the ACTU's national wage case claim sought a 3 per cent superannuation contribution by employers to be paid into an industry fund. And the accord continued to deliver pay and super increases. Uh, and in 1991, in the budget, Labor announced the superannuation guarantee. 
Uh, and this is uh, a historic moment in our history that we should celebrate. This historic Labor initiative delivered a major extension of superannuation coverage, an efficient method of encouraging employers to comply with their obligation. And what a great thing it is. It's not a scary thing. It's nothing to be frightened of. When unions and employers and governments work together to deliver outcomes for the people of Australia, it's a great thing, nothing to be frightened of. Because the people of Australia have benefited from workers and employers and governments working together, and Australia is now the fourth largest holder of pension fund assets in the world. We have almost three trillion in superannuation assets under investment. 15 million superannuation fund members who own this national wealth. And because of this, generations of older Australians can retire with dignity. And Labor has continued to support positive changes to superannuation and its regulation. Too many Australians still retire with inadequate savings, and Labor will continue to protect and strengthen superannuation arrangements. That's why we are committed to seeing the legislated super guarantee rise to 12 per cent, and we will continue to protect superannuation from attacks by Liberal governments. We know that the two previous delays to super guarantee increases have cost workers between $60,000 and $100,000 in their superannuation balances. Uh, and let's not forget that in 1995, Tony Abbott said compulsory superannuation is one of the biggest con jobs ever foisted by government on the Australian people. The government is making us worse off now so that it will be better off in the future. And his views live on Senator Rennick. Hello, Senator Rennick. He has called superannuation a cancer and went as far as to attack his own party, saying that the coalition sold out its values when it didn't stop this cancer called superannuation. And it doesn't stop with Senator Rennick, of course. I'm speaking after Senator Bragg, who believes there needs to be drastic surgery to Australia's superannuation funds. And what would this drastic surgery look like? Because Senator Bragg last year told us exactly how he thought superannuation should be voluntary for low-income workers. Voluntary for low-income workers. Why do they need super? Why do they need to be able to retire with dignity? Uh, and then we have the member for Goldstein. In a recent motion in the House, the member claimed that Australians are retiring in poverty because they're forced to save for superannuation at the cost of saving a deposit on a home. The member's contortion of these important issues, saving for retirement and barriers to home ownership, shows just how unfit this government really is. And it is true that many Australian families are struggling and that saving for a deposit and home ownership are out of reach. So wouldn't it be good if the government had a policy that improved access to affordable housing? Wouldn't that be good? It is false for the member to portray saving for home ownership and saving for retirement as a zero-sum game. Instead, the government should be working on plans to boost wages and boost retirement incomes. Since 2013, under this government's watch, wages have been growing at about 2 per cent a year. And again, this is the slowest growth on record since the end of the Second World War. As The Economist Richard Dennis points out, low wages have been a goal of the, of the coalition and of businesses for decades. We're told that low wages will deliver benefits that will trickle down to all Australians. Well, Australians are still waiting. Just one result of this government's wage suppressing policies is that it's uh, all the harder for people to save for a deposit to buy a home or for anything else. And another impact is that superannuation savings are also lower. Jim Stanford of the Centre for Future Work says that unprecedented low wage growth shows no indication of rebounding. And this is because low wage growth is the result of deliberate coalition policies. This was confirmed by former Federal Treasurer uh, Senator Cormann, who let slip that downward flexibility of wages was a design feature of the coalition's labour framework, of their economic framework. I also want to say briefly something about the effect that raiding super funds has had on retirement incomes. The Australian Prudential Regulation Authority has reported that more than $37 billion has been withdrawn from retirement funds through the federal government's COVID early release scheme. This represents 4.9 million applications by Australians to access up to $20,000 in both the previous and current financial year. And this scheme has been accessed predominantly by people under 35. 
And for people aged 30, $20,000 withdrawn last year would mean almost $80,000 less superannuation by the time they retire. Uh, and Industry Super Australia has said that the government scheme will leave younger people poorer at retirement. He said busting into super early comes at a steep cost for the individual and future taxpayers. As a society, we shouldn't be demanding our young people pay the price yet again. Uh, and one of the fathers of superannuation, Paul Keating, has noted that when the government allowed people to take money out of their retirement savings in super to spend it now, it in effect asked those least able to afford it to stump up $30 billion worth of stimulus at the expense of their own security in retirement. It was Labor that created Australia's superannuation system so that every Australian can have dignity in retirement. And we know that government members are pushing to erode our world-class superannuation system, including by delaying increase, increases and moving to a voluntary system. Only Labor will strengthen and protect our superannuation system for millions of Australians. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise today in support of the Treasury Laws Amendment uh, Bill re reuniting more superannuation bill. 2020, and uh, this bill it reminds me of, a, of, of one of my favourite movies. I got to see it again last year in COVID, uh, called The Untouchables, and it was a scene whereby um, the great Jim Malone, played by Sean Connery, was pulled out of retirement, and he was going to crack down on corruption and, and gangster um, the gangsters, you know. And in the scene where he where he gets killed, it's a fantastic scene, one of the famous death scenes of all time. You know, he's, he's there listening to music and he's cooking dinner and this gangster walks in along the hallway and it's all quiet and he turns around, you know, Jim Malone, played by Sean Connery, and he's got this big shotgun and he goes, you're just like a wop, you bring a knife to a gunfight, now get out, you dego bastard. And he walks along the hallway and as he steps out the door, he's just gunned down, like machine gun style, toot, 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 toot. and then he crawls back along as he's bleeding out and basically uh, he calls, calls his Kevin Costner to let him know that the gangsters have got him. And this, this bit of legislation is pretty much like bringing a knife to a gunfight because effectively it doesn't do enough to actually crack down on superannuation. I mean, what we really need to do here is just get rid of the whole thing because what I want to be like is actually Elliot Ness, one of the world's most famous accountants who actually cracked down on a whole, because what superannuation is, it's like a whole bunch of white collar gangsters, you know, Elliot Ness style, who are basically ripping $40 billion in fees off each year. I mean, this is basically gangsterism legalised by white collar corporates. And I don't know why we allow it to happen. Because if someone had said, if Paul Keating had said to the Australian public back in 1991 when he brought it in or when he passed it in the August budget and then it was introduced in July 92, I'm going to take, you know, in 25 years' time, I'm going to take 10 per cent of your income and give it to someone you've never met uh, and you may or may not get it back when you're 60, do you think they would have voted for it? Well, we don't know and we'll never know because there was never an election. It was never held. There was never a mandate. There was never a... a uh, referendum on this. What we do know, however, is that New Zealand had a referendum on it and they voted 92 per cent to 8 against compulsory super. Now, you've got to ask yourself, what is it about Labor, why they are afraid, why are they so afraid to have a referendum on compulsory super? And I'll tell you why, because it's all about command and control. These guys don't want the workers to have their money. You know, we've Senator had... okay. Rennick, as it is 7.20, you'll be in continuation. Minister. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I'd like to withdraw an interjection that I made during question time today. And while it wasn't recorded in Hansard, the inference was inappropriate. So noted. I propose the Senate now adjourn. Okay. Senator Henderson. You have the call, Senator. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President.
I rise to raise serious concerns about a secret funding agreement between the current member for Corangamite, Libby Coker, and the construction division of the CFMMEU headed by John Setka. This is a dirty, rotten deal shrouded in secrecy, in threats and in factional war games, and it involves the most militant, law-breaking union in the country. According to a report in The Age newspaper last July, Ms Coker owes the CFMMU hundreds of thousands of dollars. This was the amount pumped into her election campaign by union bosses at the last federal election. The union also provided dozens of campaign volunteers. John Setka is now demanding this money be repaid. So Libby Coker was more than happy to sell her soul to the country's most militant union, which has been fined over $19.3 million in counting for breaking the law, on average, more than twice a week for the last 16 years or so. Right now, the CFMMEU and 65 of its representatives are before the courts across, across 34 separate matters brought by the Australian Building and Construction Commission, facing allegations of hundreds of suspected contraventions of workplace laws. So what is the basis of this debt to one of Australia's most militant unions? How much precisely is owed and why? So far, Ms Coker has refused to provide any details. We know that she, along with a member for Cooper, Jed Carney, defected from the industrial left faction of the Victorian Labor Party to the socialist left faction. But I say, what is the price of doing so? As I called for last July, the people of Corangamite deserve a full and honest explanation. Ms Coker rode into parliament on the back of the CFMMEU. The people of Corangamite deserve to know what has gone on. We've seen the court find the CFMMEU engaged in a form of extortion by inventing false safety claims against a New South Wales crane company in a bid to intimidate them into doing the union's bidding. We've seen them fined by the court for placing workers in danger in Tasmania, harassing and intimidating female public servants and police in New South Wales, pressuring workers at a project in Queensland into joining the union and using their entire paychecks to pay for union fees. We have seen the CFMMEU fined by the court for kicking non-union apprentices off work sites and repeated unlawful entries, blockades and threats on Melbourne construction sites and for unlawful stoppages across multiple work sites across Brisbane. I say shame. And Bob Hawke had the courage to call them out. In 2015, he said, in reference to the union, it is just appalling. I mean, I wouldn't tolerate it. You know what I did with the Builders Labourers Federation? I would throw them out. All of these issues have been exposed by the same tough cop on the beat, the ABCC, and yet this is the very same regulator that Mr Albanese and the Labor Party have now pledged to scrap. They have pledged to reduce oversight of the militant CFMMEU. When you factor in the ABCC has not only taken action to crack down on the CFMMEU, it has also recovered millions of dollars in wages and entitlements for thousands of employees in the building and construction sector. When you factor all of this in, Labor's determination to get rid of the regulator is even more absurd. It points to one thing. John Setka and the CFMMEU's influence over the Labor Party is alive and well, with the CFMMEU donating more than $7 million to the Labor Party since 2013. Money the Labor Party is very happy to accept. It is no wonder. As for the lacklustre Ms Coker, who has done so little to fight for her constituents, the people of Corangamite deserve to know the price she paid to get herself elected. Thank you. Senator Ayres. It's tough, isn't it, um, losing? Um, and uh, and it's, difficult, um, it's difficult for people to 
come to grips with it, appreciate that, um, and uh, perhaps uh, Senator Henderson should just let it go. Private George Bennett was a Camilleroy man who grew up on Yoruba Reserve near Burmai in northern New South Wales. In 1916, he travelled to Armidale to enlist. At the time, one in every four Aboriginal men who attempted to enlist was rejected on the basis of their race. He became one of the 850 Aboriginal men who served with the AIF during World War I and on September 3, 1916, sailed to the Western Front. He witnessed some of the most terrible mass, uh, battles of the First World War, Bulacore, Ypres and Passchendaele. He took part in the famous advance on Mont Saint Quentin, regarded as one of the finest achievements of the AIF. He was heavily gassed at Amiens and would struggle to breathe for the rest of his life. In 1919, he returned to the country he fought for to be treated as a second class citizen and sent to the margins of a divided society. His son, Len Waters, the first and probably only Aboriginal fighter pilot in World War II, took part in 41 strike missions against the Japanese in the Pacific. But on September 23, in fact, Len Waters' story is an incredible story that is immortalised. Uh, in a book that's well worth uh, colleagues in the Senate reading. On September 23, 1950, Private George Bennett was arrested for public drunkenness and he died that night in the cells of Mungandai Police Station. The coronial records point to the long-term effects of his exposure to mustard gas on the Western Front. Two days later, he was buried in an unmarked grave in Mungandai Cemetery. Private Bennett's death came four decades before the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, but it is a familiar story, a lonely death in a dark cell for an Aboriginal man. As then Prime Minister Keating said in a statement in the other chamber, the responsibility lies in large measure with entrenched, institutionalised racism and discrimination. Those who died were victims of over two centuries of dispossession, prejudice and neglect. As a nation, we failed to give Private Bennett uh, that most basic right, and many others, to die as a free man. That his grave still today goes unidentified and unrecognised by the nation he fought for remains a deep injustice. I've made representations to the Department of Veterans Affairs to arrange for the proper commemoration of this grave. And I've had encouraging early discussions with Maury Plainshire Council about formally identifying and recognising all of the unmarked graves in Mungandai Cemetery. My office is aware of at least one other Indigenous serviceman whose grave remains unmarked in that cemetery. I want to thank the Mayor of Moree, Katrina Humphreys, and wish her well in her final months after 13 years leading the Moree Shire Council. Uh, so many rural councils in New South Wales led by strong women local mayors. I want to acknowledge Private Bennett's grandson, Mr Kevin Waters, who is still alive and lives in St George, the age of 92. I want to acknowledge Joe Flick, a remarkable man from Dubbo, Aboriginal man who got a Churchill Fellowship to research uh, unmarked graves of Aboriginal servicemen in Europe and is doing remarkable work and has given me some very good advice. I also wish to recognise the efforts of Mungadai local Kevin Hobday who not only brought Private Bennett's story to my attention, but persistently has ensured it remained there. Particular mention should be made of Auntie Nolene Briggs, who has led the effort to identify more than 200 graves in the Moree Cemetery, including four Indigenous ex-servicemen. Her decades of advocacy and research have created a model that should be adopted across the country. Of the 850 Aboriginal men who served in World War I, few were given the honour that they deserve. Their exclusion from our national story remains uncorrected. Thank you, Senator Ayres. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Tonight I want to talk about homelessness and housing. Over the last few decades, Australian governments have created a housing system that actively impoverishes people and makes inequality worse. Safe, secure, high-quality housing is a human right not a privilege reserved for those who are able to afford to pay through their noses for it. 
Instead of ensuring everyone's right to a home, governments have implemented and persisted with policies that benefit big developers and wealthy investors to everyone else's detriment. The current housing system is designed to maximize profit, not public well-being. Homelessness is on the rise and has been for years. In the last budget, the federal government locked in a $41 million cut to the homelessness service funding, despite annual data from the Productivity Commission showing that homelessness services are being forced to turn away one out of every three people who present at a, at a service because there aren't enough beds. From July, services that are already running on fumes will be under even greater strain. People who aren't able to find a bed in a specialist homelessness service face trying to come up with enough money for a dorm bed in a hostel, a boarding house, or a motel, or another night sleeping rough in their car, or couch surfing, or returning to an unsafe home. These are not choices anyone should be making. Younger women experiencing or at risk of homelessness are at particular risk of sexual violence and exploitation. The integration of so many women's refuges into the underfunded homelessness sector means fewer women escaping domestic violence have access to the complex specialized support and casework dedicated women's refuges provide. Women over 55 are the fastest growing cohort of people experiencing or at risk of homelessness. The feminization of poverty is compounding in their case as they have fewer savings and financial assets and smaller superannuation. In December, equity economics projected a 9% rise in homelessness this year across the country and a huge 19% rise in New South Wales. It's unfathomable that the government can look at a potential rise of almost 20% in homelessness in our biggest state and decide that the current policy settings are working just fine. Thank you very much. The situation is poised to get worse. The government's cruel cut to job seeker will lock in poverty. And when the remaining eviction bans end next month, indebted tenants will, will be vulnerable to being evicted into homelessness. That's the cruelty of your policies. While the homelessness sector is in crisis, public housing waiting lists continue to swell. Federal and state government investment needed to meet the shortfall in stock is nowhere in sight. In New South Wales, the Liberals and Nationals are slashing maintenance budgets and bulldozing public housing, selling off public land to build high density developments of, and which are mostly private dwellings. These redevelopments barely replace the number of public or community housing units that they demolish. In several cases, they're actually reducing the amount of social housing accommodation overall. In the process, communities are fractured and vulnerable people are displaced from neighborhoods they've called home for decades. Communities are fighting back. In Sydney, public housing residents in Glebe and Everly, suburbs with proud working class histories are rallying against the state government's proposed destruction of their neighborhoods and homes. Extraordinarily, some of the residents of these estates have been displaced before when the government disgracefully sold off the public housing in Miller's Point a few years ago. This is farcical. You know, this must not ever happen again. The Greens stand with these residents, and we must push back against proposals to demolish and privatize the homes and neighborhoods that they have. We know that we need to, we know what we need to do to end the inequalities and injustices of our housing system. Get rid of the tax concessions for wealthy property investors and speculators. Significantly boost funding for homelessness services and tenants advocates. Ensure high national renters' rights standards, including rent control and security of tenure. We must wind back the neglect of public housing in this country and build the stock we need to obliterate wait lists and ensure universal access to housing. Our housing system is broken. It hurts people and communities. This government is hurting people and communities, and we will dismantle the perverse, exploitative, cruel systems that you stand for. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Senator Abetz. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Tasmania is the turnaround state. Tasmania's economic health is about as good as it has ever been. 
Today, my home state of Tasmania, thanks to the shrewd stewardship of federal and state Liberal governments, has economic indicators that are the envy of the other states. First, let's be clear why we on this side pursue good economic outcomes. It's not because we want some prize in pure economics. It is because we want the prize of good social outcomes and good social dividends which flow from good economic management, such as jobs, such as a good tax base from which revenue can be raised for hospitals, pensions and other public services. It would be fair to say that most have done it tough as a result of COVID, and it's rewarding to see that the policy settings delivered by federal and liberal governments in for Tasmania are now producing results. The latest unemployment figures show that Tasmania boasts the lowest unemployment rate of any state. Indeed, right now there are almost 4,000 more full-time jobs than there were last year. This means that with an unemployment rate of 5.9 per cent, we have more Tasmanians in employment and an economy that can continue to grow and deliver. Indeed, on the other side of the ledger in relation to the deficit, the net operating deficit of $960 million is now scheduled to be some $157 million less. And of course, less debt means less stifling of the economy and, what's more, less mortgaging of the future of the next generation. In the Comsec State of the States report, it is very, very clear that out of the eight indicators, Tasmania rates first, and out of the others, it rates each and every time in the top half. For the fourth quarter in a row, Tasmania holds the mantle of the best performing economy. These things do not happen by accident, Madam Acting Deputy President. They happen as a result of good, sound economic management. And for that, I want to congratulate, firstly, Prime Minister Abbott and Premier Hodgman, who set the policy parameters when they were both opposition leaders and then worked together in a very united manner to ensure that the Tasmanian economy might be able to be turbocharged. And on those foundations today, Prime Minister Morrison and Premier Gutwin are continuing to build to see the Tasmanian economy grow. And what we see is that uh, Tasmania remains Australia's best performing economy. It has uh, seen uh, in the area of equipment investment that Tasmania leads the way. And you move on to the other statistics, be it uh, unemployment, be it construction work. Uh, Tasmania is leading the way, be it in population growth. Tasmania remains strongest on the relative population measure with its 1.5 per cent annual population growth rate. So, Madam Acting Deputy President, there are great figures coming out of Tasmania, and what that translates into is a good, sound economic future for my fellow Tasmanians. Indeed, with dwelling starts, uh, Tasmania has been uh, very strong, and uh, the other indicators just all speak for themselves. So, Madam uh, Acting Deputy President, there was a time in Canberra where it was nearly embarrassing to admit that you were Tasmanian. Today, it is a situation where people ask, what has Tasmania done to have such a vibrant, dynamic and resilient economy? And the answer is pretty simple. It is the shrewd stewardship of Liberal state and federal governments over the past few years that have delivered Tasmania the rightful reputation of being the turnaround Thank you, state. Senator, Betts. Senator Sheldon.
Thank you, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Well, I've just read an article today. You know, tech stars want gig economy reform, but no minimum wage. In actual fact, a number of tech stars were um, particularly, and I call them czars, actually in this case, uh, particularly um, uh, animated on their views regarding the minimum wage. The founder and chief executive of ASX-listed freelancer.com, Matt Barry said he was against labour ideas due to relatively high minimum wages and the existence of casual wages in the industry. He also went on to say about his view about the minimum wage being inappropriate. Danny Korrig, the founder and chief executive of Snap, Send, Solve. I think you start regulating, I quote, industries too quickly by imposing minimum wages, you can stymie the growth. I think when you have the government coming in over the top going here how it's got to be, I think that can drive the wrong outcomes for these pretty early stage companies. Well, I'll just say this. Not so long ago in really human existence, we had slavery. In actual fact, some countries we still have it. Modern slavery and slavery in its turn of the centuries was the same arguments these tech companies are putting up about why gig workers should not have rights. The cost to end slavery, yes, means that somebody gets the minimum wage. And heaven forbid they can support their families. Yes, it means, like the five drivers, riders that have been killed over a two-month period working for food delivery around this country, might still be alive. If that's an idea of a tech company and how you get growth, then that's not a tech company that should be in this economy or any economy. Now we've got a situation where we've got mothers, sons, daughters, brothers leaving behind grieving families. We've seen the destitute, the destitute of individuals, their families, on the half minimum wage wa wages that have been paid within this industry. You know, in a recent report, you know, uh, the ABC did a very thorough report regarding a horrible death again of a delivery, food delivery worker, a gig worker, um, Mr Didi Freddie, and I've spoken about him before, but I think these chilling words just remind us about where this fight is at. Four-year-old Aska is getting used to a new phrase in his vocabulary, my father has passed away. They are enormous five words for a small boy to carry. September 2020, Aska's dad, 36-year-old Didi Freddie, was hit by a car in Sydney Marrickville while working as a food delivery rider for Uber Eats. Hungry Panda, challenges for menu log, challenges for all the companies that are doing the gig work. You know, we have a situation in this country where we've got people treated like absolute cattle at the behest of these tech giants oh, sorry, that are trying to grow. Well, that son's going to grow without his father because of the exploitation that's occurred in this industry, where people receive such a low wage, half the minimum wage, to survive that they have to turn around and do extraordinary hours and put themselves at risk every day. Again, with Hungry Panda, a worker who was dismissed for going on strike, and so he should have gone on strike. In actual fact, I don't care what political party you're from, if someone treats you the way that they've been treated, then you should go on strike as well, because it's not about politics, it's about humanity. It's about saying to those rich and powerful that we will not stand for what you're doing to us. In the case of workers that have been terminated by Hungry Panda two days after the strike for accused of being leaders, the reason they went on strike because they were earning $150 to $200 a day doing a 10 to 12 hour day. The company reduced their income to $3 a delivery from a high early in the um, period that these workers had been there from $9 a delivery. No insurance. And when this company gave evidence at an inquiry in the New South Wales, Industri in New South Wales Parliament just today, when one of their riders were killed on the road, they turned around and said, while they didn't uh, inform work cover, they said, we didn't know we had to. And when they were asked why aren't they paying insurance for that worker, they said because the system doesn't require us to. That's not a system that should be applying in this country. 
Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. The government at the moment is proposing industrial relations reform. That is really tinkering. That's all it is. So what I want to do is to discuss the bigger picture that we need to consider. But first, let's look at the decline of our country. Look at the decline since 1944, the stealing of property rights from 1996 onwards, the destruction of electricity sector, the, the guts of our manufacturing and agriculture, and yet the electricity prices at a time when other countries have been reducing their prices, Australian prices have doubled or even tripled. A taxation system that is counterproductive, the neglect of our water infrastructure, overregulation that is decimating manufacturing and in fact all sectors and especially small business our biggest employers. And then we look at recent devastation from the COVID restrictions or rather government restrictions imposed as a result of COVID. Capricious, unsafe and devastating on small business and employees. COVID, in fact, right now, if you look at Queensland, Victoria and uh, Western Australia, COVID is managing us. And pretty soon JobKeeper ends, in fact, at the end of next month. Then what will happen? So coming back to what we need, we will work with the government to fix a bad bill, its latest proposal. We will work with them in an attempt to do that. And our three aims guiding us are protecting honest workers, protecting small business and restoring Australia's productive capacity. To not just recover back to where we were last February, before the COVID restrictions from government, but back to where we were at when we were at the top of the world, literally number one for per capita gross domestic product. These are the things, if I had a wish list, these are the things that would be on it, at least some of them. An inquiry into local government corruption in Queensland, Right across the state, the waste of federal funding runs into the billions. The fraud, the extortion, the corruption, the threats, the intimidation. We will want to end that. I would look for a Commonwealth, I would wish for a Commonwealth Integrity Commission, especially when we've seen what's happened in this building in the last learned of what's happened in this building during the last week. We need a proper corruption ending system in this, this parliament, in this building. We need to restore integrity. We also need proper industrial relations reform. Not the tinkering, not the increased complexity, not the abandonment of small business. We need proper reform that looks after all employers and employees, enables first of all uh, employers and employees to restore their primary relationship without the IR club dipping into their pockets and putting handcuffs on them. We need to restore the primary workplace relationship. We need to uh, make it easier for people to work. We need to remove the complexity and remove the lawyers and the vultures. We need to reform taxation, proper taxation reform, not tinkering and adding more complexity to tax but making it simpler. Making it simpler for companies and small businesses to employ people and making it easier for employees, honest workers, to keep more of their pay for their families. We need reform of the family law system. We need reform of water. We need to do much, much better with our water. We need to re return environmental water management to the states. Introduce a water register, 14 years overdue. Introduce Weirs for Life program. Turn around the drains in the southeast. We have a comprehensive plan we're going to release soon about what we would to do with the Murray Darling Basin Authority and water right across the country. We need to restore farmers' property rights that were stolen in 1996 by the John Howard, uh, John Anderson government. We need to make sure that we have lower energy prices. We need to restore coal-fired power stations in this country. Build a new one at Collinsville. Build a new one at, at the, in the Hunter Valley. We need to address the PFAS problems that are gutting so many areas. We need to look at infrastructure, national rail circuit, inland rail. Do it properly, the Bradfield scheme. Above all, we need a government with vision. Not the tinkering. We need a government with vision and from that vision providing real leadership. 
get back to basics. Thank you, Thank Senator. You. Thank you, Senator Roberts. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again tomorrow at 9.30 a.m.